Part 3 Cell Becca sat on the hard floor, staring through the cell's shimmering force barrier at the club stretched out before her. Since the fight with Big Barb, pretty much every part of her was in some level of pain, but in her present state of mind, she barely noticed it. The cell she and Franco had ended up in was the last in a long line of them that skirted the far outer edge of the club. When they'd first entered the establishment, the cells hadn't been visible, their false barriers opaque and dimly lit. But now that night had fallen and the punters had flooded in, they'd become transparent and illuminated like storefronts proudly displaying the myriad of captive fighters within. Gaudy fashions and careless wealth practically dripped off the patrons as they milled about the bars and fighting domes. Many sauntered over to the cells, slowly making their way from one to the next, tapping thoughtful fingers against chins or sipping daintily at drinks while observing the fighters within. Expressions ranged from mild interest to feverish excitement. Becca ignored them all, her stare rarely deviating from the fight dome where she'd fought Barb, the very spot where the monstrous slaughter bot had unceremoniously dragged the big woman's body off like the unsightly carcass of some beached sea creature. You can't blame yourself, Bex. You had to fight her. After spending the last hour pacing about the cell, Franco had finally come to sit next to her. You had no choice. I don't blame myself, she replied with little hesitation. Not in the least. Franco sighed. Right, I get it. You blame me. That's fine. I understand. Believe it or not, no. Becca nodded toward the club at large. I blame those two fuckers out there, the two little psychos running this place, not to mention all these fools milling around waiting for the next blood-filled show. Franco sighed, sounding relieved he wasn't on the list. That bastard Pascal too, he said. Didn't it take much for him to find the door once he got permission? Becca shook her head and sighed. He was probably just scared he'd end up in here with us. That and he's a self-serving asshole. Her sore neck protesting, Becca glanced back at the other occupants of their cell. When Jade's goons had led them toward it, she'd noted the other cells were quite full with as diverse a bunch of fighters as could be imagined. Perhaps because it was at the end of the row, their cell was quite sparse but no less diverse. An older, thick-set man with a long white beard sat still in the corner, his eyes closed. He had a calmness about him that was starkly contrasted by a much younger man pacing in a tight circle nearby, all fidgety limbs and aggressive mumbling. Becker noted the young man was missing half of his right index finger. There were two men and two women gracing the other side of the cell, all four sporting various cuts and bruises and appearing thoroughly miserable at their lot in life. The last occupant Becker was doing her best not to look at or even think about. Curled up at the rear of the cell was a hairless corpse, sickeningly thin with skin so green that Becca wondered if no one had removed it for fear of somehow absorbing the chakra sickness. She couldn't suppress a shudder every time her attention wandered in the poor, dead soul's direction, a harsh reminder of her possible future, and one that was seeming more and more likely. Either that, or she'd die at the hands of some monstrous fighter, which ironically seemed the more merciful outcome. A tall, older lady, wearing a long coat of unnaturally shimmering fur, came to linger on the other side of their barrier. She swept her eyes over the cell's scant occupants, before settling her attention on Becca and Franco, looking down her regal nose at them as if they were a pair of potential pets. Pulling out an elegant, gold-tipped control wand, the woman flicked it toward each of them in turn, activating graphics upon the cell's force barrier that detailed their stats and fight history. Having a grand total of one fight between them, the woman looked almost disgusted that she'd wasted all the valuable wand-flicking effort. Swiftly turning on her heel, she continued on to the next cell, the shimmer of her coat intensifying with each swish. Franco mumbled a curse as he watched her go. I'm not feeling overly confident we'll get rich quick here. Astute, Becca said, massaging a bruise on her shoulder. Franco nodded and sucked on his teeth. And I've a hunch it might take a while until we're valued enough to progress to the luxury quarters Pascal was promising. Becca dug deeper into her shoulder. Two for two. So, I vote we do a runner. Franco kept his voice low. Cut our losses and take a chance. A runner, Becca replied, struggling to match his hushed tone. 
just run on through this force barrier. Is that the full extent of your plan, or are there hidden depths you're not divulging? As a matter of fact, there are. Franco glanced around to check their fellow occupants were paying as much attention as before, which was to say none at all. This cute little cell's no problem, he said. Leaning closer, he pushed up his right sleeve. I can deactivate the force barrier, but getting past all the armed meatheads will be trickier, not to mention that slaughter bot. You can get us out of this cell, Becker asked. How the hell are you planning on pulling off that little miracle? Less miracle, more cutting-edge science. Checking none of the club's punters were looking their way, Franco nodded down to his forearm. A series of muted lights had come to life beneath his skin and were migrating to his hand. You got chipped. Well, don't tell the whole frickin' city, Franco hissed. Tightening his fist, the lights migrated back to his forearm and he pulled his sleeve back into place. It's not a chip. In fact, it's pretty far from your average clunky implant, more advanced even than the latest hydro chips. But it can deactivate this cell. Becker asked, pushing aside a host of other questions in favor of the most pressing one. Franco gave her a sly smile. This little beauty can hack any security system you throw at it, and I've done a fair bit of throwing. You're sure? I'm sure. Becker stared at him for a long moment. I'm sure, okay, trust me for once. Where the hell did you get it? Remember that little hottie I hooked up with from R&D before all the shit hit the fan? Becca looked at him blankly, feeling like she'd been asked to recall a specific raindrop from the last storm she was in. Franco shook his head. Doesn't matter. Point is, she was seriously smart. You sure? Screw you, she was seriously smart, he reiterated. Smart enough to hook up with me and smart enough to be involved in some pretty intense tech development. She assured me it could hack any security system, and so far it's not made a liar of her. Far from it, in fact. Becker thought back to the times he'd broken into her quarters, but the mental image of his bare ass bouncing up and down quickly discouraged the thought. She just gave it to you. No, no, not even close. This was top-level research, enough that she was annoyingly resistant to my charms. Becker gave a little mocking laugh, suddenly feeling a hint of optimism at Franco's revelation. Immune to the spells cast by your little wand, I don't believe it. I know, right. I'd given up trying to persuade her, but then our disaster mission on Capson 23 happened, made me reassess how much I hate locked doors. Becca felt her humor slip away. Even the name of that damn planet was enough to cause a wave of bitter sorrow at the friends they'd lost. Just think, Franco continued. Tech like this might have saved our team, might have gotten us off that hellhole a damn sight quicker. Or we might have had a possessed hand to deal with on top of everything else. Beck amused, remembering how messed up that planet had been. As soon as we were back on the starship, I hooked up with her again, talked her into getting me clearance as a test subject. This time she agreed, and I figured once the tech was fitted, I could somehow persuade her to let me keep it. Franco fell silent for a time. And? And? We'll never know, he said with a shrug. I heard about your mission to this godforsaken rock and couldn't let you go it alone, not with some shabby dispute team. So I skipped out on the trial and came to watch your back. Then, then everything went nuts. Yep. Jesus, Franco, skipping out on a top-level trial would have got you in serious shit, and her. Franco grimaced. Doesn't matter now, she's probably dead, her team too, and if they're not, a runaway test subject is likely the least of her worries. You risked that just to watch my back on a dispute mission. Franco shrugged again. Capson 23 was supposed to be just a retrieval mission, nice and simple. With that idiot Captain Decker calling the shots, you could never be sure. And besides, there was no way I was going to let them take this little gem back, he said, wiggling his fingers like a magician, attempting to lighten the mood. You know how much I hate being locked into places. Almost as much as being locked out of them, Becker muttered. I guess it'll all be worth it when you get us out of here. You're absolutely certain you... Franco cut her off with a look. It's not a problem, not when it comes to this cell. But this club doesn't strike me as the sort of place to close for the holidays or give its armed employees a break. And even if we somehow get past them and back into the city, then what? We've no place to go, no ship to escape on. And I don't believe for a second the little psycho siblings will let us simply... Franco trailed off, his attention drifting over Becker's shoulder. 
Becca turned to see the white-bearded man at the far side of the cell had opened his eyes and was watching them. You think he heard us? Franco asked, dropping his voice so low that Becca herself could barely hear him. Not a chance in hell had been her first thought, but the man certainly had the look of someone who was mulling over what he'd heard. His eyes still on them, he abandoned his perch and tentatively approached. Pretty light on his feet for his age and build, Becca observed as she assessed his movements. His origins were Earth East Asian. He was average in height and had a sort of chunkiness about him, the sort that could either harbor genuine power or was simply the result of overindulgence. Hard to be certain, but his straight posture suggested the former. Franco was quick to his feet. Something of interest to your friend. In response to Franco's threatening tone, the man held up his hands in an apologetic manner. I assure you, no aggravation is intended. Similar to the fidgety young cellmate who was still pacing about, Becca noticed the man's right index finger was missing, a wound that looked recent. He was also sporting several cuts and bruises, but so did every other person this side of the force barriers. Trying not to let her own injuries show, Becca climbed smoothly to her feet. My name's Feng, the man said, and I'm afraid I couldn't help but overhearing your conversation. Rude, I know, and I hope you'll forgive me. But I feel we could be of use to one another, a mutually benefiting collaboration, if you will. Franco remained tense. You're blessed with some fine hearing. Not exactly a blessing, but I can explain. Feng paused as if seeking permission to continue. We're listening, Franco said. I'm glad. The man gave a mild but genuine sort of smile. So, we're all in a bit of a sticky situation here. I think on that point we can agree, yes? Caught in a place we'd rather not be. You two have a rather unique skill available to you, and as you will learn, I do too. A skill that... How did you overhear us? Becca said, hoping the interruption might cut to the chase. Even a young person with exceptional hearing would have struggled to hear our whispers. And forgive my bluntness, but you're no spring chicken. No, that I'm not. But what I am is a businessman. A rich businessman. With a ship... Franco asked quickly. Yes, I have two, in fact, both docked up in the Havens. Franco shook his head. The Havens. The district at the very peaks of the central towers. Oh, I get it, Franco said. Up in the Havens. Clever. You haven't answered my question, Becca said, still unsure to what extent they could or should trust this man. Given their current location, they probably shouldn't trust him in the least, but given their current situation, they'd likely be forced to trust him quite a bit. My hearing's not entirely mine. Feng held up his right hand to emphasize his missing finger. Becca sighed. Christ, is everyone chip but me? The, uh, psycho-siblings, as you call them, weren't too keen on me keeping my implant, so they removed it along with my finger. Using the finger next to his stump, Feng tapped at his right ear. But they missed this one, quite simply because it's designed to be missed. A simple little device with the most simple of tasks, to allow me to hear. Hear across distances, hear through walls, hear specific voices in a noisy crowd. It can even translate languages, a most useful device in the world of business. Not the most ethical, I admit, but business these days really is. Are you a fighter too? Franco asked. The man appeared puzzled by the question. No, not in the least. As yet I've managed enough not to get killed in here, but a few verbal scuffles in the boardroom was as close to a fight as I got before that. You sure about that? Franco persisted. You've got the air of a fighter, bit of a posture about you. Feng stared at him for a moment, weighing up his answer. I do yoga, a bit of tai chi too, doctor's orders in my advancing years. Franco didn't look convinced, and Becca wasn't sure she was either on any of his claims. It's not that I don't believe you, Feng, but if what you say is true, how in hell does a wealthy businessman end up here? Feng sighed. Misfortune, misunderstanding, misjudgment. His thick shoulders dropped some. I came here for my son. Came to pull him out of the deep hole of gambling debts he'd fallen into, not to mention a host of other trouble he'd attracted on the way down. Where is he? There was a twitch on Feng's face, a tiny reaction that said an awful lot. I left it too long, 
I'd been waiting for him to dig himself out, hoped he'd learn a grand life lesson, make a man of him. Another twitch invaded the man's pained expression as he looked down with a sigh. Or perhaps I was too caught up in my own business. Eventually, though, I decided to intervene. I'd heard the man running this place, Mr. Deacon, was a reasonable fellow, or was if enough money was thrown at him. So I decided to come in person, talk with him man to man. But I'd left it too long. Mr. Deacon was gone, and I hadn't bargained on the young pair left in his wake. Safe to say, Jade and Jareth weren't overly keen on my brash, business-like attitude, and when I learned of my son's death at their hands, they liked my anger even less. By the time I'd realized my error, I was already discovering the value they put on their twisted entertainment, even more than money, as it turns out. Becca nodded her understanding. Sorry to hear that, truly, but we're only interested in getting out of here, not some vendetta that will get us all. Becca fell silent as the young, twitchy man who'd been pacing the other side of the cell wandered close, but he paid them little attention and eventually moved on to mutter nonsense at the rear of the cell. We're on the same page, Feng said, further dropping his voice and stepping a little closer to Becker and Franco. So you don't want revenge, Franco said, sounding unconvinced. Oh, I'll get my revenge, but I plan to do it from a safe distance. I have power in the havens, people I know, not to mention the protection of the district authorities up there. And your ships, Becker said, wanting confirmation of the fact, even if it was just the words of a stranger. Feng nodded. And my ships. Help me get up there and I'll gift one to you. I'll even hold off on my vendetta until you're safely off planet. You'll gift us one. Becca said, pretty sure the man must have misspoken. Seeing the expression on her face, Feng looked close to laughing. I'm extremely rich. Gifting you a ship is not as unlikely or as generous as you might think, especially if you've helped me stay alive. The haven sounds like a fine thing, Franco said, and a gifted ship sounds even better. You have a plan to make all this a reality. I have the beginnings of one, Franco frowned. The beginnings? I've been watching, and more importantly listening to Jade and Jareth's conversations and plans. Fang tapped again at his augmented ear. A few weeks of listening to the little devils, sifting through all the meaningless chatter and general din of the club in order to monitor their comings and goings. This establishment never gets particularly empty, but there are relatively quiet times, and often during these times one or the other of the siblings leave to conduct business elsewhere in the city. Unfortunately, they never go together, but whenever one of them does leave, they take a good portion of their heavies with them, and crucially, they take the big silver robot. The slaughterbot goes, Becca asked, feeling a brief spasm of hope. Every time. Fang nodded. Every time. They're paranoid much, Franco muttered. Yes, one might surmise they're not well liked within this city. Whenever one of them leaves, they talk it through a good deal first, so I always know before it happens. There's still plenty of guards left behind, but without doubt it would be the best time to attempt an escape. I'd have tried weeks ago, but of course this cell is a problem. Feng swept his eyes over the force barrier and glanced at Franco's right forearm. Until now, that is. So, do you concur? Franco shared a look with Becca, then offered Feng a smile. Okay, sounds like we have the beginnings of a plan. Partners in Crime Twenty-five standard Earth years before the Insidian invasion. Monk could feel the horribly familiar panic growing in his gut, slowly crawling up his chest and doing its best to curl him into a terrified ball. If there'd been room, it might have succeeded, but the bug burrow he was squeezing along had become ridiculously narrow, too narrow even for a kid his size. But he had to keep going. No choice there. There was no turning around in the hive, not least until he made it to a nesting hole or birthing chamber. He shouldn't have let Cal talk him into this, not dragging themselves this high into the hive. They'd been crawling for ages, long enough that they were probably near the very top, and who knew if they'd ever find their way back. But his friend had a talent for talking him into mad things. He'd lured him with promises of a revelation so epic it was just too hard to resist, 
and it wasn't like his own ideas didn't occasionally dip toward the insane. His jaw clenched, Monk continued on, shifting inch by inch, doing his best to swallow his panic, not to mention a big glob of puke bile caused by the hive's sickly sweet stink. Hard to believe he'd once found the smell quite nice, the first time he'd been shoved into one of the entrance tunnels. Certainly it had been better smelling than the pirate who'd done the shoving. But after months of crawling through endless maze, day after day, the sweetness had become sickly, then full-on puke-inducing. Monk had never seen the bugs that made the hive. They'd been smoked out and buzzed off months previously, but plenty of their valuable eggshells remained, glittering brightly in the amber glow. Monk doubted the white-haired witch would be satisfied until every last fragment was collected, or at least until every last kid had grown too big to crawl through the tunnels. Already some of the older kids had disappeared, here one day and gone the next, not even a hint about how or where. Monk prayed they'd been put to some other task, but mostly he worried they'd simply been disposed of. Monk continued on, but only made it a few more meters before he got stuck. Properly stuck this time, not like all those other times. One hundred percent stuck, he was sure of it. He wriggled his body, trying to force himself forward, but the honeycomb structure only dug harder into his back and scraped painfully across his ribs, making a wedge of him. Definitely stuck. Maybe even stuck forever. Certainly the witch and her leatherbuck cronies wouldn't waste time retrieving him. Monk tried to quell his surging panic by reminding himself that Cal had already crawled through ahead of him, and Cal was a bit bigger. But peering ahead into the translucent structure and its eerie orange glow, his friend was nowhere to be seen. He'd already disappeared through the twists and turns ahead. There was something, though. A dark mass was worming its way down one of the vertical tunnels up ahead, a horribly familiar sound coming with it, sucking, squelching, sucking, squelching. Pookabug, Monk whispered, his gut spasming part in disgust, part in fear. The boogabug was seriously unwelcome, but not entirely unexpected. The slimy scavengers liked the eggshells almost as much as the white-haired witch. This was bad, really bad, to be stuck and have a boogabug closing in. He peered at the wriggling mass, trying to judge its size, trying to fool himself that it probably wasn't as giant as it looked. He'd heard they grew bigger this high in the hive, but never wanted to believe it. Muck, muck, muck! Monk indulged in a torrent of safe swearing, that system he and Cal had devised to avoid the reprimands of the orphanage sisters. Why they were still doing it all these months later, neither of them ever questioned. Perhaps an unspoken mark of respect to the women who'd raised them, those who'd given their lives trying to protect them when the witch had descended. In his present situation, Monk guessed that even Sister Elizabeth would have forgiven a real swear, but it wasn't easy to break a habit, especially when he was so busy freaking out. The booger's glistening head, or possibly butt, was already bulging out of the opening up ahead, an opening that joined directly with his tunnel. The sight encouraged Monk to redouble his efforts at freedom, resulting in him bashing his head a few times in his desperation. It was no good. There was no wriggling out of this. With a horrifyingly loud squelch, the booger pushed itself fully into his tunnel, all that soft, wet flesh pressed up against the walls without an inch to spare. Then, in line with Monk's current luck, it began heaving and wriggling in his direction. The sight made Monk's heart pound so hard he feared it might burst from his chest and make a solo escape back down the tunnel without him. With hot terror pumping through his veins, he arched his body as hard as he could, teeth gritted as his bony shoulders dug painfully into the bulbous honeycomb above. He was on the verge of giving up when his prison finally began to crack and give way, sweet nectar oozing out to find its way under his T-shirt and drizzle down between his shoulder blades. His panic leaving no room for celebration, Monk tried to bring his melter forward to take aim at the booger, but the little weapon was strapped to his right wrist, and like an idiot first-timer, all his desperate shuffling had gotten that arm trapped at his side. Stupid, 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 stupid! It would have been an excellent move if the bug was behind him, but it wasn't behind him, it was in front of him, which made it the dumbest move he'd pulled off in quite some time, and maybe his last. He tried to wriggle backward, but that only made matters worse, his right hand cracking through a thin bit of honeycomb and causing more sticky nectar to ooze around his fingers. This was getting serious now. Stupid, dumb. 
Pressing his eyes shut, Monk tried to slow his breathing and come up with a strategy, some delightfully clever solution. But all that came was more brain-churning panic. He pulled, pushed, and twisted his arm, but barely managed more than an inch of movement in any direction, let alone the right one. Soon the booger was close enough that cold droplets began hitting Monk's face, squeezed at speed from the creature's heaving folds of flesh. Please, please! Monk gagged as he struggled, the awful sound of the booger filling his ears, promising the most disgusting of ends. Then a different sound, an abrupt one that silenced all the others and brought Monk's struggles to a sudden confused stop. A melter. At first Monk thought he'd inadvertently triggered his own weapon. But unless his shot had done a miraculous 180-degree swoop through the sticky nectar, it must have come from somewhere else, because the booger was definitely melting. Monk retched as the stench of bubbling, blubbery flesh hit him. Rotten eggs mixed with crit fumes, and that was a generous description. Bloody awful. Awful enough to encourage nostalgia for the smell of sickly sweet nectar, and even awful enough for his stomach to achieve a little of what it had been trying to do for the past hour. Still, it was better than a death kiss from the booger that was for mucking sure. Monk did his best to wipe the puke from his chin with his shoulder, his panic sinking back down his throat like a retreating viper. Squinting through the smoke that curled and wafted about the sizzling remnants of the bug, Monk caught sight of the melter that had done the deed. Then Cal's face came into view, simultaneously grinning and scrunched up from the stench. Sorry to melt your new best friend, but I thought I might die of old age up there if I didn't come back for you. Monk grinned back, the sound of his friend's voice batting away any remaining hints of panic with effortless efficiency. He didn't really know why he'd panicked in the first place. Cal was always there when he needed him, always turning up to get him out of scrapes. Of course, more often than not, it was Cal who got him into the scrapes in the first place, and this was no exception. But for now, Monk let that little detail go. Monk dropped his grin and crinkled his brow as if thinking through a decision that wasn't easily made. Well, now that you've melted him, I suppose that makes you number eight again. Cal laughed, retching a little as he inadvertently inhaled a waft of the demised best friend. Come on then, he said once he'd recovered. Let's go get some fresh air. Monk liked the sound of that. Nice view, eh? Having followed Cal in crawling through a crack in the hive's exterior shell, Monk couldn't deny that his friend was right. The view was really nice, better than really nice, and the fact the outside air was cool and didn't stink of sickly nectar or melted booger worked in its favor too. Since the white-haired witch had brought them to the weird forest planet eight months previously, Monk could count the times he'd seen the outside world on half of one hand and seeing all the mountains and trees from this high up, near the very peak of the hive, made for one hell of a reintroduction. Pretty amazing, he replied, although the lingering burn in his throat from his previous retching made him sound less than sincere. Still, not sure it was worth almost getting slobber killed by a booger, though. Course not, Cal scoffed, but you really think I'd drag you all the way up here for pretty trees and rivers? Monk reckoned his friend would drag him up here for no more reason than the fact they weren't supposed to be up here, but he settled with an, I guess. I promised, didn't I? Cal continued as he grinned out at the bright, crisp vista. Promised a revelation of epic proportions. So you're going to tell me what it is, Monk said, shifting from an uncomfortable position to one even worse. Oh, just keep me guessing. With that attitude, I should keep you guessing, but I've already been waiting long enough for your slow ass in the tunnels. Cal dragged himself forward on his elbows until he was recklessly close to the long drop and directed a finger into the distance, dead ahead. From what Monk could tell, he was pointing to the edge of the pirate's encampment where they'd hacked the trees away and constructed some dodgy-looking force fencing, a half-assed effort at keeping the local wildlife at bay. What? The fencing? Monk squinted hard, eyes still not adjusted to the sunny brightness. No, over there. Cal said, straining his arm and finger so they were that bit straighter. In the clearing behind those weird bendy trees. Ah, you mean those blobs next to the other blobs? With a sigh, Cal abandoned his pointing and rolled onto his side in order to dig around in his pocket. Monk continued to squint, but if he did it any harder, his eyes would be shut. Is it ships? Yes, it's ships, Cal said, sounding annoyed but his face brightened again as he succeeded in pulling out the thing from his pocket. Here, look through this. Where the muck did you get that? 
Monk grabbed the miniscope and studied it, checking it wasn't some kind of fake. Snagged it off one of the witch's leather butts. What? You any idea what she'd do to you if you got caught? Monk tried to sound serious, but it wasn't easy while fighting a grin. She'd drown you in bug puke is what she'd do. Cal dismissed the warning with another scoff. She was busy wailing orders, and the idiot pirate I snagged it off was too busy picking his nose. Anyway, stop wasting time and look at the ships, he said, pointing again. The one on the far right. Seriously? Monk blurted a moment later, the scope pressed almost painfully against his eye. A star splinter? Yep, Cal said smugly. A Harper Four, practically shiny new. Monk lowered the scope and turned to Cal, wide-eyed but unable to find any words. He reverted to looking through the little device. Our dream ship, Cal said, voice now overflowing with smug satisfaction. And the very ship that's going to get us the hell out of here. Monk lowered the scope again, losing his grin. Escaping the witch and her pack of pirates wasn't the sort of thing you joked about. I'm not joking, Cal said, as if reading his mind. I'm working on a plan. You're working on a plan? Yep, and it's a good one. Uh Uh-huh, Monk said, his excitement now tempered by bold words of escape that would likely remain just that. It was a crazy, impossible idea, even for Cal. The problem wouldn't be flying the ship. The pair of them had spent endless hours persuading Sister Elizabeth that the orphanage needed a flight simulator, and once they'd succeeded, they'd spent endless more hours immersed in it. Granted, the hours were usually spent battling each other in star-splintered dogfights, but the knowledge and skills were there, as good as any Federation pilot, he reckoned. But it wouldn't be as simple as just hopping on board and taking off, not even close to that simple. So, it's a good plan? he said, humoring his friend. Yep. Good enough to get the two of us inside the ship without being seen by the witch or her small army of leather butts. Good enough to hack the top of the rain security system integrated in all star splinters. Good enough to fly away without being pursued. Cal frowned at him as if offended by the lack of confidence. First off, it won't be just the two of us. We'll be taking any others who are brave enough to join. Also, all those who aren't smart enough to know otherwise. Secondly, the Star Splinter is way faster than the other ships. Once we're away, there'll be no catching us. As for the witch and her leather butts, I'm working on a distraction, something they can't ignore, something big. No doubt, Monk muttered, knowing that small and subtle weren't ever in Cal's toolbox. Again, seeming to read his mind, Cal screwed up his face. Hey, muck you. I could do small and subtle when it's required, just haven't met the occasion when it has been. And the security... Got something big to smash that, have you? Don't need to, Cal said, shifting on his elbows to stare at the distant spot where the star splinter sat. It's already been hacked. Monk stared at the spot too, intrigued but a good deal less confident than his friend. How do you know? The ship's already been stolen once. Again, how do you know? Do you really think pirates would pay for a ship like that? And do you think they'd then go to the trouble of reinstalling the security they themselves hacked? Probably not, Monk conceded, but I don't fancy a plan based around probably. Don't need to, it's definitely hacked. I heard two of the leatherbutts discussing it when I was taking a turn through the vents. Monk remained silent for a moment, trying to work out if his friend was full of bug crit. He'd never joined him in the vents, didn't see the appeal of crawling through more tight spaces at night after a full day of crawling through other tight spaces, and eavesdropping on a bunch of pirates wasn't a strong enough draw. I'm telling you, that star splinter's completely and permanently hacked. All the ships are. The Leatherbots were talking about it for ages. One of their mates was planning to steal the star splinter to start his own crew. Talked about how dumb the witch was for not reinstalling security on not just one, but all her ships. The other Leatherbot argued that she didn't need security because who the hell would steal from her? Yeah, what idiot would be dumb enough to even consider that? Monk said, screwing his face up at Cal. And anyway, from what you said, sounds like this other idiot is beating you to it. The star splinter will probably already be gone by the time you get your genius plan refined. Yeah, well, the idiot kind of tried already. The witch caught his plan before he had a chance to put it into action. Sounds about right, Monk thought. They didn't call her a witch just because she harped on like one, but because her ability to sniff out lies seemed almost supernatural. What happened to him? The idiot, I mean... Cal shrugged, trying to look as though it was no big deal. She had him killed. How? Monk pushed, morbid curiosity getting the better of him. Doesn't matter, Cal said, shaking his head. 
Matters if you're planning for us to take the same stupid ask risk. She fed him to the swamp pigs, Cal mumbled. Monk swore under his breath. Then he looked again through the scope, a longing ache in his gut as he took in the gleam of the ship's silver hull. But that won't happen to us, Cal said, forcing some confidence and clarity back into his voice. Not with the plan I'm devising, not with my good friend Monk backing me up. Monk snorted a laugh, eyes still stuck to the scope. You are with me, aren't you, Monk? Cal asked, an edge of uncertainty to his voice, perhaps even some fear, enough to unravel all that confidence again in just a few words. Monk handed him back the scope, staring at him for a moment before answering. Of course I'm with you, Cal. You don't even have to ask. We're pals, aren't we? Orphan kings on a far-off world. Cal tried to look nonchalant again as he nodded and grinned, but Monk could see through it. His friend hated this pirate encampment and bug hive more than any of them, to the point it was tearing him up inside, and he hated the witch most of all. This revelation of the star splinter had been a huge thing for him, and he'd had everything riding on his pitch. Monk knew his friend needed to be free, was desperate for it. But despite all his apparent bravado and confidence, Monk knew Cal could never do it solo. Whenever he was alone, all that bold confidence soon deflated. He needed a partner in crime to bolster him, and Monk fit that role perfectly, probably because it was exactly what he needed too. Besides, Monk added, also attempting some of that carefree swagger, even if you weren't my best friend, do you think I'd miss out on the greatest escape in history? Cal shifted his position, and Monk suspected he was discreetly trying to wipe away some moisture that had somehow made it into his eyes but he soon turned back, having rustled up another grin, this one entirely genuine as he jabbed his elbow at Monk's shoulder. Never had a doubt. Liquid Light Cal woke from a dream, a dream that should have had him grasping for its fading images and whispered words, turning them over in his mind, trying to draw out sense and separate truth from fantasy the sort of dream that should have consumed his thoughts for hours on end. Should have. But this was one of those rare occasions when the world a person woke up to was even stranger than that of dreams. He was inside, or at least an educated guest suggested he was. Some sort of large room, its borders indistinct. There were colors everywhere, unnatural colors, some gently moving, others static, some bright but most muted. Light danced somewhere overhead, giving the impression there was rippling water, even though Cal suspected there was none. The blue alien stood upright on two legs in the center of it all, the same one, as far as he could tell, that had manipulated the vine and trapped him. It was ten paces from him, preoccupied as it worked away at something. A strange something, like a giant elongated egg, which, like the rest of the surroundings, appeared to be made of light, or liquid, or something in between. The egg was pulsing erratically, colors changing in time with a low thwumping noise. Cal blinked against the brightness. He was upright, but was fairly sure his feet weren't touching the ground. Worryingly, it took an effort to move any part of him more than a couple of inches before the exertion became too much, an unseen force setting him straight again. Not the nicest feeling for damn sure, and something not likely to calm his rising pulse. At least his heart was still thumping, though, which, considering his last memory, could easily have been otherwise. Cal gathered up every scrap of his will to stay calm and move his head as best he could to further take in his surroundings. He saw a shimmering, horizontal surface like some form of table, and upon it were weapons. Their weapons. Rifles, sidearms, knives, and even their spider cuffs, all laid out in neat lines. Straining a touch further, he caught sight of figures, and the recognition brought a great wave of relief. Toker, Kyre, and Corporal Bright were perched upon a seat, which appeared more like a beam of soft light. All three appeared unhurt, their eyes fixed on the alien. With teeth gritted, Cal turned his head harder still, neck muscles trembling with the effort. Eddie, Tawny, and Cassius were all suspended in midair next to him. Eddie was struggling against her invisible prison and appeared to be shouting, although no sound was escaping, or at least wasn't reaching his ears. Tawny was also awake, her eyes wide and staring from one thing to the next. 
Cal could barely see Cassius, just a blurry impression at the edge of his strained vision, but he made a safe assumption the pirate wasn't happy. Turning from its work, the alien set its big black eyes in Eddie's direction for a moment. Then it strode toward her, making Cal's heart hammer all the harder. The girl was suspended at least three feet from the floor, yet the alien, with its long, slender body and limbs, was equal to her height. The alien's proximity intensified Eddie's struggles, especially as it raised one of its long fingers, and, unimpeded by whatever invisible force barrier held her, extended it toward her forehead. Cal watched with a mix of horror and fascination as the contact instantly put the girl to sleep, as it had done to him out on the vine. And worse than that, the finger kept going, appearing to enter her head as if melting skin and bone. Despite the grisly strangeness of the sight, Cal also couldn't deny a strange confidence that the girl was unharmed. And moments later, he was proved right as the finger retracted and Eddie woke, forehead intact, and did nothing more than blink in confusion. Whatever had occurred, it seemed to have calmed her, and that was no mean feat. Cal's mind reeled as he tried to work out what the hell was going on, or at least ascertain how deep in the shit they'd ended up. He could still feel the effects of the XL, so he guessed no more than a couple of hours had passed. The fact they were alive was encouraging, if not entirely comforting, and more encouraging still was the fact that Toka, Kyra, and Bright were free, without so much as their hands bound. Surely that had to be a good sign, an indication that the alien wasn't entirely hostile. Or was he being naive? For all he knew, the big blue bastard was hungry and had simply selected the three of them to sample first. Backing up a couple of steps, the alien continued to regard Eddie, giving Cal the distinct impression it was struggling with a decision. Whether or not that was true, a sudden crackling din distracted it. Something was happening with the elongated egg in the center of the room. Erratic pulses of crackling light were bursting from its glowing edges, intensifying with each thwump, making it look decidedly unstable. The alien marched toward the egg with some urgency, and splaying its long fingers made a swift gesture that brought a large, light-filled cube into existence. More gestures extracted multiple layers from the cube, shimmering like thinly sliced liquid that somehow held form as the egg drew them in and hungrily absorbed them. The alien took a couple of sharp steps back as if it wasn't confident of the result, and waited. Nothing happened, at least as far as Cal could tell. Although perhaps, a slowing of the thwump, the crackling light became a touch less erratic. Cal could see the back of the alien now. There was no parasite on its neck or back, but that meant nothing. Two other insidians he'd seen had displayed no visible parasites, and they'd been the most intimidating of all. The golden godlike man on the pirate queen's precipice of ice, and the alien who called himself Loth Kor on Lawrence's flight deck. Was this being another of those? It shared a translucent quality to its flesh, a glow emanating from within. But the golden man had been solid, enough for Jumper's explosive round to obliterate the top half of his body. This alien's strangely fluid ways, however, gave the impression that any such projectile would simply pass through it, or even absorb it. And although Loth Kor had appeared as a form of hologram, Cal suspected that in reality he was... His thoughts suddenly disrupted, Cal flinched and would have instinctively braced himself for a confrontation had the forces imprisoning him allowed. The alien had whipped its head toward him, sharp and immediate, as if reacting to some shouted threat or insult. But he hadn't uttered a word, hadn't moved an inch. Turning from the egg, the alien hastily approached him, those black eyes growing even larger as it neared. What had he done to warrant such abrupt attention? Before an answer came, the alien was already reaching for his head. Shit. Cal jolted, or at least his brain felt like it did. The view before him had changed, a startling change that inexplicably immersed him in a completely new world. Or perhaps a memory, but so real like he'd been thrust through space and time. He was back on the ice, the Pirate Queen's ice. Thousands of figures filled his vision, but only one drew his attention. The golden insidian, the very one he'd been thinking of just moments before, tall and muscular, a pulsating green mass within his chest. There were tendrils extended down through his powerful arms, his hands clamped to the head of some poor human soul. Then the memory skipped, like a chunk of time had been snipped from existence. 
The golden man's voice was booming out, loud enough to reach the ears of the thousands of pirates watching on, making unyielding demands of their queen. Another skip. The golden man's voice still booming out, then silenced forever as the entire top half of his body exploded in a spectacular display of golden gore, splattering the shocked faces of the nearest onlookers. The memory disappeared just as fast as it had come, and Cal was once again looking at the blue alien. Its smooth head was tilted on its long neck, that strange clicking once again emanating from its vertical mouth that only seemed to appear when necessary. Had it been reading his mind, sifting through his memories? Cal gritted his teeth, mind spinning, but he forced himself to stay calm, had to stay calm. The alien's clicks were impossible to make sense of, but they seemed louder and sharper than he'd heard out on the vine, which suggested what? Surprise? Anger? Had the golden insidian been a colleague, a friend, a distant cousin? Cal couldn't help but flinch again as that long finger was once more swept up toward his forehead. Another jolt, thrusting him into another memory, the sudden reality of it almost too much to bear. He was on the flight deck of the Vulcus, Lawrence standing by his side, the pair of them staring at a monstrous figure that had appeared from thin air. Cal had thought of Lothcor many times since the encounter. The hulking insidian had even invaded his dreams. But those hadn't done the big brute justice, not like seeing him in this strange reality bubble, towering over the crew, the fiery glow within his dark, glass-like flesh making him seem like some volcanic god of war. We shall prepare to cleanse these fallen worlds of your lingering sins. The alien's rumbling voice was just as thunderous as the first time Cal had experienced it. To purge the toxic memory of your existence, to erase every trace of your dim, unworthy light forevermore. The memory blinked away, and again Cal was looking at the blue alien. The vertical mouth had gone, but the shape of those large black eyes shifted slightly as it continued to regard him. Apparently reaching some decision, the alien raised its hand and twisted it in a manner that took control of whatever invisible prison Cal was suspended within. In a smooth, effortless motion, Cal was moved through the air, past Cassius, Tawny, and Eddie, then over to the long seat on which Toker, Kyre, and Bright were huddled. Then, just like that, his feet were touching the ground, the constraining effects of the invisible force completely gone. Not seeming in the least bit concerned that Cal was in lunging distance of the table full of weapons, the alien turned and walked away, once again directing its attention on the strange egg. You three okay? Cal asked quietly as he tentatively sat down next to them. The seat, if that's what it was, felt surprisingly solid, far more than it appeared. Oh, good, Kai whispered, looking desperately relieved that Cal had been freed. I think... Yeah, Toker agreed, a bit freaked at having my brain poked, but other than that, fine, I guess. Cal nodded, the sound of their voices making his efforts to stay calm suddenly far easier. He turned to Bright. Corporal? Yes, sir, Bright said, reluctant to take his eyes from the alien. Unharmed, he added dutifully. His voice, however, lacked its usual crisp tone, and the look on his chiseled features suggested he was on the brink of slapping himself in an attempt to wake up. You okay? Kyra asked, laying a hand on Cal's arm. A bit confused, Cal admitted. Did any of you see that alien manipulate the vines? He asked, keen to confirm he hadn't been hallucinating turn them to liquid. Yep, Toka said, pulled me right through it like some damn magician. That was the last thing I knew before waking up here. Me too, Kai said. Bright just nodded as though the words were a bit far out of his reach. Okay, good, Cal said, glad he hadn't gone mad. And were you? Yep, Toka said, anticipating the question and nodding over to Eddie, Tawny, and Cassius. Trapped in thin air too. It released Kai first, then me, then Bright. Kel shifted on the seat, thinking it through. And did it? Yep, Toker interrupted again. Poked around in our brains, too. Played memories like a damn entertainment hub. So real, Bright murmured, his attention not deviating from the alien. Cal nodded, strangely relieved he hadn't been the only one to experience it. Is it alone? As far as we can tell, Kyra answered. What the hell's going on, Cal? Toker asked, turning to him and shaking his head. I mean, what the hell's going on? No damn clue would have been Cal's honest answer. 
We're not dead. That's what's going on, he said, hoping some sort of weird purgatory didn't end up proving him wrong. And apart from the abduction and mind-poking, this alien doesn't strike me as the aggressive type. Kaya gave a gentle nod, as if agreeing too vehemently might tempt fate. It's not done us any obvious harm. So you don't think it's an insidian? Toker asked. Hard to be sure, Cal said. Still could be. An insidian with a different temperament to all the others we've encountered. Maybe some other facet of their ranks or a different agenda, perhaps. A mild-mannered baddie? Toker muttered. You think it'll release Eddie and Tarney? I think it will, Kai said. Eventually, I think it's reading our minds to assess if we're potential threats before releasing us. The words left Kaya's mouth somewhat reluctantly, and Cal could understand why. The concept of mind-reading was a tough one to swallow, but after what they'd experienced it was hard to deny, and hearing Kaya say it aloud dragged it even further into reality. Yeah, Toka said, assessing us. He glanced over at Cassius. I guess that would explain why it hasn't released our psycho pirate, and probably why it's thinking twice about releasing Eddie, if it knows what's good for- Toka fell silent as he caught sight of the alien turning to look at them. But all it did was tilt its head for a moment, as if curious at their speech, before turning its attention back to the egg. What do you think the deal is with that weird egg thing? Toka continued, his voice a little more hushed. I'm getting the impression it's integral to the operating of this ship, Cal said. Perhaps it was damaged when it crashed. As if on cue, the egg crackled more intensely again, tendrils of jagged light spitting vertically from its pulsating core, enough to encourage the alien to back up a step. Or the cause of the crash, Kaya suggested. Appearing like some magician in a child's fantasy tale, the alien conjured several spheres into the air, each one glowing with varying degrees of coloured light that rippled with that same liquid quality. Then it propelled one sphere toward the egg, causing the erratic tendrils to calm. Whatever we're witnessing, Kai said, more than a touch of awe in her voice. The technology is incredible, this alien is incredible, and the methods it's using to manipulate and control its tech are far beyond anything our science can understand. What, the magic balls? Toker asked with a little less awe. I'm telling you, Kai continued, shooting Toker a brief frown. What we're observing might as well be magic. That's how far removed it is from our science. Obviously, we're in a dangerous situation here, but we should still appreciate what we're witnessing. Technology, knowledge, and abilities far beyond what we know and practice. She continued to stare at the alien, eyes unblinking as she watched it manipulate the second sphere. It could take humans hundreds of years to reach this level of sophistication. Thousands, even. Truly astonishing. Hmm. Toka sounded unconvinced. Cal was about to side with Kaya when the alien unleashed a series of clicking noises, sharp and loud. Then it flung out one of its long, slim arms to bat the remaining sphere away, causing it to fly across the space before blinking out of existence. The action had definite tantrum quality to it, something that seemed to be confirmed as the alien stepped forward and directed a kick at the egg, causing a weird matrix of light to burst from its top. Hmm, Toka repeated. Kaya sighed. Don't say it, Toka. Say what? Whatever you were going to say, just don't. Okay, I won't say it, Toka said, sounding like he really wanted to say it. They watched as the alien remained silent and unmoving for a time, staring at the egg with the crackling light softly reflecting on its otherworldly blue flesh. Then, as if arriving at a tricky decision, it turned and marched toward Corporal Tawny. Cal rose to his feet, eyes flicking toward the table of weapons again. But the alien soon proved it had no ill intent, as it lowered Tawny to the ground and disengaged her force field, causing her to stumble a little. The bewildered corporal stared up at the alien, looking unsure what to do. But it paid her little mind as it moved across to Eddie and did the same thing, using swift hand gestures to set her on her feet and deactivate the invisible prison. Cal had a compulsion to dart over, convinced that Eddie would launch an attack at her abductor. But much to his relief, both she and Corporal Tawny did nothing more than cautiously back away. The alien moved in front of Cassius, once again pausing as if caught up in indecision. Cassius wore a hard frown, the sort that made a person's face ache, and his mouth was moving, undoubtedly voicing something unsavory. The alien raised a hand and twisted it, causing Cassius to rotate 180 degrees in the air. 
Again, unimpeded by the imprisoning force, it reached forward to touch the bonds that remained about Cassius's wrists, prodding at them as if investigating their worthiness. Finally seeming satisfied, the alien turned away and flicked its hand over its shoulder, freeing the pirate from the invisible prison with far less care and causing him to drop to the floor hard enough that he fell to his knees. Popping to his feet with his usual agility, Cassius's anger was clear as he glared at his foe, but it was a wasted expression as the alien moved to the far end of the space to busy itself with its back turned. You two okay? Cal asked as Eddie and Tawny made their way over. Still looking bewildered, Tawny nodded and muttered a barely audible confirmation that she was unharmed. Eddie didn't answer for a moment, just screwed up her face in confusion as she stared toward the alien. What the hell is it? Undecided, Toka said, possibly a mild-mannered baddie with a talent for mind-reading, but also susceptible to tantrums. Huh, Eddie said. Her face remained screwed up, but she seemed satisfied by the answer. What do you suppose it's doing over there? A silver sphere about three feet in diameter had risen out of an opening in the floor to hover with steady precision next to the alien. It appeared somewhat more solid than anything else they'd seen, but it still had a bizarre, liquidy look about it. More highly sophisticated magic, Toka guessed, eliciting a sigh from Kaya. Well, I came here in the hope we'd find something, Cal said, and I'd say we've succeeded. Yep, Eddie murmured. It's something all right. Should we be arming ourselves, sir? Bright asked, a question that helped nudge Tawny further out of her bewildered stupor. Cal shook his head. For now, I think it best we just observe. He looked over at Cassius, who'd remained in the spot he'd been set free. Having overheard Bright's question, he too was now staring at the idle weaponry, his expression suggesting he vehemently disagreed with Cal's judgment. Fortunately, the decision was far out of the pirate's hands. I think our host's already proven we're no match for it, Cal continued, armed or not, and I doubt the odds would have shifted in our favor on board its own ship. Whether it would object to us arming ourselves is the more pressing question, Cal mused, glancing again at the table of weapons. What about a hit of Excel? Eddie asked. Yeah, Toka said quickly, could do with a boost right about now. Cal had barely thought through his answer when the alien turned to look at them again, giving that same impression that suggested it was fully aware of their hushed words, or perhaps just as likely their thoughts. Abandoning whatever it was doing with the silver sphere, the alien turned and marched back toward them with that strange, supple motion. His heart quickening, Cal stepped forward, making a point of blocking Eddie, who'd shifted toward the weapons like she was preparing to launch herself at them. Cal braced himself, not having a clue what he was bracing for or even if it was necessary. Should he try to communicate? And if so, what the hell to say? But apparently the alien wasn't in the mind for communication, at least not audibly at any rate. Instead, it made straight for the table and, with quick hands, snatched up one of the ten-click pulse rifles and the pack of Excel. Turning, it held them out to Cal. The alien's actions were abrupt, almost forceful, and when Cal didn't immediately react, it gave the offerings an impatient shake. With a shrug, Cal tentatively accepted them. Apparently satisfied, the alien whipped around to stride back to its silver sphere. Anyone else really confused? Toka asked. Seems pretty clear to me, Eddie said, barging Toka aside in order to get to the weapons. The skinny blue bugger wants us armed. She grabbed her spider cuff and wasted no time fixing it to her forearm. So let's not disappoint it by standing around like a bunch of slack-jawed dummies. Both corporals appeared eager to follow Eddie's advice, but looked dutifully to Cal for the go-ahead. Okay, Cal said, in total agreement with Eddie's assessment and encouraged by the direction their situation was heading. Let's get geared up and dosed up. He opened the pack of Excel, keeping half an eye on the alien in case they grossly misinterpreted but their host continued with its own tasks without so much as a glance back. It was standing close to the hovering sphere, which appeared to have changed shape, like it had opened up. Seeming to confirm this, the alien began transferring obscure, light-filled objects in through its top. At a loss to what he was seeing, Cal focused instead on his rifle's settings, and, once he was done, checked again on Cassius. The pirate was still keeping his distance, looking deep in thought as he watched them arming themselves. No doubt he was considering some new speech that might liberate him from his bonds, but it would take more than clever words to shift Cal's stance on the subject.
It seemed the alien also approved of the shackles, and what better judge than a being with the power to dig around in the pirate's mind? Snatching up his spider cuff, Cal moved closer to Kaya and gave her a smile that he hoped was encouraging. What did you see? Kaya asked him as she tinkered with her own spider cuff's position. When it touched your forehead. C doesn't quite do it justice, Cal said, felt more like reliving. Same for me, like being pulled out of the present and dropped into the past, re-experiencing some of my least pleasant encounters with Cassius. Some brief moments with the Pirate Queen, too, like I was right back in front of her, and the arrival of the Insidians. It felt so real, I can't even begin to imagine how it works. She glanced again toward the alien, how it could achieve such a thing. I'm with you there, Cal said, activating his spider cuff. Hey, it's up to something, Eddie said, cutting any further conversation short. Sure enough, the alien had moved even further away, right to the edge of the space, the sphere following like some sort of hovering pet. Reaching up, the alien planted one of its long-fingered hands against the swirling wall, and in a few seconds, a large section of it had melted away to reveal the outside world. Familiar, dark, twisted vines, faintly illuminated by the glow emanating from the ship's interior. It was a weird sight, like some special effect from one of Cal's relic movies, and a cheap one at that. But it was real. Cal had no doubt. Lowering its arm, the alien looked back at them, a tilt to its large head that was becoming quite familiar. I reckon it wants us to follow, Eddie said. The alien gave a sharp waving gesture that held a distinct air of urgency to back up Eddie's supposition. Well, I wouldn't mind a breath of fresh air, Toka said, hefting his rifle. You know, stretch the old limbs. Cal looked back at the rest of his companions. They all nodded their agreement. Even Cassius had taken a few steps toward them, eager to get moving. Okay, Cal said, trying for another encouraging smile. Let's get the hell out of here. And together they followed their strange new companion back into the outside world. Lucky Becca was starting to feel quite lucky, a long-forgotten feeling to be sure. If she ignored the fact that being thrown in a cell in the first place was decidedly unlucky, Franco's revelation that he could break them out of it, combined with the meeting of a fellow captive with the ability to hear every word uttered by their captors, should definitely be considered an amazing bout of luck. Added to that, this man Feng had promised to gift them a ship that could fly them far from this rock forevermore. Also lucky was that since her battle with Big Barb five days previously, Becca hadn't been called on to fight again. Franco had been, and to his credit, he'd left the cell with his jaw set and a steady confidence in his eyes, hints of the elite soldier he'd once been. Becca hadn't been able to see the fight through the amassed crowds, but Franco had soon returned. Battered and bloody, but more or less in one piece, that confidence having grown to a level she'd not seen in him for a very long time. Lucky. Even more luck had arrived just hours after Franco's victory. Feng had overheard what they'd been waiting for, making good on his assurance that his augmented ear could pluck it from the busy club's chaotic din. Jareth was preparing to venture into the city, apparently brimming with amped-up aggression in order to confront some stubborn debtors. Another hour, and Feng had been proven right. A good deal of the heavies had accompanied the psychotic young man, and most importantly by far, so had that damn slaughter bot. Very lucky. There was a time when Becca would have happily embraced such luck, scooped it up and run with it, a big smile plastered on her face and fully expecting more to be laying on the path ahead. Now it just made her nervous. She wanted so much to trust it, to trust that the gods above were occasionally forgiving and kind. But it was hard with the great weight of her previous troubles putting this new fortuitous string of luck under constant strain. Trying her best to appear thoroughly bored, Becca passed a casual eye about the cell. Not much had changed. The handful of fighters were still sitting in their usual positions, rarely uttering a word and staring out toward the bustling club with slack expressions. The green-skinned Chaka victim remained curled up at the back of the cell, as unmoving and entirely dead as ever. And still proving the starkest of contrasts, the young skinny man continued his pacing and mad mutterings, as if trying to expel an endless stream of energy. Flipping the contrast back the other way, Feng was sitting on his usual perch, body still and eyes shut. 
Somehow he'd retained his air of calm, despite the fact they were about to fling a whole load of shit at a giant fan with the barest of hopes they'd somehow make it out clean. Finally, Becker's eyes drifted to Franco. Sitting on the floor at the front of the cell, he had his back against the solid side wall and one knee tucked up to his chest in an attempt to hide his hand that was pressed against the softly glowing force barrier. Franco's expression tugged dangerously at Becker's newfound string of luck. The frown, the sweaty brow, and the bunching of jaw muscles all suggesting his claims of easily overriding the security systems were a tad bold. And it wasn't just their own cell he was supposed to be overriding. The plan they concocted with Fang was to open all the cells simultaneously, their hope being that the fighters would burst from captivity en masse to overwhelm the remaining heavies. Surely it would work, and if enough mayhem ensued, maybe the three of them could slip away without even having to fight. But first, Franco had to make good on his claim. We've still got time, Becca told herself, trying to feed that string of luck with some forced positivity. He'd only been working on it for ten minutes. Plenty of time. Jareth would surely be away for at least an hour, possibly a fair bit longer. There'd been some debate about whether they should make their fellow cellmates privy to the plan, but had quickly decided against it. They couldn't risk the possibility of treachery from those hoping to gain favour with Jade and Jareth, and a couple in their cell looked particularly untrustworthy. Plenty of time. Becca gazed back toward the club and took a deep, steadying breath. No problem. We, ah, uh, we might have a problem. Becca turned to see that Feng had approached and he didn't look happy. Relax, she whispered, glancing back toward Franco. He's only been on it a few minutes. Well, he might only have seconds more. Feng's eyes were fixed on the mingling crowds. Becca was about to ask what the issue was when she noticed a portion of the crowd parting. Then Jade emerged, looking like some glittering fairy, hips swaying with each accentuated step. As usual, her entourage followed, that odd mix of brutish bodyguards and dainty fashionistas. Nothing about Jade's appearance was particularly unexpected. One or both of the siblings had approached the cells regularly over the past few days to personally select fighters for the major bouts. Relax, Becca repeated, hoping this might actually be another piece of luck. If we open the cells when she's close, it'll take her goons by surprise. They'll have less time and space to draw weapons and form a defense. Feng shook his head, continuing to watch Jade with an increasingly grim expression. Normally I'd agree, but... He nodded toward the girl. A knot formed in Becca's gut as Jade's path curved toward their own cell. Bloody damn shit! Every other time the siblings had approached the cells at the opposite end of the long row, those which presumably held the more experienced, longer-serving fighters, never had they even come close to their end. Might spell trouble, Feng whispered. No shit. Should we abort? Again, Becca looked across at Franco. His jaw was bunched more than ever, and the reason was clear. Their twitchy cellmate had wandered close and become uncharacteristically still as he stared toward Franco's hand. With a fidgety scratch of his face, he flicked his curious eyes toward Becca, then back to Franco. Should we abort? Feng repeated. She's almost here. We could try again next time. Becca shook her head. There might not be a next time. One of us could be killed in a fight before then. Or the young twitcher puts voice to his suspicions, she thought grimly. He looked the type. Becca could feel the cords fraying on that string of luck, all of a sudden at risk of breaking entirely. His curiosity peaked. One of the other fighters joined the young twitcher in staring at Franco, heavy brows knitting. Franco shot them both a mind-your-fucking-business stare, but it only added fuel to the flames. Subtly, he removed his hand from the barrier and laid it on his lap, glancing toward Becca with an apologetic grimace. Oh, darling, don't look so sad. Jade had arrived, that familiar feigned sweetness in her voice completing the knot in Becca's gut and pulling it tight. I hate it when people are sad. The young woman's focus was solely on Becca as she came to stand tantalizingly close to the barrier. This is a time to be happy she assured. You're one of my new potentials. Beautiful and lethal. A rare combination. A valuable combination. In the corner of her eye, Becca noticed the young twitcher shifting closer. The little prick's going to flap his mouth, she thought, angry at herself for not knocking him unconscious when she'd had the chance. The young man hooked Jade's attention, and the pair stared at each other, both silent for what seemed an age. Thinking that odd, Becca stepped closer to the barrier to draw the attention back. 
Glad to be valuable. Well, I'm glad you're glad, Jade said distractedly, her gaze finally breaking from the young twitcher. The girl regained her wide smile as she looked Becca over. My big Bob was a mean brute, she said eventually. A real special one, you know. And you surprised me, sweetie. You really did. She gave an enthusiastic nod, flawless eyebrows raised, and that strange skin swirling with all its bright colour. But sorry to say, I never judge on just one fight. It's kind of a thing for me. You'll have to keep proving yourself, I'm afraid. You keep that brave heart beating and I'll start moving you up the cell ranks. With one of her annoying giggles, the girl performed a perfect pirouette on the very tips of her toes and threw out an arm to indicate the long line of cells. Make it all the way to that top cell and you might even earn yourself some private quarters. Wouldn't that be nice, don't you think? She tilted her head, smile mad as ever. It'll be a lot of fights, she admitted, and swelled a finger in the general direction of Becca's face. All that beauty might become a thing of the past. But try not to let that get you down, honey. My advice would be to just focus on one fight at a time. Becca gave a subtle nod. Presently all her focus was allotted to holding back a scream at the heavens. Why the hell did the little bitch have to come to our cell now, the first damn time in days? At least the twitcher had remained silent. That was something. One last limp bit of luck. So come on then, my bright star. Jade activated a door-shaped opening in the force barrier with a theatrical snap of her fingers. I've got a wonderful new brute to pitch you against. Not big like Barb, but this guy's DNA has been spliced with a dog. Jade hopped on the spot, both hands clutched to her chest. I swear it's the craziest thing you'll ever see. Surely not crazier than you. Becca almost gave voice to the thoughts as she bunched her fists. So, let's see if you can avoid all those teeth, shall we? Jake continued. See if you can keep all your fingers and toes and win again. Avoiding the urge to shoot Franco one last glance, Becca saw no other option than to step through the opening. It was sorely tempting to make a lunge for Jade, but she'd already taken a few cautious steps back, and a couple of her goons had withdrawn their weapons. Okay, lead the way to the mutt man. Becca said, not wanting to give the young twitcher extra time to reconsider his silence. Ooh, such nerve, Jade said with a multicolored burst across her face. I really do hope he doesn't tear your throat out. With her usual playful flourish, the girl spun on her heel and began heading for the fighting domes, all the gathered punters peeling aside, eyes gleaming with anticipation. Becca followed, two of the armed goons falling in close behind her. With an effort, Becca tried to push away the disappointment of the failed plan to shift her thoughts from all that severed luck. Jade had suddenly chose her moment to screw things up, but amongst all the crazy babble, the little bubblegum bitch had hit on one truth. She was going to have to focus on the coming fight, would have to forget what had passed and concentrate on what was, to flip that switch and slide into that cold state of... or perhaps not. A single scream had rung out, or more a shriek, truth be told. It cut through the din and even made Jade falter mid-step. Then similar noises erupted in its wake, cries of shock and warning followed by blaster fire that quickly made the club's previous clamor seem a respectful hushed gathering. Becca felt her adrenaline pulse, quickening heart thudding. Franco had done it, had seen the risk in aborting and pushed ahead, opened the cell, opened all the cells, judging by the response, just as they'd planned, or near enough. Jade had whipped around, all those colours now frozen on her face, a perpetual smile suddenly proving far from it. But Becca wasted no time on the girl and instead span on the two goons guarding her. Both had turned to stare dumbly at the sudden outbreak. Taking full advantage, Becca cracked a fist into the back of one of their heads, hard enough she was confident he was already out of the fight. The second man turned, blaster coming up, but Becca kicked it from his hand and continued her momentum to strike his gut with her fist and his dropping chin with her knee. She didn't wait to watch him fall, but instead spun and lunged for Jade, resolute the little psycho wouldn't slip away. Just like her goons, Jade had barely moved, wide eyes locked on the escalating chaos. Only once Becca had seized her by the collar did she snap out of it, those big eyes whipping to her assailant. Becca glimpsed unexpected fear in the girl, which, had it lasted longer, may have incited a hint of undeserved pity. But any further signs were obliterated as the girl's colourful skin ignited with shockingly bright light. 
The intensity caused Becca to stagger back, eyes burning, feeling like she'd been thrown into the brightest of suns. She blinked rapidly, but her vision was shot, worse even than when Big Barb had flung her about the cage. She still had a hold of Jade, though, and with the temporary blindness putting her in no fit state to give chase, she made sure to hold on tight. Jade tried to pull away, but Becca yanked her back with no trouble, securing her into a well-practiced arm lock. Fortunately, the girl was light and easy to handle. She was unarmed, too, and bendy as fuck. What the bloody... One second, Becca had her in a firm hold, and the next, Jade had pivoted, bent, and contorted until her arm slid free from the lock. But Jade didn't run. Becca had never imagined the evil little princess to be a fighter, but somehow she'd maneuvered behind her and onto her back to wrap an arm, no, a leg, around her neck. Becca reached up to grab the limb, but every time she did, the girl contorted into a different position, squirming and bending like some deep-sea fricking invertebrate. Furiously blinking, Becca stumbled, trying to regain control of the fight while becoming acutely aware of just how much her skills relied on sight. Hearing, too, which was presently being assaulted by blaster fire and the shrieks of people fleeing. So many were fleeing, in fact, that Becca was amazed none had crashed into them. Then someone crashed into them. They hit the floor hard, but despite the impact, Jade clung on, still trying her best to tie herself in a knot around Becca's neck. Finally, Becca got a good hold on a skinny limb and twisted hard. The pitch of the cry, however, told her the limb wasn't Jade's. Someone else was there, possibly the person who collided with them. Becca opened her eyes wide, hopeful her vision might be recovering ever so slightly. She saw blurred shapes, felt the breath of grunted efforts as the newcomer grappled and pulled at Jade. Too small to be Franco or Feng, she decided. Moments later, Jade was torn free, or possibly she tore herself free to deal with her new assailant. Becca rolled to her hands and knees and turned about, trying to make sense of what was happening through her blurred vision. More fleeing figures swept past, but the chaos was thinning, or at least migrating toward the exits where there'd no doubt be an almighty bunching of very desperate people. There was a small bundle of rippling color about ten feet away, definitely jade. Becca's vision wasn't recovered enough to identify faces, but she could tell the girl was still on the ground, legs wrapped around the neck of whichever poor soul had come to the rescue. Becca's instinct was to rush in and return the favor by pulling the girl away, but she couldn't risk being blinded again. Even with blurry eyes, Becca quickly found a blaster, still half-gripped in the hand of an unconscious goon at her feet. Aware her mystery hero was lightly teetering at death's door, she snatched the weapon up and thrust it toward Jade, blinked a few times, then pulled the trigger. Nothing. Shit. Of course the damn thing was signatured. Spinning on a knee, she grabbed the unconscious goon's hand, manipulated the weapon into it, and heaved him into position. Things were coming into focus now, at least as well as the club's weird lighting allowed. Enough to see her rescuer's face, deathly blue in the throttling grip of Jade's legs. It was the young twitcher from their cell, weakly flailing and tongue lolling. No time. Praying for some of that fickle luck to return, Becca raised the goon's hand, aimed the blaster as best she could, and fired. Soft. Becca's shot had been on target, at least mostly. Jade was dead, leaving her victim to roll free of her lethal legs and curl up into a convulsive coughing fit. Holding the unconscious goon's hand against the grip of the blaster, Becca looked around as best she could. Her sight was still far from perfect, but it was enough to see that no one was about to descend on her with ill intent. In fact, there were very few remaining in the club. It was amazing how fast crowds could evacuate when a horde of disgruntled fighters were given freedom to roam. The people that could be seen were either trying to flush others out of hiding or abandoning those hiding places to bolt toward exits. The rest were flawed and unmoving. Some of the remaining fighters were shouting and whooping, reveling in the violence, or perhaps rejoicing at their sudden freedom, or most likely a bit of both. Unwilling to relinquish the blaster, Becca dragged the unconscious goon over to Jade's limp body, doing her best to keep the man's palm against the signatured weapon's grip. Despite her clearly being dead, Jade's skin was still full of that unnatural color, unnervingly changing and moving. Becca felt a pang of sorrow at having to kill someone so young. But how many lives had the girl herself ended? And judging by her last act, she certainly wasn't close to changing her ways. What the hell had turned her so psychotic? 
Dragging the unconscious goon further, Becca knelt down next to her rescuer. The young twitcher's coughing had abated to be replaced with a fit of cursing. He was gripping his right forearm, caught between the fear of seeing the wound there and the need to check his hand wasn't hanging off. Even with her messed up vision, Becca could see it wasn't bad, but she'd been clipped by enough blasters herself to know that even the slightest wound was painful as hell. You good, Sarge? Becca looked up to see Franco approaching, a hefty bottle filled with brightly colored liquor held tight in his fist like a club. Feng was by his side, looking unhurt and remarkably composed considering what had just occurred. Releasing the unconscious goon, Becca nodded. The little pixie had some serious fight in her and she lit up like a goddamn solar flare. Some sort of weird defense mechanism near blinded me. And this kid came to your rescue? Franco asked. The twitcher was still cursing, but he at least had the good grace to do it relatively quietly. Surprisingly, yes. Franco grinned. So you shot him to repay the favor? My aim wasn't at its best, Becca admitted. She looked back to the young man. Sorry I clipped you. Better than being strangled to death, though, right? The young man grunted a marginally softer curse. Taking his arm, Becca forced his hand from the wound and studied it. I know it hurts like hell, but it's not bad. It'll heal up without too much of a scar. She looked to Feng. You mind having a look about for a med kit? Feng nodded and wasted no time heading off to hunt for one. Seriously, Sarge? Franco said. I really don't think we've got time to be playing nurse with the kid. Anton! The young man said, having taken Becca's advice and quit his cursing. My name's Anton. He gave Franco a sour look, and I'm twenty-three bloody years old. Well, thanks for your help, Anton, Becca said. We'll get you patched up, and with any luck we'll find a few pain patches too. Standing, Becca held the blaster out to Franco. We'll have plenty of time to play nurse while you get busy unlocking a few of these weapons. Not looking pleased, Franco flipped the bottle in his hand, undid the stopper, and took a long swig. Then, conceding with a nod, he took the blaster and in exchange passed her the bottle. Becca took a swig of her own and worked it around her mouth before spitting it out. Good enough, she muttered, and knelt to slosh some of the liquid onto Anton's wound. There was a fresh bout of cursing as she helped him sit up. I can't believe you killed her. Anton said, looking a little pale as he gazed across at Jade's limp body. Seeming to have caught up with the fact she was dead, Jade's augmented skin was finally calming down, the colors slowly muting. Yeah, well, she had it coming, Becca said, her words far colder than she meant. I'm not overly fond of her brother either. Anton continued to stare at the body, lost in thought. He was shot the smart one. Becca nodded. Good, so we're left with the dim one. No, we're left with the aggressive one. Becca raised her brow. That was quite a statement, considering Jade had just tried to strangle the life out of him with her bare legs. Getting a measure of the young man wasn't proving easy. He was much better spoken than she would have imagined, a far cry from her initial impression having witnessed his mad mutterings and jittery actions in the cell. Feng soon arrived back with a meg kit and handed it to Becca with a smile. Found it behind the bar over there. Good, thanks. You have any injuries that need patching? Fang shrugged. No, I was lucky. Lucky, or well, you handled yourself well, Becca wondered. She eyed him for a moment before rummaging through the contents of the meg kit. Hopefully we'll... Becca's words faltered as she turned to see that Anton had crawled over to Jade's lifeless body and was busily searching her. What the hell are you doing? She snapped, on the verge of grabbing his collar and dragging him away. You can keep your crappy little box of meds, Anton said as he pulled a small cylinder from somewhere on Jade's person. Then, with a sort of desperate yet triumphant expression, he ejected a tiny tab and pressed it against the underside of his wrist, causing a shudder to run through his slender body. Too damn long, he breathed, tilting his head back. There was another shudder. Then he looked back down and resumed his search of the dead girl's clothing. Becca sighed and passed the meg kit back to Feng. Whatever weird narcotic the young man was indulging in, she didn't want to know. She was curious, though, how he knew the girl possessed it. It didn't strike her as a lucky guess. The signature coding on these weapons is more complex than I thought, Franco said, catching Becca's attention. The corporal's augment was lit up in his hand as he turned the blaster about. It's doable, but might take some time. Could we, maybe? Feng wore an awkward expression as he glanced down at the unconscious goon. 
Chop off his finger, or hand, or whatever's required to keep the weapon activated. Franco scoffed. First off, Feng, that's pretty freaking dark. And second, the tech's way smarter than that. No pulse, no pew-pew. Unlocking even one of them could take some time. Then we'll take a couple with us, Becker said. You can work on them on the move. You'll be wasting your time, Anton had stood up, finally leaving Jade to rest in peace. And how would you know that? Franco asked. I used to be part of their entourage, Anton replied. Right up until I wasn't. Becca raised her brow. Seriously? I never lie, Anton said, staring at them as if daring his statement to be opposed. Whatever was in the skin tab the young man had indulged in, it was already making him look and sound a good deal more confident and the wound on his forearm seemed all but forgotten by a tut and a mumbled comment that it had ruined his shirt. For almost three years, all was happy days, Anton continued, preciously stepping over the arm of a sprawled goon. Then one day I expressed my opinion a little too much. He nodded back toward Jade. It turned out she had a very definitive line she didn't like crossed. Franco frowned at Becker, then held up the blaster. And why would unlocking these be a waste of time? Anton looked at him like the answer was blindingly obvious. As soon as Jareth makes it back here, he'll deactivate the missing weapons remotely. Noticing a goon staring at his feet, Franco leaned over and casually put him back to sleep with the butt of the blaster. Well, just in case your boy's not as thorough as you give him credit for, I think we'll take them anyway. Looking distractedly past Anton, Franco glared at an old man who was making his way toward them. Nothing to see here, old timer. The old man slowed, but still continued his approach, raised hands trembling. I'm no threat. I'm out of the cells too. I wondered if I could stick with you guys. Sorry, pal, Franco said without hesitation. You're on your own. The old man dropped his hands and scuffed his heels as he came to a stop. Not sure I'd make it on my own, and in all honesty, I'm not sure where I'd even make it to. Franco muttered something under his breath and shook his head. I've got no one the old man continued. Would appreciate your help. Becker looked toward Feng. You have room on your ships? I've room for many, Feng said, even on the smaller of the two. Room on board isn't the issue here, Franco said. We've still got to get to the damn ships first. What's your top speed on foot, old timer? Not great, I'm guessing. The old man shrugged and looked toward Becker, obviously detecting that she was the more charitable of the pair. Becker sighed inwardly and leaned closer to Franco. Cal would never leave injured behind like this, no matter how desperate the situation. Franco's jaw tightened. Problem is, the great lieutenant Cal Harper, with all his medals of valor, isn't here. No, just us, Becker said, eyes unwavering. You say something about a ship? They all turned to see that two more figures were approaching. A heavy-set man with ruddy cheeks, helping a woman almost equal to his own size, with a nasty-looking wound on her thigh. We could do with a ride, too. The man had a bit of a wheeze to his voice that suggested his fitness might not be on a par with his obvious strength. Christ, Franco said, still shaking his head. This isn't the goddamn escorting service we're running here. Oh, I'm Danny, the big man said, oblivious to Franco's frustrations. Then he nodded to the lady he was dragging along with him. This is Donna. With sweat beading on her brown skin, Donna gave them a docile smile. She got bit on the leg during her last fight, Donnie explained. Her opponent weren't exactly human. I've had a couple of fecked up opponents too, the old man said. Not natural and not feckin' fair. I'm Jim, by the way. Glad to meet you, Jim, Donnie said. Glad to meet all of you. Franco looked up to the ceiling as if seeking out the particular god that was pranking him. He turned to Becker and lowered his voice. Seriously, Bex, we haven't got time for this shit. We've got to get moving. We can't be looking after all the pathetic dregs from the cells. You really want to leave these people behind? Becker asked him. That would sit okay with you, would it? When we're safely on the ship and flying away from this place? I'm just trying to be realistic here. There you go with your damned realism again, Becker said, doing her best to keep her voice steady. What the hell have we become if we don't at least try to help these people? Franco sucked on his teeth for a moment as he regarded the newcomers. He was pissed off, but there was also a hint of conflict in his eyes. Cal had this soft side, Bex, one that didn't do him any favors, and you're inheriting it. If we... Did I hear you have a ship? A tall, disheveled woman was limping toward them, behind Donnie and Donna. 
Without bothering to turn, Franco let out an exasperated laugh. I don't know why the fuck I'm laughing, he muttered to himself. This is pretty fucking far from funny. I'm Clarissa Winton Clark, the limping woman said. I mean Clara, please just call me Clara. There was a tremble to the woman's voice that spoke of barely retained tears. She might have been elegant and beautiful at one time, but less so now. Her limp being far from the worst of her problems, she had that awful green tint to her skin and half her hair had fallen out, clear signs of chakra sickness. As always, the sight of it sent a pang of anxiety through Becca. Don't you have family? The woman shook her head. A husband who hates me and all my friends are his friends. I'd rather put my trust in you and your guns, especially if you're heading for a ship. I promise I can keep up. Becca looked to Franco, who was still shaking his head. Just accept it, Corporal. We're going to help whoever we can. Uh-huh. So how's about you get that fight cage open, Becca said, nodding to one of the nearest silver domes. Looks like there's a couple of fighters stuck in there. You've got to be kidding me. They could be as innocent as us, probably more so. The quicker you do it, the quicker we're out of here. Becca drummed up some of the sergeant she used to be and pushed it into her expression. Soft, Bex. You've gone seriously soft. Franco gave a final shake of his head. But I'll get on it. Passing her the currently useless blaster, he scooped another off the floor and, mumbling under his breath, made his way to the fight cage. Becca looked at the gathered group, the cell dregs, as Franco had labelled them. In all honesty, she couldn't disagree. Skinny Anton, now high on some mystery narcotic, old man Jim, who was clearly unsteady on his feet, the big but seemingly unfit Donny, held up by his equally big but badly injured partner Donna and the once probably quite posh, but now limping and partially green Clarissa Winton Clark. Becca tried to project confidence as they all stared at her, eager for guidance. Before she could say anything, however, a loud clang made the whole group jump and turn to its source. Within one of the far walls, which was reinforced with black metal, two large, dark openings were just about visible. Shit, Anton blurted. You morons opened the D-cells. The what now? Becca said, not keen on the sudden fear in the young man's voice. The damn D-cells, Anton said, backing up a couple of steps. They keep the most dangerous in there, and when I say the most Anton fell silent as another clang sounded and a man emerged from the shadow of the D-cell on the left, or perhaps more of a beast. Muscles rippling upon muscles, a hulking form that, as his thumping footfalls brought him further into the light, appeared the very epitome of experimental splicing. Becca had seen spliced humans before, with fur, scales, claws, or even spines. But never had she seen all of those things on just the one person. The only thing lacking was wings. It made for quite the shocking sight. But perhaps even more shocking was the smile the beast man directed at them as he approached, a gentle one brimming with unlikely kindness. Becca was far from convinced she could trust the smile, but she stood her ground nonetheless and was surprised the rest of her newfound little group did too. The beast man came to a stop before them, yellow eyes sweeping over the group. The sound of fighting woke me from my long sleep, he declared in the deepest, most resonant voice Becca had ever heard. Much gunfire, too. I rose to see my cell open, yawning wide for me to walk right on through. Which of you is responsible? As the monstrous man waited for a reply, Becca caught Anton pointing at her in her peripheral vision. Little bastard, she thought, any credit he'd earned for helping with Jade obliterated in an instant. The strange yellow eyes rested on Becca. Who was you? Becca tried not to let her tension show. Indirectly, yes. The man nodded and Becca was faced with his colossal hand extended toward her, not to mention the equally colossal decision of whether to shake it. His palm was covered in scales, and the back of the hand in thick, matted fur. Her first instinct was to back up and direct the blaster at him in the hope he didn't realize it was presently useless. But something in his eyes told her he meant no harm, at least she fucking hoped not, as she reached out and allowed her hand to be enveloped in the massive furry fist. The man's grip proved just as gentle as his smile. I'm much obliged, he rumbled. And with that, he released her hand, turned and walked away, adopting a mellow pace as his big thudding strides carried him toward the club's exit. Fucking heck, the old man Jim said. Yes, indeed, Clara added. 
Donny gave a short, low whistle. Not often me and Donna are made to feel small. Donna just smiled. Her muscles relaxing, Becca looked to the other cell. Who's in that one? Oh, what's in that one? Jim said. I've no clue, Anton admitted, but I suggest we don't bother hanging around to find out. Agreed, Becca said, relieved to see that Franco was already making his way back over. But he wasn't alone. There was an injured man hanging off him, who, judging by his bloody, battered face, had definitely been on the losing side of whatever fight he'd been engaged in. Franco didn't look happy, but was hauling the poor soul along nonetheless. The man had incredibly neat, white blonde hair that stuck straight up in a flat top style. How the hell the hair had remained so pristine when his face had been so ruined was anyone's guess. A new recruit for our little gang? Becker asked, one eyebrow raised. I don't want to talk about it, Franco said, hauling the man closer. I gotta say, Corporal, you're looking a little soft. Franco scowled. I said I don't want to discuss it. Cal would be proud. Fuck the lieutenant. Now can we please just get the hell out of here? Becker couldn't suppress a little smile. Sure thing, softy. Let's make tracks. Grip on Reality Cal was relieved to be back outside where things made a little more sense, and he was certainly relieved to be heading upward. They'd not yet entirely escaped the darkest, dankest depths, but every step climbed inched them closer to those bright skies and colorful vistas. Even the increasing movement of the vines was welcome. Best of all, though, was the fact that he and his friends were still alive, an outcome which until very recently was absurdly unrealistic. But it was impossible to feel completely optimistic. They'd still had no success in contacting Jumper and Victor. The unstable energies emanating from the alien's crashed ship might have been the cause, but it could have been something more sinister, and the uncertainty was gnawing at him. On top of that was the fact they were putting their trust in an alien who'd seen fit to abduct them just hours previously. But what alternative was there? Even if they could overpower or evade it, would they want to? They'd come here seeking knowledge that was sorely needed, had risked their lives in the hope they might discover something that would lead to an advantage. And if the mystery continued to unfold the way it was, they may just have hit some sort of jackpot. Since leaving the crashed ship, their strange blue companion had led them at quite a pace, its long limbs negotiating even the trickiest vines with deft agility. The silver sphere hovered by its side every step of the way, and there was still enough gloom to highlight the bizarre bioluminescence that surrounded the alien as it moved, pulses of colorful light rippling out across the vines and foliage with each footfall. Seeing it now made Kel realize the extent to which it must have been tracking them during their descent, as well as its proximity. Occasionally, the alien would pause to stare back at them, something in the slight shifting of those large black eyes that suggested impatience. The fact they were all dosed up with Excel and moving faster than the fittest of humans could ever dream seemed not to register. Luckily, the route they were taking was close to the one Cal would have chosen himself. What he'd do if that changed, he had no clue. Would their eager new companion welcome a debate on the best path? Was a debate even possible with the communication barrier? And if a choice had to be made, should they part ways in favor of returning to the Star Splinter? Cal doubted it. They'd come this far, and after all they'd been through, there was no way they could leave having learned or gained nothing. Climbing alongside Kaya, Cal churned through his thoughts in silence. He was keen to dig into it verbally, but Kaya had her eyes fixed on the alien ahead, wearing an expression he knew all too well. That scientific brain of hers was working through theories, weighing up possibilities, a process that required peace and quiet, and so he waited to let her break the silence when she was ready. As Kaya negotiated a tight twist of multiple vines ahead of him, Cal glanced back at Toka and Eddie, who were following a few paces behind. By some miracle, the pair were also silent, no doubt coming up with ideas and conclusions of their own. And a few paces behind them, Cassius was flanked by Bright and Tawny. The corporals just looked relieved to be back on a task that made sense, a task to devote all their focus on and divert them from the weirdness that was far above their pay grade. Cassius was adhering to the swift pace well, his effort suggesting he was about as keen on the gloomy bowels of the planet as the rest of them. Our new friend's physiology's like nothing I've ever seen, Kaya said, turning to Cal as he negotiated the twisted vines. 
I'm assuming you mean the apparent lack of anything resembling bone or muscle, Cal said, thankful she was ready to discuss it. Both their voices were labored by the harsh pace, but he doubted the alien was about to slow to allow for comfortable conversation. Yes, but more than that, Kaya said, it's as if he's less solid than us, a different frequency of biology. Cal looked ahead, pleased their vine was opening up into a relatively unobstructed route. How might that work? Honestly, anything I say at this stage would be a guess. Guesses can be useful, especially educated ones. Cal almost laughed out loud at seeing Kaya's frown. He knew she hated guessing, or at least hated voicing those guesses. I promise not to quote you to the scientific press, he assured her. Her frown turned to something close to a smile. None of us are truly solid, she continued hesitantly. Not when you look close enough. At the scale of atoms and subatomic particles, we're just frequencies of energy. Quantum beings. Hmm, a hint of the frown returned. If you must give it a label, then yes, perhaps something along those lines. We're touching on one of science's longest-running challenges, and honestly, it's not my area of expertise. But different frequencies can dictate different solid states, and if those frequencies were tapped into and controlled, perhaps our new companion moves its physical form by manipulating energies in ways that differ from our own, something far removed from electrical signals through nerves and muscle. And the strange light show, Cal said, looking toward the luminous light spreading out around the alien's form as it took a rare pause some distance ahead. Kaya shook her head before ducking under some foliage that hung down like tangled webs from high above. Not sure I could even guess at that. Perhaps the side effects of alien energies introduced to an environment so radically dissimilar to its own. Or maybe it's doing it on purpose, lighting our way. We've already witnessed its ability to manipulate the solid state of the vines. It's not just the vines it can manipulate, Cal said after a moment, thinking back to his abduction. Seeing Kaya's questioning look, he activated his visor, bringing it partially down over his face, then tapped at its hard surface with his gloved finger. When our blue friend trapped me, I closed my visor, bit of a pathetic last effort at defending myself. Turned out I delayed it for an entire second before its finger passed straight through, treated the visor like it was no more solid than running water. Cal retracted the visor and whatever it did left no lasting damage. Even my screen data is still functioning. Kaya fell silent, mulling over that as they slowed to traverse a smooth, damp portion of vine. Only once they'd made it back to the usual craggy surface with thick clumps of absorbent moss could they again pick up their pace. Eventually, they drew close to the alien, but as soon as they did, it once again turned and continued on, this time dropping to all fours to scale a series of smaller curling vines that trailed down from high above. Christ, Cal said, as they reached the vines and looked up to assess the climb. Both of them were breathing hard now, which was a tricky state to reach when dosed up on Excel. I feel like I'm back at the academy, except this alien's a harder ass than any of my drill sergeants ever were. Kaya nodded, chest heaving as she tugged experimentally at one of the thin vines. Then she retracted her hand to find it covered in a clear, sap-like moisture. How the hell do we get ourselves into these situations, Cal? she asked, shooting him a look as she tried to flick the gooey substance off her hand. Following a mind-reading, matter-bending alien on a planet made of giant vines. Just blessed, I guess. Well, it's straining my grip on reality. Cal could sympathize, his own grip on reality not feeling all that robust either. Don't forget them weird gravity dips, Eddie said as she and Toka came up behind them. Big ass cats too, Toka added, breathing hard and taking the opportunity to bend over and lean on his knees. A series of loud clicks sounded from somewhere high above. Impatient bastard, isn't it? Toka said, not letting go of his knees as he tried to look up into the gloom. Whatever gets us up and out of this soggy, loopy-ass jungle works for me, Eddie said, regarding the slippery-looking foliage with a screwed-up face. Quicker the better. You expect me to climb through that with my wrists bound, Harper, Cassius said, as he, bright and tawny, came to a stop a few paces behind them. Both his voice and expression held a good deal of scorn, all signs of his usual cocky, mocking nature absent. I expect you to stay quiet. Cal replied, as quiet as any bag of cargo should be as we haul your ass up there with zipper lines. Eddie snorted a laugh. Sure we shouldn't just leave him down here, Toka asked. Kaya's expression suggested she agreed with Toka. 
Scaling slippery foliage was going to take time, and this was undoubtedly the first of many difficult spots. Hauling a bound pirate was going to put a serious dent in their pace. Our taskmaster won't be happy, he mused, just as more loud clicks aptly sounded from above. Okay, you two head off first, he said, looking at Eddie and Toka. Once you reach... Cal's instructions were interrupted by a sudden shifting of the foliage, which rapidly intensified. At first he put it down to another of the weird dips, but the vine on which they all stood hadn't shifted an inch. Quickly it was apparent that only one vine was moving, a smallish one, only a meter in diameter, that was looping down from above like some sort of giant snake. Flippin' heck, Eddie blurted as they all stumbled back and raised their weapons. The dropping vine continued to smoothly shift and curl until a portion of it had come to a rest right in front of them, a portion precisely wide enough for them all to step onto. More loud clicks sounded from above, infused with that familiar impression of impatience. Kaya wiped her hand on her thigh to rid herself of the last remnants of the goo. She looked like she wanted to comment on the surreal occurrence, but didn't quite have it in her. Anyone fancy going first? Toka said, sounding like he was too short on energy to feel surprise. Lowering her rifle, Eddie boldly stepped onto it. Like I said, quicker the better, and I reckon Blue agrees. With some shrugs and strong-arm encouragement directed at Cassius, they all followed suit. As the vine rose like the smoothest of elevators, Cal leaned in close to Kaya. How's that grip on reality? She didn't answer, but her expression said it all. The Fool What do you suppose it's waiting for? Kaya stared at their alien companion who'd stopped some fifty paces ahead and was perched high upon a twisted split in a vine that was jutting up like a colossal shard of aged bone, sparse trails of foliage hanging down around it like ragged ropes. He had another mystery, Cal muttered. They'd escaped enough of the gloom for the alien to be clearly seen across the distance, and the manner in which its long hands and feet were curled about the jagged peak of the shard, long limbs bent up tight, put Cal in mind of an oversized praying mantis. I think we can rule out the idea that it's catching its breath, though. I get the impression it could circumvent this entire planet before needing a break. They had ascended high enough for the giant vines to open up again, the reduced weight giving them the freedom to branch out in ever-increasing loops and twisted coils, hints of daylight struggling through. It was still far from bright, but it was enough for muted splashes of colour to be seen, and for the occasional buzzing insect to zigzag through the increasingly warm and dry air, little reminders of the Eden that awaited further above. The alien had remained still for at least ten minutes, silently looking upward, its black eyes peering through the weaving mass. Cal did his best to read the alien's poise, trying to decide if it was the patient weight of a hunter or the cautious pause of prey. Since coming to a stop, the alien's hovering sphere had ascended through the foliage and vines, its movements smooth and silent as it disappeared from view, each time returning some minutes later. A few times Cal had seen the alien turn to the sphere as if conversing with it, but whether it was simple instructions or a full-on conversation was anyone's guess. You think that sphere's sentient? he asked Kaya, verbalizing his thoughts. Some sort of AI drone? Could be, Kaya replied. Certainly possible, considering how advanced the technology appears. Cal continued to stare, the weight making him increasingly uneasy. I'm getting the distinct impression it's scouting for dangers. Kaya shot him a glance. You think it knows something we don't? I think it knows a lot we don't, but hopefully it's just being cautious. Cal tried to sound relaxed, but considering the alien's previous eagerness for a swift pace, it was a struggle. Looking to his left, Cal saw that Eddie and Toka had no such worries. The pair of them looked almost joyful, sat together on some large sort of fungi, lightly bouncing on its spongy surface. Their ability to smile during times of high stress never ceased to amaze him, but perhaps they were just happy to still be alive and were celebrating the fact in their own way. In contrast, Cassius didn't look remotely close to celebrating. For the past hour, his suspicious glare toward the alien had subsided in favor of a malice-filled frown directed solely at Cal. Cal had done his best to ignore it. In fact, he'd made efforts to not even think of the pirate, let alone look at him. But it wasn't easy. 
Despite the intensity of their present situation, his mind would occasionally turn to the man's recounting of his childhood, that nightmarish experience at the hands of the pirate queen. A boy half burned, then half machine, then biological freak. Was there truth to it? And was he a part of it? Or was it just Cassius's way of getting in his head, screwing with all the memories and dreams that had been resurfacing? Whatever the truth may be, the more he tried to push the thoughts away, the stronger they pushed back. I think perhaps I'll check on our prisoner, Cal said as he straightened up. Kai's expression suggested it was an extra complication he didn't need, but she nodded nonetheless. I'll keep a close eye on our blue friend. Cal gave both the corporals a smile as he approached. The slight swaying of the vines was again strong enough for Tawny to look a little pale, and Bright was showing signs of fatigue, as no doubt they all were. But neither of them questioned what the holdup was, just continued their impeccable guarding of Cassius while keeping a diligent eye on their surroundings. You're putting a good deal of energy into that frown, Cal said, stepping close to Cassius and just about keeping his own frown in check. What the fuck are you playing at, Harper? The pirate spat, apparently not feeling the need for pleasantries, not even the mocking kind. What am I playing at? Yes, is it your mind you've lost or just your balls? Cal raised an eyebrow. Okay, let's pretend for a moment you're not a prisoner and that your opinion matters more than the bug shit beneath our boots. What exactly do you think I should be doing? Getting a handle on your misguided trust would be a good fucking start. Cassius nodded sharply toward the alien. Trusting this bastard thing, whatever the fuck it is, I had you pinned as naive, but perhaps not a fool. So why are you playing the fool now? Cal scratched at his chin, his eyebrow refusing to drop. I see. So, once I've got a handle on my trust, which of our abundance of options should I be choosing? Had you not considered that this blue fucker is leading us to more of its friends, more of your insidians? Cal had, of course, considered this. He wanted to believe the alien, whatever it was, and wherever the hell it came from, was a potential ally. Wanted to believe that if it meant them harm, they'd already be dead. But despite their regained freedom, it was certainly still possible it had ill intentions, perhaps leading them into a trap and manipulating them into following willingly for convenience's sake. Such a thing seemed unlikely, but then nothing of late could be labelled as likely. Or perhaps it had other sinister intentions he hadn't even considered. None were jumping out at him, though, at least nothing logical, and presently he saw no other option but to play the cards they'd been given. So you prefer we give it the slip, perhaps head back down and live out our lives in the gloom? Cassius bunched his jaw in anger, eyes narrowed. I prefer we didn't simply follow it like a pack of damn puppies. I thought you were a soldier, so why the fuck aren't you acting like one? He nodded at the ten-click pulse rifle in Cal's hands. Have you forgotten how to use that? Cal mocked puzzlement. Have you forgotten what happened last time it was used? Last time the bastard was unseen, using its tricks to take us by surprise. But for the past few hours, I've lost count of how many times it's had its back to us. Close enough that a fucking rookie couldn't miss, and you've not so much as raised your weapon. And there was the very reason Cal hadn't raised his weapon. Surely a foe with ill intentions could never put itself in such a vulnerable position, not when it had already proved how technologically and biologically superior it was. It seemed to be putting its trust in them, and for now Cal saw no reason not to reciprocate. Obviously Cassius didn't see it that way. If you truly give a shit about your friends, Cassius continued, glancing pointedly toward Eddie and Toka, then you'll shred this alien and get us back to your ship as fast as possible. Bury your misguided trust and do what needs to be done. Or if you're not man enough, get one of your square jaws to do it, he said, indicating bright and tawny with a jerk of his head. If you're smart, you'll do it, Harper. Shoot it before the opportunity. Cassius's words died on his lips and were replaced by a hissed curse. Cal turned to see that the alien had risen from its perch and was now standing tall, torso twisted and head turned toward them, those intimidating black eyes locked on him and Cassius as if it had heard every word they'd said. Or sensed our thoughts, Cal wondered with a spike of adrenaline, just as it did to me on board its ship. Something in the alien's stance was making Cal's heart thud, the utter stillness of its body and those black eyes so unreadable setting off some primal alarm. Do it now, Harper, Cassius hissed. End this fucker or we're all screwed. You know I'm right.
Breaking its unnerving stillness, the alien sank back down onto all fours and began to crawl down the shard of twisted vine with frightening agility. Harper, Cassius spat. Last chance, don't risk your friends. Not risking his friends was good advice, Kel thought, and that was exactly why he wasn't about to shoot or even raise his weapon. They were no match for this alien, back turned or not, and if there was a chance it might become their ally, the sort of ally they desperately needed, it wasn't about to fill that opportunity with holes. They hadn't come all this way and taken all this risk for nothing. Reaching the base of the shard, the alien once again straightened and began to move toward them, purposeful strides that set Cal's heart thudding even harder. Kaya had backed out of its path and was shooting Cal a fearful glance. Shoot it, Harper! Cassius barked, abandoning his attempts to stay quiet as hints of fear found their way into his voice. Mostly confident in his assessment, Cal still didn't so much as raise his weapon. Sir, both Bright and Tawny said in unison. Cal glanced back at them. Stand down, corporals. You too, Eddie, he said, knowing the girl would be preparing to shoot or even pounce. God damn it, Harper! Cassius growled as the alien closed the gap. He looked over the edge of the vine as if contemplating jumping, but Cal knew he wouldn't do it. Even if he did survive the fall, there was nowhere to run, no way to survive. So instead Cassius backed away, perhaps hoping the corporals might see sense. But after only two steps, his feet sank into the vine. He cursed as he tried to struggle free, but the vine had already turned solid, encasing both his legs up to his knees. Harper, you're going to let it kill me in cold blood! Having paused only briefly to manipulate the vine, the alien was almost on them now. It'll kill all of us, fucking shoot it! Keeping his weapon directed at the floor, Cal moved in front of Cassius to block the alien's path, his heart pounding almost painfully as he raised a pacifying hand. Much to his relief, it worked, and the alien came to a stop right in front of him. Its height, however, allowed those black eyes to remain fixed on Cassius. He's no threat to you. Cal said, hoping the alien would at least understand the intentions behind his words, if not the words themselves. He's unarmed and bound, and his thoughts and opinions are of no consequence, completely meaningless and ineffectual to the rest of us. Without removing its eyes from Cassius, the alien snatched Cal's rifle from his grip, movements almost too fast to see and strength too great to resist. Shit! Adrenaline seared through Cal's veins, his mind whirling over the implications if Cassius did indeed have the right of it. Desperately searching for the best words, Cal was about to state his case further when the alien flipped the rifle with that same frightening speed and aimed it over his shoulder at Cassius's head. His reactions and instincts getting the better of him, Cal took a step back to block the alien's aim. Cal, what the hell are you doing? Toka shouted. Bright also barked his concerns, or maybe Tawny, or possibly both. Everyone stay calm, Cal said, both hands now raised and doing his utmost to take his own advice. Keep your weapons down. He's not worth getting killed for, Toka said, his voice still far from calm. Just let it shoot the bastard pirate's head off, came Eddie's unhelpful contribution. Nobody's getting their head blown off, Cal said, far from confident in his declaration. He noticed the alien was wielding the weapon as correctly and confidently as any well-trained soldier, but most remarkable by far was the fact its long fingers had shrunk in order to hold the weapon more effectively. Cassius barked another curse, and Cal risked a glance back to see that the alien had again manipulated the vine, this time raising the pirate upward to ensure an unimpeded aim. There's no reason to shoot him, Cal said, shaking his head at the alien and surprised at the level that he didn't want Cassius killed. This is just who he is. Aggression and anger run through his veins, but I still can't let you kill him. I won't... Click, click, click. The alien pulled the trigger in rapid succession, and if the rifle had responded, it would have torn Cassius to shreds. But no discharge had come, and Cal had the distinct impression the alien wasn't surprised by the fact. Looking down and tilting its head at Cal, that strange mouth appeared on the alien's face, followed by its equally strange form of speech. Cal desperately wished he could decipher all those lyrical clicks, but the alien was making other efforts to make its meaning clear. Turning the rifle in its hands, it manipulated the controls, as deftly as if it were its own design, and switched the mode from pulse discharge to hard rounds. It was a modification Lawrence had ensured was implemented into all new weaponry. Once again thrusting the weapon in Cassius's direction, the alien fired, too fast for Cal to react. Not that there was any reaction that could have helped. 
The hard rounds burst from the muzzle to thud into the vine that encased Cassius's legs, not one of them hitting the pirate, as splinters and debris exploded into the air. All fell quiet, nothing to be heard other than the sizzling of wood and the distant buzzing of the occasional insect that cared nothing for the unfolding drama. Its muzzle still smoking, the alien flipped the rifle again and held it toward Cal like an offering. Cal's heart slowed as his head caught on, and cautiously he accepted the rifle with an appreciative nod. Then, quite as if far too much time and effort had been wasted highlighting something obvious, the alien sounded a few more brief clicks and turned to stride back towards its vantage point. There was one last curse, and Cal turned to see that Cassius had crashed down, the vine having reverted to its original shape. Lying flat on his back, the pirate looked decidedly unimpressed with the outcome, despite having no holes through him. Well, that was a little intense, Toka said once the alien was climbing back up its splintered shard of vine. Just a bit, Cal muttered, his mind working over the turn of events. Corporal Tawney, how's your pulse rifle? Pulse rounds are dead, sir, came the quick answer. Mine's screwed too, Eddie said, having taken a leaf out of the alien's book and tested her rifle in Cassius's direction. Okay, everyone switch to hard rounds, Cal said as he adjusted his own rifle's mode. What's Blue done to them? Eddie said as she adjusted hers too. I don't think our alien friend's the cause, Eddie, Cal replied. On the contrary, I think it's trying to warn us. The Insidians, Toka said, cottoning on to Cal's suspicions. You think it's the Insidians? They're screwing up the weapons like they did back on C9? That signal they used to disrupt our pulse tech? Quite possibly. Cal looked toward Kaya, who'd made her way over to them, her expression grim. Our weapons worked previously, so the aliens' crashed ship is an unlikely cause. I can't think of anything else that would have such an effect. So they're here? Eddie asked. Here on this planet? Maybe. We can't know for sure, but I think it's better we assume that's the case. What about Jumper and Victor? Toker asked, his fear and frustration clear as he peered up through the looping tangle above. They can handle themselves, Cal said, forcing confidence into his voice. This was no time to be sinking into a well of worries and fears. They're likely safe and busily discussing their concerns for us, so let's get moving and put those concerns to rest as quickly as we can. Bright was hauling Cassius to his feet while Tawny kept her weapon trained on him. Cal frowned at the pirate, who stared back with an unreadable expression. It wasn't gratitude for the attempt at saving his life, but it wasn't hatred either. Some murky area in between, perhaps. Whether the turn of events had swayed the man's assessment of their situation was unclear, but for now it had at least shut him up. In Cal's estimation, the alien's actions had earned it a deal more trust. Whether their strange companion was an insidian was impossible to know, but it seemed to want them aware of the danger, wanted them prepared to fight without surprises. Hefting his rifle, Cal turned from Cassius without a word and set his attention on the path ahead. Only time would tell which one of them truly proved the fool. Trust The narcotic Anton had indulged in certainly didn't hamper the young man's energy as he led them through the pristine streets of the Breen sector. Occasionally, Becker caught a grin on the young man's face, giving the unnerving impression he was treating this escape like some sort of game. She thought about letting him speed on ahead to play the game solo, but he seemed by far the most confident at navigating this sector of the city, so for now she stuck close enough to periodically force him to stop and let the rest of their disheveled little band catch up. Fortunately, not much catching up was required. In fact, Becker was amazed by their swift pace. Despite his shakes, Jim was proving pretty spry for an older fellow. Clara, too, was doing surprisingly well despite her chaka sickness and limp, perhaps the fear of being abandoned giving extra fuel to her good leg. Donny was wheezing pretty badly, but considering his size and the fact he'd practically carried Donna the whole way, his efforts were impressive. Even the bloody, beaten man Franco had extricated from the fighting dome had recovered enough to keep up without aid, and despite his mouth being a swollen mess, he'd managed to introduce himself as Shep. The evening had turned late enough for the streets to be empty, and any establishments they passed were now closed. 
but the softly glowing neighborhood lights offered good illumination, and the few people they did see were all cocooned within sleek transport pods, which occasionally glided past with a gentle hum. Considering the nature of the club, they'd not long escaped. The pristine streets, with their lavish buildings and delicate, sweet-smelling fruit trees, seemed almost unreal. They emanated a sense of safety, a feeling of civilized society, a place brimming with security and order. But Becker was under no illusion. They weren't part of this society, and the fact even Feng and Clara were keen to flee was warning enough. And of course, there was Jareth. Not seeming the type to take the death of his sister well, he would certainly be hunting them, and he'd be far from alone. Franco had at least unlocked a blaster while on the move, and soon they'd hopefully have two. But any confidence the weapons brought shrank into oblivion any time Becker thought of Jareth's slaughter bot. Soon they turned a corner and were faced with a manicured square that was lined with flowering bushes and elegant benches. Anton hopped onto the lip of a glittering fountain that graced the center of the square and looked around as if musing over which direction to head. Maybe we should rest, Fang suggested. Ah, Jim agreed, leaning over with bony hands on his bony knees. Best idea I've heard for a while. Absolutely not, Anton snapped. You can take a breather when we get off the streets. We're exposed here. We need to find an exit so we can continue our climb outside. Outside? Donnie asked between wheezing breaths. What about the toxic air? Not outside the dome, dumbass, Anton spat. Outside this tower so we can ascend the workman routes. What about the authorities? Jim asked. Could they help us? They could help us die, Anton said without a trace of sarcasm. I'd say about 50% of the peacemaker guards in this sector would seek Jareth's reward before we'd even finished our plea, and the remaining half simply wouldn't give a shit. Not about a group so far removed from their residential elite. Becker looked to Fang, seeking some sort of confirmation. It's true. The authorities can be corrupt in the upper sectors, Fang agreed, and they tend to be territorial, looking out for their own. It would be a gamble. It would be suicide, Anton said. What about those auto-transporter pod things? Donnie asked as he heaved Donna's arm into a better position over his shoulder. Could we hail one of those? Have an implant, do you? Anton asked, his voice growing ever thicker with derision. Because I don't see one in those sausage fingers of yours. He held up his own hand to wiggle his stump, then nodded toward Fang. Mine's gone, and rich boy there's in the same boat as me. He turned his eyes on Clara and Shep. If either of you had an implant, they'd have locked it off too. And if I'm wrong about that, I'd assume common sense would have encouraged you to mention it already. Unless, of course, your sense was bashed out in the cages. Clara looked to her feet, favoring her good leg, then gazed at her long, intact fingers. My husband didn't allow me one. He was a touch controlling. His impossibly neat, white blonde hair shining in the moonlight, Shep looked toward Donnie and Donna as if unwilling to give Anton the courtesy of an answer. You two from the mid-levels? Seeming to understand him well enough despite his mangled mouth, both Donnie and Donna nodded. Yep, me too. Shep flexed his fingers, bruised and bloody knuckles cracking. Be pretty dumb to spend a year's wages on an implant, I reckon. Smirking at the man's attempt at speech, Anton shook his head. And how dumb are you feeling now, fat tongue? Shep shot him a cold look. Don't bother answering that, Anton continued. We don't have time for your moronic talk, we have to move. Now just who the heck put you in charge, boy? Jim said, straightening up and joining Shep in glaring at Anton. Anton scoffed. If we were leading a geriatrics brigade, I'd happily put you in charge, Rattlebones, but we're not. Seeing Jim tighten his bony fists, Becca stepped toward Anton. She was getting a strong sense of why Jade and Jareth had turned on him. Okay, enough. We don't have time for trading insults. You said we needed to get to the outside of the tower, to the workman route. What's your thinking? Anton looked as though he was just getting into his stride on the insults front, but he also seemed pleased that Becca was seeking his judgment and turned to her with a superior sort of smile. Scaling the outside will be a slower route using exterior freight elevators and scaling ladders, but no vehicles are allowed out there, not at these levels. No ships, no hover pods, not even personal hover gear. The docking bays are the only permitted airspace used strictly for entering and exiting the city's dome. Perhaps seeing the doubt in Becker's expression, Anton elaborated further. The rich don't like to risk being spied on, you see, or being taken hostage, so they have strict laws to help prevent such things, strict enough that even Jareth wouldn't cross them. 
If we go for the outside route, we even up the odds. Far less chance of being tracked or caught up with. Rid Jareth of his advantage. There was that look again, the one that suggested this was nothing more than a game to the young man. Becker shared a glance with Franco, and it was all the communication they needed. What Anton said made sense, but just how much they could trust him was unclear. Trust that his superior attitude and irritating smile weren't precursors to ill intentions, or simply trust that he knew what the hell he was doing. Feng, you agree with this? Becker asked, scaling the tower exterior to get to your neighborhood, to the havens and your ships. Feng shrugged. In all honesty, I've not much experience moving around on foot, not within the interior, and certainly not outside of the towers. I like my yoga, but I've never been big on walking. Hoverpods are for me, but like our young guide has already pointed out, he held up the stump of his missing finger, that option's been severed. I believe he's right about exterior vehicles not being allowed beyond the docking bays, though. I am right, Chubbs, and we're wasting time. Anton looked at Franco. You, stubble guy. Looking up from the blaster that he'd periodically been trying to unlock, Franco raised an eyebrow. Think you can use that magical hand of yours to hack some workman gates and freight elevators? Anton's tone was none too polite. Franco didn't answer, just used the edge of the weapon to scratch his bristly chin and looked again at Becker. They shared a silent nod. Okay, my baby chin stronzo. Franco stepped up to Anton and squeezed his shoulder, hard enough for the smug smile to falter. Let's head outside for a climb. The chase is on. I told you so. Becca glanced at Anton, then back down at her weapon, the readouts of which had gone blank. I did say Jareth would disable them, Anton reiterated smugly. Told you it would be an utter waste of valuable time and effort. Not half as much wasted time and effort patching you up, Becker thought, trying to suppress her irritation. It was now abundantly clear why the little prick had ended up in a cell. Mine's dead too, Franco said, having pointed his blaster toward the distant apex of the city's dome and ineffectually tugged on the trigger. Anton barked a short laugh. Says Aunt Genius stubble guy. Franco looked on the verge of using the dead weapon to reverse the young man's supercilious smile, or perhaps throwing him over the railing to their left, which bordered a drop so high it might as well have been endless. Becker didn't blame him, and would have been hard pushed to stop him. The discarded weapon clattered on the metal walkway as Franco got back to unlocking the workman gate, his implant pulsing beneath the skin of his hand. Since venturing to the tower's exterior, this was the fourth gate he'd hacked in the last hour, as well as two freight elevators. That, combined with the countless walkways and rung ladders they'd had to negotiate, was making Becker wonder if Anton's great plan was, in fact, a shit one. But they were committed now, and there was certainly no turning back. Shining overhead, the moon was at least proving a blessing as it illuminated their path, the city's protective dome giving it a bright pink hue. Its vibrancy was a stark difference to the dim, sickly orb Becker had gazed upon all the way down in the mines, where the air was thick with grit and pollution. Also misleading from the lowly view in the mines had been that the city's central tower was one solid block. Now they were most of the way up it, recklessly scaling its exterior, Becker realized it was, in fact, a collection of smaller towers, all closely bunched and soaring upward as if in some great competition. Here and there, tubular connections linked the towers, large enough to house entire streets filled with buildings just like those they'd been running along. So in case you're struggling to work it out, Anton said, the kaput weapons mean Jareth's arrived back at the club. It won't be long now before he comes for us, if he isn't already. At least he won't know where we've gone, Franco said. Chances are he'll be heading in the wrong direction. Anton scoffed. Yet another thing you're wrong about. A few irritating moments of the young man remaining silent caused Becker to sigh. So, you're going to elaborate? Anton sniffed and looked out over the view of the neighboring towers. He'll bargain that we're heading upward, up where there might be ships. That way, if he's wrong and we've actually gone down, he knows there'll be no escape. He can take his sweet time in tracking us. Maybe he'll be too busy rounding up all them other foyers who escaped the cells, Donnie suggested. Anton shook his head. Wrong again. He'll have his cousin scouring the city for the rest. Nowhere will be safe, except perhaps all the way down in the low dome bowl, deep down with all the freakish greens. He spared a glance at Clara. No offense. 
Clara nodded, a shaky sort of nod that suggested she didn't trust herself to answer with words. Cousins, Becca asked, keen not to linger on the subject of Chaka sickness. Anton nodded. Yep, and there's a lot of them. The younger generation of the deacons are a ruthless bunch, just like Jade and Jareth, a tight-knit group, fiercely loyal to each other. They'll be spreading out across the city as we speak. As for Jareth himself, the killers of his sister will be his priority. There's no doubt about that. Anton looked back at them all, sporting that disturbing little grin. Quite the conundrum for some of you lot, whether or not to stick with us three. He nodded toward Becca and Franco. The ones who opened the cells and did his sister in, but also the ones with the means to get you off this planet. Sucks to be you. The group looked at each other as if this hadn't yet dawned on them. Pleased with himself, Anton turned to Franco. How you getting on with that gate, stubble guy? Franco didn't bother turning from his work. Call me that again and I'll open it with your head. Anton looked ready to counter with some jibe, but something in Franco's tone made him think twice. You've really thought this escape process through, Becca said, hoping to distract the young man and possibly save his life. Anton leaned back against the railing, unconcerned by the terrifyingly long drop on its other side. Not my first attempt. Seriously? Of course seriously, I wouldn't have said it otherwise. The young man plucked a small, thin device from his pocket, something else he'd acquired from Jade's corpse. Activating it with a touch of a button, he began to dab its end to his face. Don't look so suspicious, he said, frowning at Becca. It's a regen stick. When they shoved me in that god-awful cell, they took my beauty aids away too, heartless beasts. A worse punishment than making me fight. He dabbed some more before lightly running it down the bridge of his nose. I used to be quite the stunner, believe it or not. Skin like marble, one of the top gems of their entourage. How many times have you tried to escape? Anton eyed her for a moment, the regen stick hovering over his chin. Then he shrugged. Jade used to like the fact I wasn't afraid to express my opinion. Then I pushed it a touch too far. It's possible I saw it coming, but I find it hard to stop myself. You don't say, Becca thought, but was intrigued enough to encourage him with a nod. My first was a genuine escape. After our disagreement, they slung me up over a drinks bar as a warning, or possibly just decoration for their amusement. After a few hours, I slipped the bonds and fell into the mingling crowds with no one paying much attention. I made it all the way to the Tukar neighborhood down in the Brinton sector before they caught up with me. Anton paused for a moment and offered Becca a go with the regen stick. She shook her head, causing him to frown and study her face for a moment, seeking imperfections. Are you sure? I'll make do with my current face, she assured him, hideous as it is. With a shrug, he continued his gentle dabbing. After that first escape, they started making it easier for me to slip away again. They enjoyed the chase, to the point it became entertainment for them, hunting me down for fun. Judging by that grin she'd repeatedly caught on the young man's face, Becca wasn't convinced the enjoyment was entirely one-sided, but for now she decided not to poke those flames. Anton sighed with perhaps a hint of genuine sadness. But now there's only poor old Jareth, and I doubt he's much in the mood for fun. But the chase is on, same as always. Have you tried this escape route before? No, never had the means to hack the exterior gates and elevators. I see, Becca said, relieved that was the case. And now have they caught you in the past? How? Anton turned to her as if surprised she needed to ask. With ease is how. They hold all the cards in this chase, or Jareth now does. I've only gotten as far as I had previously out of sheer bloody-mindedness, never finding myself in the mood for letting them catch me too quickly. Becca sighed. So what exactly are you saying? What I'm saying, soldier girl, is that you might as well enjoy the chase while it lasts, because eventually he'll catch us, even without Jade's help, then we'll all be screwed to varying degrees. For the first time, Anton wasn't wearing that irritating smile or scoffing with derision or even emanating his air of superiority. Ironic, then, that in that moment, Becca found him more infuriating than ever. Discovery With every twisting vine that Cal and the gang climbed, a little extra daylight was the reward, gradually banishing the darkest shadows and bringing more color back into their lives. The lazy buzz of insects and even the occasional twittering of a bird was beginning to fill the air, life not governed by slime once again making itself known. 
As if the fates didn't want to appear overly kindly, however, the improvement in light and life brought with it an ever greater intensity to the dips, enough that the whole group, including their alien companion, had to pause and grab hold of something whenever the worst of them hit. The gang had kept their usual formation, Cal and Kyra up front, Eddie and Toko twenty paces behind, and the two corporals herding Cassius twenty more paces behind them. The vine they were scaling ascended in a wide, gentle arc, and would have made for an easy climb were it not for the mass of fungi sprouting from its craggy, mossy surface. Even the smallest of the fungi rose above their heads, leaving them to wind their way through a forest of vivid blue and orange stems. The obstructed view made Cal uneasy, not least because it made it harder to keep track of their alien friend, who continued to lead the way some distance ahead. Kaya didn't seem particularly at ease either, and the thoughtful frown on her face suggested she was unsure whether to voice her troubles. Something on your mind, Cal asked, once they'd squeezed between the narrow stems of a tight cluster of fungi. Besides the fact we're following a weird blue alien on the very strangest of planets, and that our old friends the Insidians may well be lurking nearby, he thought grimly. I'm a big boy, Cal assured her, not all that easily upset. Kaya's frown didn't ease at his lightness of tone. I've been thinking on our little drama with the alien, or more specifically trying to work out why you risked yourself to save Cassius. Cal winced, that particular subject being the one he was least keen to discuss but in truth he'd been asking himself the same question. He briefly considered spouting some excuse along the lines of prisoners having rights and how the man was their responsibility, but he didn't want to lie to her, not about this, not about anything. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. My head feels a little mixed up as far as our pirate prisoner's concerned. Kaya nodded, looking relieved by the answer, perhaps even gladdened by the honesty of it. The dreams... Maybe. Cal was about to elaborate when yet another dip kicked in, big enough to force them to stop and grab hold of the nearest stem for balance. Another gravity dip, Toka called out pointlessly. Cal almost smiled at Kaya's continued reaction whenever anyone referred to the anomalies as gravity dips. If they reached the point when civilization wasn't under the dire threat of annihilation, he suspected she might just return here to solve the mystery and earn it a proper analysis but for now Toka's assessment was going to have to do. Dreams can meddle with minds, Kai said, dragging herself closer to Cal so she could be heard over the creaking of the shifting vines, and they're pretty far from reliable facts. Trouble is, they're starting to feel a lot less like dreams and more like memories, Cal replied. Obscure memories, I'll admit, but I think there's truth lurking in there, stuff buried since childhood. Once the vines started to slow, Kai looked back toward Cassius. Even if these dreams and memories are true, even if you were the very best of friends, it's a long time past. You're not a child anymore, Cal, and neither is he. He's a killer, a brutal enough killer that he doesn't deserve you risking yourself for him. We don't deserve you risking yourself. Cal conceded with a nod, easing his grip as the vines settled back to its barely perceptible sway. He was about to reply when something stopped him a slow, subtle realization taking hold. Now that the creaking and rustling had quieted, a distant buzzing could be heard. Such a sound wasn't unusual, considering the local wildlife, but it seemed more constant and intense. You hear that, he said, peering ahead through the forest of fungi. He couldn't see much and had even lost sight of their alien friend. I hear it, Kai said, her frown returning. A quick glance back confirmed that the rest of the gang were aware of it too. Cal nodded back to them, and weapons raised, they silently continued toward the sound. They didn't have far to go before the forest of fungi thinned out and the alien came back into view. Again it was stood still, and this time it was obvious why. The gradual incline had come to an abrupt end as the vine's path met with another, even larger vine, and they became a warped, twisted mess, as if two immense battling serpents had been turned to wood. On the edge of a dramatic dip, the alien was staring down into a series of huge fissures where the vines had fought for dominance probably over many long years. As Cal had suspected, the noise was nothing more than a mass of insects, enough buzzing about the fissures to turn the air thick. Reacting to a few sharp clicks from the alien, the silver sphere swooped down into the fissure until the insects swamped it. 
Then it released a single pulse of bright white light that dispersed the swarm like a startled flock of tiny birds. Cal muttered a curse, and he wasn't alone. Now the air was clear, great piles of tiny white bones and skulls could be seen, and in the areas between were dead cats, multiple wounds, and dark purple blood staining their thick red and green striped fur. It was the same large beasts they'd encountered during their descent. Cal estimated there to be at least forty of them, most fully grown, but some smaller and presumably juvenile. What the hell? Toka's whispered words were easily heard now the insects had been banished. Kaya put one foot onto a gnarled, mossy knot in order to lean further over the edge. Looks like this is their nest. Was their nest? Eddie corrected, her voice tight and her rifle pressed hard against her shoulder. What the hell did this? Toka asked. Could it have been insidious? With the disruption of our pulse weapons, it's perhaps too much of a coincidence to be anything else, Kai said. Cal grimaced as he continued to survey the nest. And if not them, then I hate to think what else could have done it. I don't see any signs of gunfire. A slash and smash fight would remain consistent with insidious drones. The sphere hovered slowly about the scene, its shimmering surface emitting a soft amber glow. After a few moments, the glow blinked out, and seeming to take that as a cue, the alien descended into the fissure. I get the feeling our little hovering companions given the all clear, Toka said, looking around at the others. Well, as long as the shiny ball says it's okay, Cassius said, once again discovering that mocking tone that had always seemed his default setting. Why go down there? Eddie said, the first signs of panic seeping into her voice. Let's just pick another vine and keep moving. Never thought she'd be the smartest among you, Cassius said, but with such a low bar. Ignoring the pirate, Cal surveyed the vines that looped far above them. Despite the alien's apparent eagerness to get a closer look at the grisly scene, Eddie had a point. There were risks in going down there. Unfortunately, the vine they were traversing was the quickest route, and without the alien's matter-bending skills, diverting from it would mean a good deal of messing about with zip lines and spider cuffs. I think it's best we stick to the fastest route, Cal said, and it wouldn't hurt to get a closer look at what we're dealing with. Stepping up onto the edge of the dip, he gave Eddie an encouraging nod. Scant comfort, perhaps, but as always she gave him a determined nod back. Keep fingers on triggers and eyes on our surroundings. Whoever or whatever did this may still be close. Definitely their nest, Cal thought, as they negotiated their way between the huge piles of tiny, pick-clean bones. He'd wondered after their first encounter with the cats how such large predators could sustain themselves on a planet mostly filled with tiny wildlife but the mass of bones suggested they compensated with the sheer quantity they caught and consumed. As they crept further into the scene, Cal kept a close eye on the alien, trying to get an impression of what it was thinking. But as it crawled around the dead cats, dipping its long neck to examine wounds, its flat face gave nothing away, certainly as far as emotions were concerned. Now he was better able to study the cats, Cal could see their legs were proportionately a good deal longer than the big cats of Earth, most likely to make them more efficient climbers of the vines. He could also see that the fight hadn't been an easy one for either side. There was blood everywhere, seeping into the clumps of moss and pooling in the rough, cracked wood. But it wasn't just the purple ichor of the cats, not by a long shot, a range of different blood colors were visible and all wet enough to suggest it had been shed recently. Remind you of anything? Kaya said as she peered down at the myriad of different blood splattered across a pile of bones. The pirate queen's ice, Cal said, thinking back to the aftermath of that battle. Kaya nodded. Insidian drones, numerous different species by the looks of things. So where are they then? Eddie spat as she stared down at the gaping maw of one of the dead cats, its purple tongue lolling and huge white fangs glinting in the light. I mean, where are the bodies? A fight like this, there ain't no way all the insidians survived. Stay calm, Ed, Toka said, looking at her with growing concern. Take some deep breaths, good and slow. You freaking breathe slow, she snapped, tearing her eyes from the dead cat to glare at him. Ain't nothing wrong with my breathing. Eddie was indeed breathing fast, but Cal suspected Toka was only focusing on her panic to smother his own fears. I doubt the Insidians ever leave their dead behind, he said, prodding at some sticky yellow pool with the tip of his rifle. They're not keen on leaving signs of weakness or defeat.
More clicking from the alien drew their attention as the sphere hovered low to sweep a beam of light over some of the blood. Analyzing it, Caius said as the alien appeared to confer with the sphere. Well, I've already analyzed it, Toka said, both his brow and nose creased up. And I can tell you it stinks. Stinks of death. We need to get the hell out of here and back to the star splinter. Stop pointing out the freaking obvious, Eddie spat. There was sweat beating on the girl's forehead, and Cal recognized that familiar anger growing, ready to do battle with her panic. The beasts might have been dead, but their teeth and claws were a harsh reminder of her past encounters, the horrors of her experiences and injuries. We need to move faster, is what I mean, Toka clarified. He turned and jumped over one of the dead cats to look back at them imploringly. Hold up, Toka, Cal said, raising a hand toward his young friend. Faster doesn't necessarily mean safer, he added, hoping to emphasize the caution part of their quick caution motto. He looked back toward the alien and the sphere to see they were still studying the scene. Whatever had happened here, the alien sure as hell knew more than they did, and delaying a little longer to gather more information might ultimately help them all, especially with the alien dictating their route. Again, Cal swept his eyes over the looping vines above before glancing back toward Cassius. Too many damn things to keep an eye on, he thought grimly. The pirate was shaking his head in clear disapproval. The details of the disapproval, Cal didn't have the time or inclination to think about, but at least the man was staying silent, and that malice remained absent from his face. Seeming to agree with Toka, Eddie had skirted around the dead cat to join him, the rise and fall of her chest suggesting she half expected the beast to come back to life and take a swipe at her. Encouraged that at least one of them was following, Toka took a few more hurried strides from the deathly scene, bashing away some trailing foliage and climbing toward the edge of another huge fissure in the twisted vine. Toka, wait, Cal repeated, a touch more forcefully this time. His scanner had begun beeping again. Bugs? Kyra asked. I don't think so. Cal brought his wrist up, trying to make sense of the readout, the increasing tempo suggesting something was coming at them fast. It's just a flock of birds again, Toka said, frustrated. He took another couple of steps closer to the edge of the fissure and looked around expectantly. It's not birds, Cal said more urgently and dropped his wrist in favor of raising his rifle. Toka, get away from... But it wasn't meant to be. There was no roar, no grinding of claws against the woody vine. In fact, the giant cat barely made any sound at all, just burst up out of the fissure as if shot by some silent cannon a few feet from where Toka stood. Then a lot happened in a very short amount of time. Cal angled his rifle, but he couldn't get a clear shot. Toka spun in fright, fumbling his own weapon as he did so. Kaya screamed at Toka to duck as their alien companion leapt toward the new threat, its speed a dazzling blue blur. Eddie also launched herself toward the threat, and being far closer, reached it just as the beast clamped its savage jaws around Toka's fumbled rifle and ripped it from his hands with a sharp twist of its great head. Lunging to his right, Cal tried to get a safe shot. Before he could manage it, however, Eddie had bashed Toka aside and, with impressive momentum, crashed into the beast as it reared up on its hind legs. Both the cat and Eddie disappeared over the edge of the fissure, and two seconds later, the blue alien had gone over after them. Bloody Christ, Toka grunted as he scrambled to retrieve his rifle. Cal and Kai ran to the edge and thrust their weapons over it. Eddie was on her back at the bottom of the fissure maybe thirty feet below them, but she was barely visible beneath a mass of green and red fur as the huge cat hunched over her. Cal took careful aim, but quickly realized the beast was stuck fast, portions of the vine molded around its great shaggy form. The blue alien was crouched nearby, long hands pressed against the splintered wood beneath. Bloody Christ, Toka repeated. Is she okay? I think so, Kai said. After a quick glance back to check on Tawny and Bright's guarding of Cassius, Cal fired his spider cuff into the ridge at his feet and leapt over the edge to descend into the fissure, Kaya and Toka following close behind. Alive and as well as can be expected, Cal thought, relief flooding through him as he got his first decent look at Eddie. She was still on her back, with the giant cat hunched over her. The creature was close to immobilized by the vine, but Eddie also had her cybernetic arm stretched out, her hand buried in the thick fur of the cat's throat. The beast's jaws were wide open, thick drool dripping off the tips of its long fangs to splatter on Eddie's panicked face and heaving chest. Bloody Christ, Toka said for the third time as he snapped his weapon up to get a shot. 
Cal stopped him with a raised arm. All fired, Toka. She's safe. No need to cover her in gore. Eddie might have been safe, but her panic could reach new heights. Cal was about to move in and pull her away from the slavering beast when the blue alien beat him to it. Instead of trying to move her, however, it simply laid a hand upon her forehead and its other on top of the cat's massive shaggy head. In an instant, Eddie's heaving chest slowed, and an expression appeared on her face that could only be described as serene. The cat also changed, its rumbling growls silenced, the bunched-up muscles of its face dropping to conceal long fangs beneath soft fur and fine whiskers. The alien remained in that position for some moments, head bowed as if in concentration. Then it removed both hands and stepped away, regarding the girl and beast with a slight tilt to its head. Almost like an artist reviewing their work, Cal mused, as he moved in and grasped Eddie beneath the arms to pull her out, wary eyes on the cat the entire time. You okay, Ed? Toka whispered, as if the volume of his voice might somehow affect her answer. Yeah, the girl said once Cal had hauled her upright. Yeah, she repeated, blinking as she looked about her. Are you guys okay? She had a wooziness about her, as if she had just woken up from a long, satisfying sleep. Toka nodded. Thanks to you, he said, eyes flicking to the cat. Can't believe you tackled that frickin' monster for me. That was a crazy move, especially with... Your panic, I mean. Eddie blinked at him for a moment. Don't sweat it, she said eventually, her voice about as soft as Cal had ever heard it. Was no big deal. Toka let out an abrupt, choking sort of laugh. Kinda was, though, he said, looking trapped between extreme gratitude and an overwhelming urge to inform her she had a screw loose. A big enough deal that it could have swallowed your head without needing to chew. Eddie shrugged. He's not so bad, she said, turning to the huge cat, which now appeared just about as mellow as she did. Despite the beast still being encased in the vines, Cal's hand twitched on his rifle as Eddie boldly walked over to it. What the fuck are you doing, Ed? Toka blurted. He was about to say more when the sight of Eddie casually reaching out to stroke the beast's head turned his words into a weird sort of squeak. Careful, Eddie, Cal warned. Despite the cat's body being stuck fast, its head was free enough to take the girl's one remaining arm with a snap of its jaws. But there wasn't even a hint of aggression. Quite the opposite, in fact. The cat even leaned into her hand as she continued to ruffle its fur, a deep guttural rumble sounding that Cal could only assume was some sort of purr. I think you've made a new friend, Kai said, disbelief clear in her voice. Cal couldn't quite believe what he was seeing either. Whatever their alien companion had done, it once again seemed more like magic, or at least a ridiculously advanced form of neurological programming. One more mysterious surprise from the ever-increasing list. He's just a big softy, Eddie said, working her hands down the side of the beast's head until she was scratching under its massive chin. Softy, Toka said, a look of horror on his face. It almost killed me. It almost killed you. We're past that now, Eddie said, leaning in close enough that she was practically nuzzling the big shaggy head with her own. Be careful, Eddie, Cal warned again, but he put little effort behind his words. The cat was enjoying the attention, its natural instinct somehow altered, making it as docile as such a creature could get. And whatever manipulation had occurred in Eddie's brain had apparently done what months of virtual reality therapy failed at, reversing her deep-set phobia in a matter of moments. Have we all gone frickin' mad here? Toka said, having backed up as far as he could get before the steep wall of the fissure stopped him. Ed, please just step away from that bloody thing, you'll give me a damn heart attack. Just chill, Blondie. Chill? You still got slobber on your face from where it was planning on eating you. Toka looked at Cal and Kyra in turn, an edge of accusation that they were doing a piss-poor job of backing him up. I think our new companions worked some magic, Cal said with another shrug, unsure of what else there was to say. Spells? We're trusting in spells now, are we? Toka glared at Kaya, but she just gave him a little shake of her head and frowned at the cat. Her world was being upended a little more with each new surprise, but she was too tired to extract any more reasoning. And we're sure this magic's lasting, are we? Toka continued, glancing suspiciously at the blue alien. Got a written guarantee coming our way, have we? 
Cal shrugged again, his new standard response to not having a good answer, or much like Kaya having run out of the mental energy to dig into the hows and whys. He was about to argue that at least the beast remained secured within the warped vine when the alien planted a hand down to melt said vine away. Whoa, whoa, Toka shouted, pressing himself even harder against the wall and once again snapping up his rifle. Cal didn't blame him, and his own reaction wasn't too much different. But rather than springing up to tear them all to shreds, the cat just sat there, continuing to enjoy the attention from Eddie, its startling violet eyes glinting bright as they caught the light streaming down from above. Incredibly, it almost looked cute. Cal stepped toward Toker and laid a pacifying hand on the tip of his rifle. Let's not make a mess unnecessarily, he said, nodding to the edge of the fissure above. There's been enough killing up there. Toko reluctantly lowered his weapon, a frown upon his face with the potential to become a permanent affliction. There were some moments of silence as they all watched the cat tip back its head and give a wide yawn. Then it shook itself, not unlike a dog coming out of the water, and almost knocked Eddie over as it rubbed against her, setting the girl into a fit of giggles. Seeing the pair together was a strange and shocking sight. And now the beast was free of its bonds, it was apparent just how huge it was, a great deal larger than any of the big cats Cal had seen on Earth or Mars, its long, muscular legs making it closer to the stature of a horse. Tearing his eyes from the beast, Cal looked back up to the fissure to see if he could spot Bright or Tawny. Not seeing either of them triggered a twinge of concern, but after a quick scan of their surroundings, he saw them further along the edge, herding Cassius down a less steep bank. Everything okay, sir? Corporal Bright called out as the three of them came near, but not too near. There was confusion on their faces as they stared toward Eddie and her new feline friend. Even Cassius was struggling to hide his surprise. We're fine, Corporal, Cal said, trying to convince himself more than anything. The threat's been... He stared at Eddie as she scratched at the giant cat's nose with her cybernetic fingers. Neutralized. Get your ass over here, Blondie. Eddie called out to Toka, pausing in her play with her new friend in order to wave a beckoning hand to him. She was no longer sounding sleepy or euphoric. In fact, she now seemed much like her older self, impossibly normal, all considering. Come feel how thick his fur is. You're mad, Toka replied, completely frickin' bonkers, even madder than before. Eddie only laughed at him. He won't bite you, she assured with a wide grin. Well, he might if I encouraged him, but I promise I won't. Toka's frown was now coupled with a constant shake of his head. That alien screwed your brain. Cal looked toward the alien in question, who was conversing with the sphere that had returned to hover by its side. As if sensing his stare, which it possibly had, the alien turned to him, something in its stance giving the impression it was keen for them to continue. Okay, let's get moving, Cal called out, finding himself in total agreement with their blue friend. Toka, stick close together, no more darting on ahead. Don't worry about that, Toka muttered, peeling himself away from the rough wood at his back. My time at the front of the pack's over with, middle of the pack for me, as long as you promise we'll move fast and leave that big furry bastard far in our tracks. Ha, nice try, Blondie, Eddie said quickly. What do you mean, nice try? She looked at him as if he must be joking. Shaggy's definitely coming with us. She reached up to ruffle the fur around the big cat's muscular neck. His family are all dead and I ain't leaving him alone, so he's part of our crew now. Toker opened his mouth, but no sound came out. He turned to Cal, a begging sort of quality to his horrified expression. Cal winced. If the cat followed them and he was getting the uneasy feeling it would, what could he realistically do to prevent it? He certainly wasn't going to shoot it, not least because of the horrid slaughter that had already taken place in the nest above. For all he knew, this animal may be the last of its kind. Perhaps thinking along the same lines, the alien had made efforts not to kill it either. Just one more welcome clue that separated their new companion from the bloodthirsty insidians. With not the time nor energy to do much else, Cal offered Toka an apologetic smile, followed by yet another shrug. Then he hefted his rifle and set off, leaving his young friend to close his mouth all on his own. Sweet Jar How much longer? Becker asked, resisting the urge to lean over Franco's shoulder to stare at his hand, which was pressed against the control panel of yet another freight elevator. Not long, even less if you stop asking me. Point taken. 
Stepping back, Becca looked at the tapestry of shiny metal above them. Whoever had designed Chalice's soaring towers had turned them into quite the vertical maze. Thin towers twisting about thick towers, hexagonal towers sprouting cylindrical towers, a complex structural knot, to be sure, but all ultimately stretching toward the apex of the dome like some grand collection of metallic flora boldly competing for sunlight, or presently moonlight. Undoubtedly it was an architectural triumph to those who knew about such things, but to Becker and her newfound gang it was nothing but a navigational horror show. This elevator's trickier than the last, Franco admitted after some moments, his voice sounding strained as he glanced back at her. The moon had shifted lower in the sky, but still offered enough illumination to highlight the sweat on Franco's brow and lines of frustration, that same expression she'd seen during his struggle hacking the cells. Perhaps the higher we go, the more intense the security, Feng suggested. He nodded toward Anton, who was leaning against the railings, idly gazing at the city below. The young man was right when he said the rich are paranoid. Being one of them, I should know. Could be that, Becker agreed. But she wasn't convinced that was the full story. Whatever had to go on inside Franco's head to manipulate the implant in his hand, which she reminded herself was only a prototype stolen from its testing phase, was taking its toll, certainly physically and possibly mentally. He'd used the implant often in the past, but nowhere near this number of times in such close succession. Is there another option? Donnie asked as he stared at the elevator. Having helped Donna up a flight of stairs, he was taking the opportunity to sit down and regain his strength. Perhaps we should try to force it open. The question pulled Anton from his thoughts, and he turned toward Donnie with a frown. Becca didn't believe the frown for a second. In fact, she got the impression that Anton, little prick that he was, reveled in the questions raised by the group, especially Donnie's. It gave him the chance to indulge in mockery and ridicule, something Becca suspected were his very favorite things. His fake frown deepening, Anton shook his head at the big man. Seriously, Stompfoot, what exactly are you proposing, perhaps using your chunky lady as a battering ram? He glanced at Donna, who was lying by Donnie's side, and waited for a response, almost daring a response. When one didn't come, he continued. I hate to burst your bubble and release all that dumb air, but afraid to say I don't think your masterful plan would work. A while back, Donna had lost her wide, friendly smile and had settled for a much smaller one. But each time Anton spoke, even the small smile dropped away. Oh, he just thought it was worth suggesting, Tony said in his ridiculously mild-mannered way, seeing as we're struggling and all. Anton brought his hand to his chin, which was already noticeably smoother after his dabbing of the regen stick, and feigned consideration. And what was your occupation again? Oh, he worked demolition, Donny replied, or at least oh, he did, till the gambling, and then the fighting. Anton nodded. Ah, yes, demolition, that makes sense, trained in the art of bashing things, a blunt mind for blunt actions. How's about you leave the fella alone? Jim said, a glint in the old man's milky eyes that hinted at the spirit that had put him in the fight cages. Yes, maybe we should all just try to get along, Clara suggested, looking imploringly toward Anton. But the young man was too busy pressing another of the little narcotic tabs to his wrist. Becker almost moved to stop him, but in the end didn't bother. The drugs seemed to amp up his supreme arsehole tendencies, but at least it kept him alert. Franco muttered a curse. Personally, I feel everything will go better if you all just shut the hell up. I'll get this bloody thing open, but I need time and some fucking peace. We have faith in you, stubble guy, Anton said, a drug-fueled shiver running through him. You and your magic hand. You're a bona fide modern-day wizard, a true hero of... Someone's coming, Clara said, enough alarm in her voice to give Anton a rare pause. The woman took a limping step closer to the railing. Down there, someone's coming up that nearest tower. Becca turned to peer over the edge. Sure enough, an exterior freight elevator was ascending one of the adjacent towers. Ever since they'd been scaling the workman routes, they'd seen no other people or activity, to the point it had been quite eerie. During the daylight hours, the external elevators, walkways, and ladders would undoubtedly be teeming with workers full of busy intent, but at this hour, it felt more like scaling the outer shell of a ghost city. It's him! Anton said, a disturbing level of excitement in his voice as he leaned over the railing. Who can you know? Donny asked. Anton stared intently at the ascending elevator. 
There's at least ten people in there. Activity at this time of night's unlikely enough, but a freight elevator with ten people stuffed into it? Beyond unlikely. It's him. And all those little lights aren't harmless glowbugs, Feng said. Swark sticks, Shep said. Yep, Anton agreed, for once too distracted to mock the blonde man's hampered speech. A few zappers too, probably. He pulled out yet another narcotic tab to press against his wrist. Stop drugging yourself, Becker snapped. I'll not be hauling your ass if you overdo it. There's also that glint of silver, Anton said, ignoring Becker's warning and almost toppling over the railing in his eagerness to study the rising elevator. Jareth goes nowhere without his ridiculous metal beast. Ridiculous wasn't a word Becker would have used to describe the slaughter bot. Remorseless was far more fitting. With a quiet curse, she looked back to their own freight elevator, the doors of which were still entirely closed. Franco? All she got in reply was a brief glance over his shoulder and a string of muttered Italian profanities. But should we be worried yet? Clara asked. I mean, they're on a different tower. Doesn't that give us time? She's right, Fang said, turning about to study the layout above. The tower they're ascending reaches its peak soon and there's no link above us. They'll have to go back down again to join our tower. Becca backed away from the railing. And that's only if they know we're here. I suggest we all get out of sight. Agreed, Fang said as he held Donny half Donner up. Together with Clara, the four of them retreated the way they'd come, disappearing from view through an archway. Nor moving far, Shep and Jim opted to hunker down in the deep recess of a huge support strut. Franco! Becca said as she moved to join Shep and Jim. Hold up, I've almost got it. They'll see you, Becca hissed. We're out of time. I'm telling you, I've almost got it. And you'll get it again, Becca reasoned, once they've got past. Anton, you too. Anton. Anton! As if he hadn't heard her, Anton remained at the railing, still leaning over it, eyes fixed on the rising threat. Christ! Becca lunged forward and grabbed hold of the young man, but he resisted her pull, gripping the railing like a troublesome toddler not wanting to leave the park. She was on the verge of knocking him out and dragging him when he shouted out at the top of his lungs. Wrong tower, fuckers! Son of a... Becca almost kicked the little prick over the railing in anger, but the damage was done. Several torchlights beamed across at them from the rising freight elevator. Well, that's that, Becca thought, as she shoved Anton back into his precious railing. Backing up again, she shared a look with Franco. Best get back to work. It took Franco a moment to tear his furious eyes from Anton's back, but eventually he nodded and went back to his control panel. You two stay out of sight, Becker said to Shep and Jim, who remained huddled in the recess of the support strut. The two men nodded a silent acknowledgement. Soon, the rising freight elevator reached their level and came to a stop. Anton was right about the occupants. Jareth looked like a rebellious child surrounded by his beefy, heavily armed goons. And there was that damn slaughter bot, its silver frame bent over in the cramped space. The tower was close enough that trained soldiers using military-grade zippers could have scaled the gap, but Becker was certain Jareth's entourage neither had the skill nor the equipment. Anton still didn't move from the railing. Careful! Becker warned, despite him not deserving it in the least. If you're close enough to shout at him, he's definitely close enough to shoot at you. Not willing to risk herself, Becker backed up close to Franco and crouched down. Anton spared them a brief backward glance. Don't worry, vehicles aren't the only things banned up here. Any shooting will attract unwanted attention from peacekeeper agents. Jareth won't risk it. And besides, he probably wouldn't shoot you anyway, and he definitely wouldn't shoot me. What makes you think that? Anton didn't answer. Instead, he leaned back over the railing and shouted again at the top of his lungs. That you, my sweet jar? Becca frowned, even more than she already had been. Sweet jar? She knew Anton had a thing for nicknames, but she didn't think it would extend to the psychotic killer chasing them down. There they are! Jareth shouted back, a sort of screech to his voice that spoke of barely controlled rage. There they fucking are! All my new favorite devils in one little group! Becca knew they'd already seen her, but stayed low nonetheless. Even from this distance, she could detect the boiling rage within Jareth's slender frame, desperate to erupt. Adding to the effect, his snake tattoo was all motion, jagged and aggressive across his pale skin, as if desperate to break free and exact its revenge. My favorite fuckers, Jareth repeated. The two soon-to-be-carved-up shits who killed my sister. Killed my fucking sister. I'm going to hurt you, Anton. I'm going to hurt you real bad. 
just like Anton, Jareth was leaning forward, straining against the bars of his freight lift as if he had a chance of bending physical space to grab their throats across the void. I'm back there, the asshole who released all my fighters, you security-hacking son of a fucker. I'll be the one hacking soon. Lots of blades for the job. Why will he probably not shoot us? Becca hissed at Anton. She knew he wasn't one for whole truths, but more than a hint would be preferable. Anton looked back at her as if surprised and somewhat annoyed at the interruption. Torture, he said simply before turning back to Jareth. It's a shame for you, sweet jar, Anton shouted across the gap, that we're all the way over here. He let go of the railing and looked skyward, turning about on the spot with his arms thrown up. And soon we'll be all the way up there, so you'll just have to find someone else to hunt and hurt. Not that Beckon needed it, but Anton's words seemed more evidence that his brain was skewed. It hadn't been long since he'd been speaking of zero chance of escape, and now he seemed adamant they were already away scot-free. Anton stepped back to the railing and clutched it tight. Or might I recommend self-flagellation, he bellowed. I think it would suit your temperament. And why will he definitely not shoot you, Becker asked, trying to cut through the wild young man's shouting match. This time Anton didn't bother answering, just kept beaming that inappropriate grin across the gap, waiting for a reply from the murderous Jareth, quite as if they were exchanging the most light-hearted of banter. I should have shredded you when I had the chance, Anton. Should have, would have, could have, Anton replied, almost childlike in his excitement. Too late now, my good man. You played the hunt too long, allowed me to slip away once too often. Now the prey's out of reach and soon to be gone, lost in the stars forevermore with my new friends. That's a hell of a stretch, Becca thought. She glanced again at Franco, glad to see his hands back on the control panel. He was doing his best to ignore the drama playing out behind him, but it couldn't have been easy. Maybe he shouldn't be shouting at him. Shep suggested quietly from his hiding place, taking advantage of a rare moment of silence. Yeah, fucking right, Jim growled a little less quietly. Taunting him ain't gonna help us. Agreed, Shep agreed. Becca agreed too, but she also knew that unless she wanted to risk getting shot, there was nothing she could do about it. She positioned herself to get a better look at Jareth's face. From this distance, it was difficult to get a read on his expression, but the bastard was still stalling, she had no doubt. Now he knew their position, he'd have men closing in, lightly coming up from below. My only regret, Anton cried out, is that your crazy starburst of a sister didn't get to witness my victory. To see me sailing away, oh how that bitch would have... There was a shriek from Jareth, and Becker caught a flash of silver as he pulled one of his relic guns from the holster on his hip, which until this point she'd not been convinced wasn't just decorative. A bullet ricocheted off the metal wall behind them with a loud twang, encouraging Becker to crouch lower. More bullets followed, some hitting the heavy door of the freight elevator, causing Franco to fall back on his arse and lose his position. Hurling abuse at no one in particular, Franco stayed down but awkwardly stretched his arm up, just managing to place his hand back on the control panel. Some bullets hit the railing just inches from Anton's hands, but he didn't even flinch, and instead started whooping. Against her better judgment, Becca lunged forward and yanked him back to safety, turning one of his whoops into a squawk, then into an oof as he landed heavily on top of her. Eventually, the shooting ceased. Are you mad? Becca growled into Anton's ear as she held him tight. Maybe, Anton admitted. He was breathing hard but still grinning. Life's too short to be sane though, right? It'll be real fucking short if you carry on like that. Becca shoved him off onto the hard walkway. For all of us. Rolling onto his back, Anton giggled and pulled out another of his little narcotic tabs. Becca slapped it from his hand before he could activate it against his skin. I see you indulging again. I'll knock you out and leave you here for your sweet fucking jar. She stared at him with hard eyes. Got that? By some miracle, Anton appeared dumbstruck. Yeah, I understand. He took a few deep breaths as if trying to master his runaway brain. You damn well better. Staying low, Becca shifted until she was sitting against the strut next to Jim and Shep. You two good? Both men nodded. Franco? I'm good, he assured her, still with his arm stretched up, hand on the control panel. Becca looked back at Anton. I thought you said he wouldn't risk shooting. Honestly, I had pulse blasts in mind, the young man admitted. Rubbing his eyes, he made a few exaggerated blinks, as if trying to rid himself of a troublesome hallucination. Maybe those old-fashioned bullet thingies are harder for peacemaker agents to detect. 
Or maybe you pushed him past giving a shit, Becca suggested. Does your drug-addled brain remember telling me that sometimes you push people too far? Anton just stared at her and blinked again. Well, this is one of those times, Becca elaborated. I also told you I find it hard to stop. Anton looked as if he was trying to prevent his grin from returning. Whatever was in those tabs, he'd definitely overdone it. Add it to that, poor Jars cursed with a short fuse. Neither of us can help ourselves. He gave Becca a wink. Then his attention snapped past her. I wouldn't touch that if I were you, Rattlebones. Becca turned to see that Jim was reaching out from his hiding spot, his bony hand hovering just inches from one of the silver bullets, now almost flat from its impact with the wall. Jim clenched his fist but didn't retract it. Why the feck not? My sweet jar infuses all his precious silver stings with poison. Jim blinked. Hey? Anton gave in to his drug-addled grin. Go ahead and touch it if your ape brain compels you, but you'll suffer a long and painful demise. My jar doesn't like his enemies to die too quickly or easily. Rolling further from Becca's reach, Anton lurched to his feet, and, with a burst of triumphant laughter, headed eagerly back for the railing. What the feck's wrong with his head? Jim asked. With gritted teeth, Becca shook her own head and climbed back into a crouch. Quite a bit, I suspect, but let's just assume he's right about those bullets. More shots came, a long volley of poisonous metal striking immovable metal, and again, quite as if he were some immortal god, Anton totally ignored them and waited until they ceased. Silence. Shifting forward again, Becca saw Jareth was discussing something with one of his goons, suggesting his rage hadn't entirely consumed him. Anton turned from the railing to look back at Becca, his unhinged grin wider than ever. What are you scared of? I already told you there's no chance he'll actually shoot us. He wouldn't want to risk death before he gets in his torture. Earlier you said he probably wouldn't shoot us, so you'll forgive me if I don't take your word for it, Becca said, remaining as low as she could. Me neither, Jim said, having rejoined Shep in pressing himself deep into the recess of the support strut. And what if he's a shit shot? Shep pointed out. Oh, he's the very best of shots, Anton said confidently. A rare talent in that arena. Believe me when I say that every bullet lands precisely where he intends. I still ain't risking it, Jim said. Anton considered the older man for a moment. Actually, Rattlebones, that's probably a good idea. When I say us, I mean me and these two. He nodded at Becker and Franco. The rest of you are just worthless fodder, not part of the game. He'd fill you with poisonous holes without a second thought. Jim scowled. Possibly Shep did too, but Becker couldn't be sure with his beaten face. Three more shots rang out. Anton laughed. You're wasting your precious bullets, my sweet jar. Will you fucking quit it? Becker hissed. He might stop shooting if you quiet the hell down, and your declaration that our escape is as good as done is utter crap. We still have distance to cover. Relax, Anton said, sounding annoyed she was sabotaging his fun. I told you right now he's just letting off steam, and our shouting match is only stalling their chase. So, why don't you just chill out and enjoy the moment? Did it not cross your mind that he might be the one trying to delay us? Unconcerned for Becca's logic, Anton sprang back to his railing. Come on, Jar, is that really any way to treat your ex? How's about we give it another go, eh? Ex? Christ? Becca shook her head despairingly. Why don't we see if we can make our love blossom again, eh? Anton continued, like it did in the good times. Here's a suggestion. You head on back to the club and I'll come and meet you there in a few hours. Keep on pushing, Anton, Jareth screamed back. See what fucking happens. Anton sucked in a breath to reply, but Becca interrupted him. Your ex? Anton turned. Why so surprised? I was quite the catch. Spent two hours every day in a radiance chamber. I could command lust with the briefest glance. With a flick of his hand, he pulled out another narcotic tab. Unwilling to risk a bullet or any more wasted warnings, Becca stayed where she was, her fists bunched. Anything else you're not telling us? Anything that might be useful to know? Anton pressed the tab to his wrist and shrugged. I've got quite a lot of exes. Strangely, every one of them seems to hold a grudge. I'm shocked. Any of them chasing us with murderous intent? Not to my knowledge. Then it's not useful information. Anton laughed as if that were the funniest thing ever put into words. Then turning back to the railing, he stretched his neck to look toward the very apex of the city's force dome and shouted yet again. 
Oh, you know how I love to push my luck, my dark, beautiful jar. Where would be the drama if I didn't? What a dull, drab existence that would be. It's just a shame your bendy little candy cane sister isn't around to witness it. He continued to gaze up at the night sky, as if approving gods were smiling back down at him. She'll be cursing you from her hellish grave now you've let me slip free. Such a tragedy that her rainbow had to be extinguished. That bright smile of hers lost to oblivion. Oh, how I loved the way she used to... Becca had been on the verge of rolling forward to sweep Anton's legs out from under him when another shot made him fall silent. Then, very slowly, Anton turned around. His face was screwed up tight, constricted with surprise and confusion. Then it went slack with shock. Staring down, he shifted his trembling hands to his gut. There was a patch of glistening red there, rapidly expanding across his shirt. He pressed his hands tight against it. He did it. Anton's voice was suddenly very small. Looking at Becca with wide eyes, he stumbled back a few steps. He did it, he repeated, swaying slightly. Can't believe he actually... Anton lost his words as he stumbled again. Then, like a drunkard given a little shove, he keeled sideways. Becca lunged forward, but Anton was already hitting the railing, and like some floppy autonomous doll, he cartwheeled helplessly over the edge. Miracles and Mysteries Becca didn't believe in miracles, but once in a while something happened that seemed pretty damn close. This was one of those moments. Having thrown herself across the deck toward the railing, her thrust-out hand closed about a fistful of material. Anton's falling weight had yanked and twisted her shoulder to the point it had threatened to pull her over the edge, but wrapping her other arm around the railing had prevented it, saving the pair of them from a very, very long journey through a whole lot of empty air. At least for now. Anton didn't struggle. In fact, his complete lack of movement suggested he was unconscious, which was fortunate considering their predicament. It was far from heavy, and Becca knew she was stronger than average, but she wasn't superwoman. With a strained groan, she tried to pull him back onto the deck, but she didn't come close, not with one arm and at such an awkward angle. Continuing to challenge Anton's theory of not wanting to kill them, Jareth was shooting like a madman, but some luck having joined the near miracle, Anton had tumbled over the side railings that weren't in the direct line of fire. He's gone! Just drop the little stronzo! Drop him! Even through the din, Becca could hear Franco's shouts, but she wouldn't do it, not if she could help it. Get that damn elevator open, she shouted back. After moments that seemed like hours, the din of ricocheting bullets finally ceased, and other than the residual ringing in Becca's ears, all was silent. Franco soon broke the silence as he dragged himself across the platform toward her. Christ, Sarge, you really want to get shot for this little bastard, he said, staying as low as possible despite the absence of gunfire. Crawling over her like some sort of stalking cat, he grasped the railing and leaned over the edge to grab a handful of Anton's shirt. Anton's head and limbs flopped as the pair of them hauled him up and pulled him onto the deck. He remained unconscious, but his shirt and much of his pants were blood-soaked. He's good as dead, Franco said after a moment of holding his fingers to the man's neck. We're wasting time. Becca ignored him, and with her hands pressed tight against Anton's gut wound, she twisted about to assess their situation. Jareth's elevator had begun to descend, no doubt carrying him to the nearest link bridge to renew his chase. Fortunately, their own elevator was now ready to go, Franco having succeeded in his task. Jim and Shep were already crouched by its open doors, but instead of looking relieved, the two men were pointing frantically toward the opposite end of the walkway. And it was obvious why. They had company. A band of Jareth's thugs, judging by the muffled shouts emanating from the archway where others had sought cover. Shit! Becca clenched her jaw tight as if that might somehow slow her spinning mind. We gotta go, Franco said, glancing toward the elevator. The others are screwed. We can't leave them. Franco muttered a curse. He looked pale from his efforts hacking the elevator, hands shaking and skin slick with sweat. We're unarmed. We don't stand a chance. We can't leave them, Becca repeated more forcefully. You can't save them all, Bex, not without killing the rest. Franco's expression was part angry but mostly imploring as he nodded toward Jim and Shep. As if you're thinking about their safety, she thought bitterly. Franco grasped her shoulder. I'm just being realistic. And there it was, his favorite fucking line. Becca shook her head, looking again at the archway. 
Something wasn't right. If they were so outnumbered and outarmed, why weren't Jareth's goons already bursting onto the platform to deal with the rest of them? Feng told me where his ships are, Franco continued, and I can crack the... We're not leaving them, Becca hissed. Grasping Anton's shirt, she dragged him over to Jim and Shep. Get him into the elevator, she told them, leaving the young man at their feet. Keep pressure on the wound and be ready for us. Neither man looked happy about it, but they nodded their understanding. As she headed for the doorway, Becca was relieved to hear Franco following in her wake. The shouting had already stopped, and as she neared, she caught sight of a pair of sprawled legs on the deck. The blood-stained bandage on the thick thigh told her it was Donna. As always, Donnie was by the injured woman's side, his big frame protectively curled over her, quite as if the building was crumbling. Realizing Becca's presence, they both looked up, thankfully appearing unharmed. What happened? Becca whispered, crouching by their side. Don't know, Donnie said. Someone or something attacked. He nodded toward another archway about ten feet from them. The others went through there to take cover. There was a whole lot of noise and then nothing. Okay, we'll check it out. You two get to the elevator and wait. Donnie nodded, and Donna just smiled, as silent as ever. Frustrated she had nothing to swing or throw, let alone shoot, Becca wedged her way toward the second archway. Franco was still close behind her as she peered around its edge. Clara was sitting on the floor, curled up near a doorway. She also appeared unhurt, although judging by her expression, some mental scarring had occurred. Becca nodded to the woman and raised a finger to her lips as she continued toward the door and cautiously peered into the room. There were bodies, at least fifteen of what looked like Jareth's goons, all sprawled and unmoving on the floor. Whether they were dead or unconscious, Becca couldn't be sure, but some were definitely badly beaten. Moving into the room, both she and Franco quietly picked idle shock sticks off the floor. They'd be signatured, but would at least make decent clubs. One figure stood out from the rest, not least because it had started to move. It was Feng. He had rolled over to awkwardly shift his weight onto his knees. With a groan, he pressed a hand against the side of his head where a harsh bruise had already formed. Becca moved toward him. You okay? Still holding his head, Feng stiffly nodded. What the hell happened? She asked him. I got knocked out. And before that? Franco asked. Fang looked about at the bodies, perplexed. I heard them coming. I tried to barricade the door, but they smashed it open. He looked about as if trying to piece it together. The door must have bashed me on the head, knocked me out before I saw a thing. Bullshit, Franco spat. Tell us the truth, Fang. Who the hell are you? Fang stared at him, unsure how to answer, or at least wanting to appear that way. Confessions will have to wait, Becca said. We need to move. Fang nodded and began negotiating his way around the flawed goons. He looked unsteady on his feet and perturbed by Franco's intense stare as he moved past him to exit the room. What the fuck's going on, Sarge? Franco said as they hurriedly collected a few more shock sticks. Becca shook her head. I don't know, she admitted as she rolled the goon over to retrieve a zapper he was lying on. Try to get this unlocked, she said, handing Franco the little weapon. A couple of shock sticks too if you can. Franco took the zapper but kept his eyes on her face. Feng's not right. He's hiding something. Possibly. Becca worked her jaw and had one last look about the room. But right now we don't have time to play investigators or interrogators, so whatever he might be hiding and whatever the hell happened here, let's just see it as a blessing and get to the damn ships. Despite looking unsatisfied by her reply, Franco gave a curt nod and made for the exit. And hope the blessing stretches to the ships actually existing, Becca thought grimly as she followed after him, leaving the mystery in their wake. Cosmic Mushing Cal glanced at his readouts, once again confirming that their alien companion was leading them on a direct path to the Star Splinter, way too direct to be a coincidence. It must know the location, its strange talents or technology somehow besting their ghosting net. What the hell would happen when they reached the ship? Cal had no clue. Was it planning on boarding with them, hitching a ride? Yet another question that only time could answer. The alien had at least slowed its brutal pace, an increasingly cautious edge to its movements, slow enough for Cal and the gang to recoup some of their strength and keep a closer eye on their surroundings. 
They'd not yet reached the planet's surface, if it could be labeled as such a thing, but they climbed high enough for more narrow shafts of sunlight to stream through gaps in the wild tapestry overhead, bright enough to do justice to the increasing array of giant flowers as vibrant as any seen in a child's picture book. As if celebrating the Eden they lived in, more birds flitted among the foliage, cutting through the shafts of light in jubilant aerobatic displays. Even the majority of the bugs that tottered along the thick, colorful moss and rugged bark had a joyous sort of quality to their waddling. Most welcome of all, though, was the loss of the stifling humidity and the return of that fresh, fruity air that helped revive fatigued lungs and aching muscles. The change in their surroundings wasn't all good news, though. Their visors helped compensate for the occasional shafts of glaring sunlight, but the increase in wildlife was again playing havoc with Cal's scanner, not to mention his own senses. A constant buzzing, flapping, and twittering that was far from ideal when there was so much potential threat to be listening out for. At least the giant cat hadn't caused them any trouble. As Eddie had predicted, and Cal had suspected, and Toka had feared, the beast had followed them on their continued journey, staying close to Eddie the whole way. Despite his declaration that he'd stick to the middle of the pack, Toka had understandably kept his distance from the new addition by opting to stay up front near Cal and Kaya. Even the corporals at the back of the group had kept a little extra distance, and Cassius wasn't objecting to the caution. Cal just hoped that whatever attitude change the blue alien had bestowed upon the creature remained lasting and true. Looking back, Cal saw the cat had finally deviated from Eddie's side to investigate some potential prey on a neighboring vine. Taking advantage of the opportunity, he dropped back to walk alongside his young friend. How are you feeling, Eddie? he asked, keeping a careful eye on their surroundings as he spoke. Good, thanks. Head okay? he asked, eager to find out if there were any weird side effects going on in there. Yep, head's good too, she said, shooting him a smile to reinforce her words. Cal knew her well enough, however, to notice some cracks. Something in her dark eyes not quite matching the smile, just a touch, but something. Seems you've struck up quite the friendship with the cat. Cal glanced to his left in time to see the beast making a wickedly fast lunge at a small flock of flapping birds. Shaggy, Eddie said. Yes, Shaggy. Great, isn't he? He's certainly impressive, Cal admitted with a slow, thoughtful nod. Almost as impressive as your confidence around him. You're not feeling any... Nope, the girl interrupted, almost as if she was forever done with the words panic or fear. Not any at all. Nope, she repeated, but there was a growing furrow to her brow. So that's good, right? Cal ventured, not yet certain it was. A miraculous change. Yeah, miraculous. She sounded convinced, but the furrow remained. You sure? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely, definitely. She screwed up her face for a moment and scratched at her nose. It's just... Well, I wish I'd earned it. Like, got there on my own without Blue's weird mind-mushing. And there it was, the source of the confliction, and one Cal felt he should have predicted. Oh, you earned it, Eddie, he said earnestly, without a hint of hesitation. Never doubt that. How'd you figure? Cal held back on his answer as the pair of them negotiated a large patch of moss, thick and spongy enough to make balance a tricky thing. As far as I remember, the cat was ready to tear Toka to shreds, Cal said once they'd reached decent footing, and you bolted straight toward it, not a second's hesitation in pushing Toka aside and tackling it head on. Some of the most lethal-looking claws and teeth I've ever seen, and I've seen more than my fair share. If that's not mastering your panic and earning its banishment... I don't know what is. You reckon? I reckon. A smile spread across the girl's face that pushed a lump into Cal's throat. After everything she'd been through, getting a result like this was more than he could have hoped for, even if it did require a measure of intervention from a strange blue alien. Having fallen behind enough to put them in danger of suffering Cassius's tedious mocking, the pair spent a moment regaining their position. So how did it feel? Cal asked. When our alien friend... Blue, Eddie interrupted him. We're calling him Blue now. Okay. When Blue intervened. The mind mushing? Yes, that. It kind of felt like all my nasty feelings were gathered up and spun around in my head till they became sort of tight-packed. Then they span so fast they just blinked out. 
Eddie paused as she negotiated a few deep creases in the vine, zigzagging across them with agile leaps. Then came this nice, mellow sort of feeling in its place, she continued once Cal had caught up. And after that wore off, I just felt normal, normal like I used to be. Cal wasn't sure Eddie could ever have been labelled normal, not in the time he'd known her, but that certainly wasn't a bad thing. And when you look at the cat... Shaggy. Yes, Shaggy. When you look at him now, you don't experience any fear whatsoever. Nope. Cal frowned at that, not convinced it was helpful to have something as vital as fear completely removed. Don't worry, Cal, Eddie said, reading his expression. It's not turned me stupid. I can still recognize danger. Any other beasties come at me, I won't go trying to hug them. But Shaggy's different. His brain's been mushed by Blue too, in a big way. All his rage and grief at losing his family's been soothed, his trust redirected. We're his family now. Blue somehow created a bond between us, I reckon, something unbreakable and everlasting, something kind of cosmic-like. Cal raised his brow, wondering at the certainty she was putting into her words, the confidence she had in what the alien had done to both her and the cat. He shrugged. Who was he to doubt her? She was the one who'd experienced it, after all. Cosmic. Yeah, cosmic, Eddie said with a grin. Cal was about to reciprocate when another dip hit them, this one sudden and severe enough that the whole gang, including their alien friend, went airborne. Twisting his body, Cal thrust out his arm and fired his spider cuff, its point thudding into the vine. Pulling himself in, he clutched the rugged bark with both hands as the vine continued to drop at an alarming rate. Fortunately, the others had reacted similarly, and Corporal Tawney had even managed to grab hold of Cassius's leg, hauling him to relative safety as a spider cuff did the rest. Crouched down, they all clung on tight, waiting for the movement to subside. Cal didn't see how the alien had reunited itself with the vine without the benefit of a spider cuff, but a glance back confirmed it was already clinging on with all four of its long limbs. Bloody hell, Toka said once the vine had slowed enough for him to relax his white-knuckle grip on a thick patch of moss. I forgot how intense the dips are this high up. They were never that intense, Cal said, loosening his own grip and glancing over at the giant cat. The beast was licking its forepaws and looking decidedly unfazed, which suggested nothing out of the ordinary had occurred. That was definitely stronger than any of the others we've experienced, Kyra agreed. I think it's clear why most of the wildlife on this planet has evolved with wings, or long sharp claws like our feline friend. He's called Shaggy, Eddie muttered, annoyed that no one was adhering to the name. Do you think there's some sort of ebb and flow to the strength of the dips? Cal asked. Kyra got to her feet. It seems that way. Ebb and flow? Toka said, looking doubtful. I really don't think that's how gravity works, Doc. Kai's exasperated reply was cut off by the sound of Corporal Tawney throwing up again, shortly followed by Cassius laughing. I'm intrigued where all this vomit is coming from, the pirate said as Tawney wiped her mouth. Considering she'd possibly saved his life during that last dip, his gratitude was woefully absent. Am I the only one puzzled? He looked around the group. I've only seen her eat two meal bars the whole outing. You want me to see if Shaggy will bite his face off, Corporal? Eddie said, a disturbing sincerity to her voice as she turned toward Tawny. Perhaps even more disturbing was the sight of the cat padding closer to Eddie, almost as if it had some understanding of what she'd said. Tawny shook her head, her sickly pale face a touch perturbed as she looked at Eddie, then at the cat. Cal was a little perturbed too, but found his attention snatched away by movement in his peripheral vision. By the time he turned, however, the cause had already disappeared from view behind some of the neighboring vines. Did anyone else see that? See what? Kai said, turning to look in the same direction as him. Something falling from above. Cal peered through his rifle sights at the vines below. Something? Toka asked. I can't be certain, but I got the distinct impression it was a figure. A large figure. That well and truly got everyone's attention. Shaken from the surface during that dip, perhaps, Kai suggested. What kind of figure? Toka persisted, an anxious edge to his voice highlighting what they were all thinking. There's another, Eddie shouted, snapping her rifle heavenward. The rest of them did likewise. Before anyone could even consider shooting, however, the falling figure had crashed face first into their vine, just a dozen paces from where they stood. There was a round of cursing as they all jumped back a step. The figure didn't move, just lay face down, deathly still, dark green blood leaking across the vine. 
It was man-shaped, but bigger, with short grey fur covering its rippling muscles. And there, clear to see on the back of its neck, was an insidian parasite. Fast Learner Despite all the green blood trickling across the vine, the insidian drone started to shift and even managed to rise a little before Cal leapt forward and put three shots into the large slug-like parasite on its neck. His rifle silencer ensured the shots were no louder than hail hitting wet mud, but with the threat of more drones lurking above, the noise sounded dangerously potent. The parasite now a pulpy mess, they all stared down at the figure a body long dead and hijacked by the Insidians from God only knew what corner of space. Even with it lying face down, Cal was certain he recognized this alien breed from the battle on the Pirate Queen's ice, and if he was right, turning it over would reveal just one eye in the center of its face, like a cyclops of myth. Where the hell's Blue got to? Eddie's question was enough to draw the attention away from the drone. Sure enough, the alien was nowhere in sight. Stepping onto a raised part of the vine, Cal scanned the area but still saw no sign. The silver sphere had gone too. You think the dip shook him off? Toker asked, taking a half dozen cautious steps to peer further over the edge of the vine. Eddie scoffed. What in our time with Blue makes you think he fell? Course he didn't bloody fall, dipshit. He got spooked then, Toker said, spooked by that big-ass insidian drone crashing into our vine. Cal very much doubted it. The alien wasn't the type to get spooked. If it had disappeared, it had done so on purpose. He did a slow turnabout, taking in their surroundings. Maybe it's scouting the way ahead, Kai suggested. Cal looked again at his scanner, and what he saw made him grimace. More figures showing up? Kai asked. No, nothing's showing up. Absolutely nothing, not even us. It's malfunctioned. That or it's being disrupted. Let's get moving, Harper, Cassius said, his expression hard. Shut your face, pirate, Eddie snapped. You don't get no say. Your blue friend's doing the dirty on us, Cassius continued, his eyes still fixed on Cal. We're bait. Hey, fucker, Eddie spat. What part of shut your face don't you get? Everyone quiet, Cal said, tilting his head as he listened to their surroundings. There was the usual hum of insects and bird whistles, as well as a piercing hoot from God only knew what kind of creature. Then something else. A crack. Distant, but clear. Then another. Cal snapped his rifle upward, unsure exactly from where the sound had originated. With quiet steps, he shifted himself so a shaft of sunlight was less disruptive, aware that the rest of the gang followed his gaze. Another crack. He caught sight of it. A glimpse of movement high above. A dark limb, very dark. Fingers on triggers, he said, sorely wishing they had something to take cover behind or at least put their backs to. He glanced at Tawny and Bright. The pair of them had taken a few precautionary steps away from Cassius and were prioritizing their surroundings. He was glad to see it, certain that the pirate was about to become the least of their concerns. I saw something, Toko whispered. Shit, definitely too big to be a bird. Okay, stay cool, Cal said, a big ask he knew, but it needed saying. Nobody shoot until... Any further advice was snatched from Cal's throat as he dropped downward, his vision suddenly obscured. His immediate thought was that another dip had occurred, but that notion died as he realized he was inexplicably inside the vine, actually inside the vine. And he wasn't alone. The rest of the gang were with him, even Eddie's big cat, all now standing within a wide space, as if someone had precisely carved a large oval within the vine's interior. The blue alien was there with them, head bowed in concentration and both hands pressed to the smooth wood, that familiar bioluminescence rippling out from the contact to bathe them in soft light. What the hell's going on? Toka whispered. Cal could tell by his young friend's expression, however, that he knew full well what was happening. They all did. The alien had already demonstrated enough of his matter-bending talents for the pieces of the puzzle to come together. He was hiding them, avoiding a fight they might easily lose. He'd even sunken the dead drone into the bubble with them, concealing that pulp parasite that might have highlighted their presence. Sure enough, a loud thump soon reverberated through the wood that encased them. It was followed by a bunch more, the sound of drones leaping onto the vine from above, Cal guessed. Then heavy footfalls, multiple figures passing directly over them, loud enough to suggest there was no more than half a meter of wood separating them from their oblivious foe. 
They all stood in silence, hardly daring to breathe as they listened to the continued sounds. As they waited, Cal realized the silver sphere wasn't with them. Was it still out there somewhere, perhaps monitoring the progress of the enemy? Whatever the case, he was glad the alien had again proved whose side it was on. As the last of the footfalls faded, Cal noticed the alien bow its head further, body tensing as if focusing that bit deeper. There was a slight flare in the bioluminescence, then all became silent. Perhaps wanting to be sure they were in the clear, the alien retained the hiding place a little while longer. Then came the odd sensation of ascending, and seconds later they were back outside, the vines solid beneath their feet. Weird, to be sure, even the dead drone was laid out as it had been. His rifle still tight in his grip, Cal turned about, eyes searching for any sign of insidian drones. But the only movement was the local wildlife, happily continuing with their lives as they flapped, crawled, and buzzed about. Well, that was an experience, Toka said, breaking the silence but keeping his voice low. Perhaps in agreement, Eddie's big cat let out a low, guttural sort of noise before indulging in a full-bodied stretch, demonstrating more uncanny resemblance to the cats of Earth. Nice of Blue to hide us like that, Eddie said, shooting a pointed look at Cassius. A very friendly and helpful sort of thing to do, I reckon. It certainly seems like we share a common enemy, Caius said, her attention on the alien as it moved with purpose back down the vine. And it looks as though it's taken a captive. This caught everyone's attention, and only once the blue alien had crouched down next to the immobilized drone was it plain to see. Nothing but the orange and black mottled skin of the drone's head and shoulders were visible. The rest was sunk within the vine. Its face appeared frozen in time, an unmoving snarl upon its alien features. What's up with its face? Toka whispered. The sphere, Kai said, pointing to their left as the sphere emerged from behind some foliage. There was a subtle beam of light emanating from it that was directed at the trapped drone's head. I think it's paralyzed it, or stunned it somehow. Reckon you're right, Toka said, observing as the sphere slipped through the air to join the alien who was studying the parasite on the drone's thick neck. Cal leaned closer to Kaya. Is it me, or does our alien friend look a little muted, he said, noting that the alien's vibrant blue flesh had turned paler. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's maybe even a touch smaller in stature, too. I was thinking the same thing, Kai replied, regarding the alien thoughtfully. Perhaps the effect of overexertion during the matter bending. My thoughts exactly. Cal felt unnerved that, despite their hushed words, the alien could well be aware of their discussion. If it was offended, however, it didn't make it known, all its focus still on the insidian drone. Having maneuvered close to the drone's neck, the silver sphere was detaching the parasite using its strange light-based tech. The drone's head flopped forward as the stretched tendrils were dissected and the parasite disappeared inside the sphere. For further study, Kai suggested, leaning closer to Cal. Or a trophy, he muttered in reply. A sudden loud crunch made both of them start and snap around to the source. Shaggy was tucking into the Cyclops' drone, the huge jaws making short work of the dead alien's left leg. Toka backed up with a wince. Bloody damn, that's frickin' disgusting. No more disgusting than you chomping on a hot dog, Eddie said defensively. Standing next to the cat, the girl nudged the dead drone's big left fist with the toe of her boot, completely relaxed as she stared down at the fearsome claws. She wore a subtle smile that suggested her neutralized fear extended to monstrous drones, too. Cal was glad to see it, and it was more than she deserved. Okay, everyone, check your ammo, Cal said, checking his own as he did so. I'm willing to bet we'll need every round to get back to the Star Splinter. Cassius let out a short, sharp laugh. A fuckload of luck is what you'll need, but if you're committed to increasing our chances, it's time you took these bonds off me. Fat chance of that! Eddie spat. Cassius didn't so much as glance at her, instead keeping his eyes locked on Cal. Face it, I'm the least of your worries. For all we know, there's an army of these bastards between us and your ship. He indicated bright and tawny. You really want your two square jaws having to herd me along or rescue me whenever a dip occurs? I want to get back to your ship in one piece just as much as the rest of you, so let me help instead of slowing us all down. I'll happily take points so you can keep tabs.
Cal glanced at Kaya, hoping her expression would sway him toward telling the pirate to shove his reasoning. But she looked as conflicted as him. Even Eddie had fallen quiet. It's not like I'm asking for a weapon, just free hands to keep pace and aid in the fight. Come on, Harper, he said, his frustration clear as he shook his bound wrists behind his back. Either let me improve our chances, or just kick me off the vine now. Eddie perked up at that, but despite all her threats, Cal suspected even she wouldn't kill the man in cold blood. Okay, we've wasted enough time, Cal said as he approached the pirate. Bright, aim your rifle at his head if you would. The corporal didn't hesitate, raising his weapon and holding it in a way that suggested he was half expecting to pull the trigger. You sure about this, Cal? Toker asked. No, Cal admitted as he moved behind Cassius and pressed his thumb against the bonds while issuing a voice command. But we're short on time and choices. Confirming Cal's thumbprint and voice, the bonds clicked and whirred open. Cassius nodded at him, his hard expression relaxing a touch as he rolled his shoulders. Glad to see you're capable of seeing sense. But his brow creased again as Cal firmly pulled his arms in front of him and reactivated the bonds. That's as good as you're gonna get, Cal said, nodding down at the pirate's hands. Enough for a talented man like you to put up a bit of a fight and grab hold of the vine when necessary. Eddie snorted a laugh, looking pleased with the compromise. Cassius sucked on his teeth. You're a difficult man to like, Harper. Cal shrugged, and yet I'm willing to bet I have far more friends than you. He looked to Bright and Tawny. Okay, corporals, I'll keep an eye on him from here. I want all your attention on our surroundings. Done with his work on the Insidian drone, the alien was making its way back over to the group. For a moment, Cal wondered if there'd be an objection to the change in Cassius's restraints. But the alien didn't so much as glance at the pirate, perhaps in complete agreement that there were far greater concerns. Now it was closer, Cal could see the alien had indeed lost some of its stature. Not much, but enough for him to be certain of the fact. Also, his blue flesh really was less vibrant. Not as infallible as he first seemed, Cal mused. Hoping to convey his thoughts on their best course of action, Cal pointed upward and tried to conjure a mental image of the planet's uppermost vines. He felt a bit of a fool doing it, but perhaps mind-reading was their best form of communication, possibly their only form. Hard as it was to admit, Cassius had been right. For all they knew, an entire army of Insidian drones might be between them and the Star Splinter, and they were still some distance from the ship. Heading directly to the surface might give them a clearer idea of what they were facing, as well as eliminating their chances of being attacked from above. The alien stared at him for a moment, large black eyes completely still. Then it moved its smooth head up and down. Was that a nod? An agreement? Cal caught Kaya's surprise in the corner of his eye. What were the chances a nodding gesture was used by an alien species so far removed from a human, and that it had the same meaning? Pretty damn low, he imagined. Perhaps their strange new companion was learning their ways, learning to communicate. Hopefully a fast learner, Cal thought as he nodded back. The alien's mouth appeared on its smooth face, and he issued a short burst of clicks. Cal was taken aback. Definitely a fast learner. The sound was far from a human voice, but for the first time there was something recognizable in it. A single word. Surface. Part 4 Truths Anton looked like a corpse, and if it wasn't for the occasional twitch of his body and the very slight rise and fall of his chest, he could easily have been mistaken for one. As the freight elevator continued its long ascent, Becker and Clara did their best to bandage his gut wound and stem the bleeding, but it was a world away from the treatment he needed. You said something about poison, Clara asked, her fingers on Anton's clammy, deathly pale neck. Exhausted, Becker nodded and shifted back to collapse against the elevator wall. Jareth has his bullets infused with something. Clara's expression was grim as she removed her fingers. Looks like he's gonna die. Donny said quietly. Slumped in the elevator's corner, he had a protective arm around Donna, who was staring at Anton with a rare look of worry. We need to get him to a hospital, Shep suggested. Feck no, Jim said. Too risky, we ain't got no time. Franco nodded. Agreed, there's no time. Becker looked at Franco. Positioned beneath the elevator's control panel, he too was sitting on the floor. 
As exhausted as she felt, he looked worse, his eyes dark and sweat still coating his skin. We're almost at the Havens, Becca said. She looked again at Anton. We'll get him the best treatment there, right, Feng? Feng remained silent, a look of guilt invading his somber expression. Right, Feng? Becca repeated, feeling a pang of anxiety. I... Ah, uh, I might not have been entirely honest with you. Franco let out a pained laugh. No fucking shit. Come on then, Feng, out with it. What's the big secret? What are you, special forces? Feng shook his head. You're barking up the wrong tree, my friend. Not even the same forest. What the feck you on about? Jim spat. Yes, how's about you tell us what the feck you're on about? Franco agreed, glaring at Feng like he wanted to spring up and shake some truth from him, if only his exhausted body would allow. Feng sighed, but looked around at the group resolutely. I was telling the truth about being a businessman. The only throat cutting I've ever done is the metaphorical kind. I'm quite a lethal bastard in the boardroom. The truths I've omitted have been about the havens. I'm afraid it's nothing but a ghost district. His brows knitted tightly as if the declaration physically pained him. It's all but abandoned, possibly completely by now. I'd been one of the last remaining, one of the stubborn few who refused to leave. And that was a month ago, before I came to retrieve my son. I lied to help close our deal, and for that I can only apologize. He gave them all an awkward smile brimming with guilt. Force of habit, I'm afraid. Becca silently cursed, unable to find it in herself to do it aloud. Who is he abandoned? Donny asked, eliciting a nod from Donna that highlighted the importance of the question. The rich don't like to risk ill health, or indeed their lives, Feng stated. The radiation in the city's been steadily getting worse over the months. The leaks are right down in the deep pole, but they're having an effect in the mid-levels and will eventually have an effect up high. Feng's brow creased deeper still, a touch of anger there. Helping to pay for repairs wasn't deemed cost-effective by the Haven's governing body, a group that, I'm ashamed to say, I'd been a part of. Some of us tried to overturn the decision, but were sorely outnumbered. And so, the authorities and residents started to leave. Everyone in the Havens has access to a ship, and nearly everyone has second homes. Lawyers, doctors, even most teachers and nurses, and those who don't are employed by people who do. Everyone's gone. Feng stared at Anton's ghostly face for a moment. So I'm afraid there'll be no hospital treatment for the young man, nor for any of us who need it, and there'll be no authorities or peacekeeper agents to protect us either. God damn it, Franco spat. And your ships, you better fucking tell me that wasn't bullshit. Fang shook his head. The ships are real, docked and waiting for us. Franco still looked angry but relaxed at that. This doesn't change the fact we need to get Anton medical attention, Becker said, looking to Fang. The hospital's in the havens, surely they're top of the range, equipped with AI docks and medbots. Feng shook his head sadly. Not anymore. Now they're just empty shells. Just because folks are rich, they're not wasteful, often quite the opposite. Anything of value will have been taken off world, hospital equipment and meds included. Becker shook her head, not accepting they were out of options. What about your ships? What facilities do you have on them? All the trauma basics, but no medbots. He looked at Anton's blood-soaked clothes and makeshift bandage. We could do a better job patching him up, medicate the pain away, but we won't have the antidotes or the expertise to deal with an unknown poison. Becca gritted her teeth and thumped her head back against the elevator wall. So we have to double back, take the risk and get him to a hospital in the upper mids. She looked at Franco, knowing he'd be the hardest to convince. But the corporal looked like he'd barely heard her. Just stared grimly at Anton, lost in distant thought. No one else answered either. We've got to try, Becca persisted, but the conviction had drained from her voice. Maybe it would even throw Jareth off our scent. The argument was weak, and if anything would only anger the rest of the group. So why was she pushing for it? To save a young man who'd almost got them all killed in the first place? Or was her chaka sickness beginning to skew her thoughts, making her more sensitive to death as the threat of her own grew inside her? Franco looked over at her, but there was no anger there, only a deep sadness. You gotta let the kid go, Bex, 
If the blood loss doesn't finish him, the poison will. We don't know that. Franco frowned imploringly. You really think that a gun-wielding psycho would use a mild poison, one that can be easily remedied, if at all? He glanced at Anton. The kid's gone. Best we can do is to get him to Feng's ships, try to make him as comfortable as possible. Becker wanted to argue the point, wanted to shout at Franco that he was just being his usual self-centered self, but an unfamiliar sorrow on the corporal's face stopped her. He's right, Feng said. It's possible doctors might save him, but if we go back down, we'll face corrupt authorities as well as Jareth and his goons. The chances of us getting captured again or even dying will be high, very high. Them cousins he spoke of too, Jim added. The rest of them nodded their agreement. The freight elevator jolted to a stop, having reached its top level. They were nearly there, almost at the havens, Fang's forsaken mecca. Becca looked around at all the eyes on her, and eventually conceded with a slow exhale and a nod of her own. With an effort, she pushed herself up and moved over to Anton, gently slipping her hands under his limp body. Both Feng and Clara moved to help her, and together they lifted him. Looking relieved as he struggled to his feet, Franco stepped through the open elevator doors and looked back at them. So this is it, he said, determination battling the fatigue in his voice. Last effort to get to the havens. Best make it count. Widowmakers A familiar, repetitive beep pulled Jumper from his work, encouraging him to set his tools down and look up at the large hollow projector at the far end of the Star Splinter's loading bay. Here comes another, Victor said, a little extra panic in his voice since the last time he'd said it. Jumper stared at the projection, which was replicating the view from the Star Splinter's flight window. He wanted to say something encouraging to his young friend, but the sight of yet another insidian cube ship dropping smoothly through the wispy, colour-filled clouds had a way of sapping anything even remotely confidence-building. Already five other cube ships were positioned around that strange vertical crash site. They hadn't landed in the traditional sense, more just stopped in midair with a steadiness that seemed to defy physics. It was hard to judge via the hollow projection, but Jumper estimated the cubes were at least ten times the size of the star splinter, big enough for insidian drones to pour out and spread across the vines, nightmarish creatures collected from God only knew how far and wide, their lethal bodies bent to the will of their insidian masters. Many of the drones were climbing downward, but many more remained on the surface, some trekking far enough across the vines to come worryingly close to the star splinter. Six ships... Victor said, his face pale as he continued to track the progress of the newest arrival. It could be a good sign, Jumper said, scraping the very bottom of the optimism barrel. The ma that arrives suggests they're having trouble finding what they're looking for. It didn't even come close to convincing himself, let alone Victor. Victor sniffed, tapping a tool nervously against his thigh as he watched the cube ship come to a smooth stop. It also suggests that what they're looking for is extremely valuable, the boy said. Or dangerous. Not sure if that's good or bad. We'll find out sooner or later, Jumper said, feeling pretty convinced it was bad, but not willing to voice it. We just need to be ready when the time comes. The arrival of the first cube ship had been a tense moment, to say the least. Since their run-in with the Insidians on board Admiral Decker's starship, the ghosting net's effectiveness had been in question. So far, however, the Star Splinter had remained undetected, giving Jumper confidence that the Insidians only had the ability to prevent its activation. As long as they were already ghosted before being spotted, it seemed they still retained that one technological advantage. Even so, they weren't taking any risks. Victor had set the Star Splinter to low power mode, ensuring as small an energy signature as possible, and they'd not risked any communication. That had been a hard choice, whether to warn the others at the risk of highlighting the Star Splinter's position. In the end, though, they decided to stay silent, reasoning that if their ship was identified, they were almost definitely screwed. Why do you suppose they don't scan? Victor asked after a moment. Scan? These insidians, with their advanced tech, surely they can scan for what they're looking for instead of sending out all these search parties? Feeling he was getting a pretty good handle on the nature of these invaders, Jumper was quick to answer. For the same reason they rarely use advanced weaponry, 
They're not search parties so much as hunting parties. I suspect they love the hunt just as much as the fight. Technology only dilutes the game. The boy gave a bewildered shake of his head, struggling with the concept of barbaric fighting prioritizing the eloquence of advanced tech. Jumper watched grimly as that inevitable gap opened up in the newest Insidian cube, a wide walkway projecting out to meet a large vine. He recognized a good deal of the alien species that emerged, many of which had been in the sights of his bliss rifle, and others far closer than that. Worst of all, though, Jumper had already spotted several giant crabs crawling along the vines and a few creatures equally dangerous-looking. From this distance, they appeared deceptively small, but he still had memories of facing the beasts up close, and they weren't memories he'd soon forget. Kneeling down, Jumper got back to work. He'd barely reactivated his pinch welder, however, when Victor spoke up again. You think the gang is okay, Jumper? he asked, his voice suddenly very young-sounding. You think they're still alive? Jumper tried to hide his grimace. Until this point, the pair of them had avoided voicing that particular question out loud, despite it being the loudest within their minds. A number of times, Jumper had been tempted to ditch their caution and reopen communications, but his instincts had stopped him each time, and Victor seemed in agreement. I've no doubt they're still alive, Jumper replied, trying not to hesitate. I've also no doubt they're busily worrying about us. As he talked, he continued with his work in the hope it would convey an air of relaxed confidence. No better survivors than Carl, Eddie, and Toka. Kai is as smart as they come, and those two corporals seem pretty damn competent. No doubt they'll have some stories to tell, but I guarantee they'll pop up any time now. God, let me be right, he thought as he gave an assured nod. The smart glass scans will alert us the moment they appear on the surface. Yeah, reckon you're right, Victor said, his voice still sounding painfully young in Jumper's old ears. We've gotten pretty good at beating the odds, eh? Damn right. Jumper managed to grin, and placing his welder down, thumped a celebratory fist on the metal carapace he'd been working on. This one's done, he said, sealed up, loaded to the max, and ready to kick some ass. Standing, Jumper took a few steps back and admired the metallic beast. It was basically a large cybernetic spider, each of its multi-jointed legs around five feet in length, and its body comprised almost entirely of weaponry. Victor had crafted something similar to aid in the rescue on C-9, but after weeks cocooned down in the bowels of the star splinter surrounded with pirate tech, the boy had made some substantial upgrades. Not only that, but he'd built more than one. Nice, Victor said, running a critical eye over Jumper's work and not finding fault. That's it, then. A few adjustments to the one I'm working on and they're all ready. The Widowmaker's 2.0. This is quite an achievement, Victor, Jumper said, taking a few more steps back and surveying all twelve of the machines. Quite the menacing lineup. In this statement, Jumper did feel confident. None of the pirate weaponry was pulse-based and therefore should be immune to the Insidian's disabling field, and they'd already had a taster of the destructive power. Victor chewed on his lip, still tapping his tool against his thigh. You think they'll wreak a suitable amount of havoc, Jay? Yeah, kid. I really do. Deal with it. So, when I suggested we were screwed, Toka said as they all ran their eyes over the topmost looping vines that made up the planet's unconventional surface, I'm feeling this might be an irrefutable confirmation of the fact. Irrefutable confirmation, Eddie said. What the fuck you on about with your posh frickin' words? Why can't you just say we're definitely screwed or I told you we were screwed? She shook her head. Fucking irrefutable confirmation. Toka sighed. Yet more irrefutable confirmation that you're a little asshole. Having seen enough, Cal settled down lower behind a gnarled ridge of vine, the rest of the gang doing likewise alongside him. They had left a little extra space around Eddie, whose giant feline companion was hunched low next to her. Whatever words were used, Toka pretty much had the right of it. There were insidian drones everywhere, a deadly range of alien species walking, crawling, and leaping over the uppermost vines like insects over honey-glazed ropes. The vast majority were concentrated around the distant crash site, but smaller groups had spread further afield. There were insidian ships, too, six of the bloody things, their cubed hulls reflecting the colorful skies and vibrant landscape. As bad as Cal feared it might be, 
This was worse. They were much smaller than the cube they'd faced on board Lawrence's starship Prime, but even so, there was no question they were here for Blue. But was he truly valuable or dangerous enough to warrant six ships? It wasn't all bad news, though. Their visors were calibrated to detect the star splinter even when it was ghosted, and it remained nestled upon one of the highest arching vines. It wasn't too distant, and the fact that no insidians were in its immediate vicinity suggested the ghosting net was still effective. That brought relief that no insidian horde could temper. For now, Jumper and Victor were safe, and thus remained the hope they'd all somehow escape this mess. Admittedly, it wasn't the most robust of hopes, but it was still a touch better than utter doom. Cal glanced at their alien friend, trying to gauge its reaction to the scene. But as always, its relatively featureless face was hard to read, if not impossible. Like the rest of them, it was crouched low, carefully observing the distant Insidian ships. One of the ships was breaking up into smaller cubes that were gliding down into the crash hole, no doubt to investigate or maybe even retrieve what lay at the bottom. So, we gonna make a run for it or what? Eddie asked, her attention on the star splinter. Cal grimaced. That same question had been bouncing around in his head the moment they'd laid eyes on the scene. Even though no insidian hunting parties were near the star splinter, there were still some moving across the vines between their current position and the ship. Not only that, but the nature of the landscape meant others might be out of sight on lower vines. Perhaps we should wait for them to come to us, Toka suggested. Jumper and Victor, I mean. Surely they've spotted us and will come pick us up. And there was the opposing question dominating Cal's thoughts. Thanks to his visor, he could tell the star splinter was in low power mode. Jumper and Victor were lessening the chances of being detected, undoubtedly the same reason they'd avoided communication. Could be risky, Kaya said, reflecting Cal's thoughts. The ghosting nets kept them concealed so far, but starting the engines at such close quarters might give the game away. Agreed. Cal said. Our chances of escape are better if the star splinter remains hidden until we're all on board. So we make a run for it, Eddie reiterated. Shaggy agrees with me, and I reckon Blue's up for a run too. She nodded toward the alien. Shaggy and Blue, Toka said. Seriously, that's what you're sticking with? That's what we're calling them, so deal with it. Toka shook his head and turned back to Cal and Kaya. I personally think we should go nice and steady, like, stay low, try to get to the star splinter unseen. Low and slow will get us snuck up on, Eddie argued. We be- What if it's a trap? Cassius interrupted, his expression serious as he continued to survey the scene. Without a visor, he wouldn't have known the star splinter's exact location, but Cal suspected he'd already judged it by their line of sight. Did you consider that? The pirate looked toward Cal. What if your ship's already overrun and these insidians are making all seem well to lure us in? Trust you to think of that, you sneaky fucker, Eddie muttered. Someone's got to do the thinking around here, Cassius countered, his voice still serious. I very much doubt the ship's been infiltrated, Cal said. Oh, you very much doubt it, Cassius shrugged. Well, I guess we can all relax. Hiding to lure us into a trap isn't their style, Cal elaborated for the benefit of his friends rather than the pirate. That's one of their major weaknesses. They're transparent in their methods. Trickery doesn't suit their blunt, bold ideals. Sure of this, are you? Cassius asked. We're not in a position to enjoy certainties, but perhaps there's a way for us to gain more confidence. Cal shifted his position and reached his hand toward Toka. Toka, hand me that little mirror you carry around with you. What? Cal smiled, the speed and sharpness of his young friend's response confirming his suspicions were probably right. Come on, we don't have time to mess around. I've seen you add it to your gear whenever we make excursions. You carry a frickin' mirror with you? Eddie asked, deactivating her visor to stare disbelievingly at Toka. Toka also deactivated his visor, mouth bunched up and looking on the verge of rebutting the claims. But the seriousness of the situation ultimately made him swallow them. Okay, hold up, he said, as he shifted his position to have a dig around in his hip pack. You vain bastard, Eddie said, a grin spreading across her face as Toka pulled out the little mirror and passed it to Cal. It's not for looking at myself, Toka argued unconvincingly. Eddie looked on the verge of laughter. Then what the fuck's it for? Toka's mouth squirmed for a moment, clearly not armed with a decent answer. For looking around corners, he eventually managed. Corners? 
Yeah, secretly, like, so you don't have to risk your head when you're getting shot at, and, like, checking for bombs and stuff. Oh, shit, sorry, Eddie said, voice suddenly earnest. Didn't mean to mock you. I'd completely forgotten you were a special agent interstellar super spy. She raised an apologetic hand. No need to explain further. Even Corporal Bright snickered at that. Toka muttered some reply, but Cal was too busy judging the angle of the larger of the two suns that dominated the sky in relation to the star splinter. Once confident he'd judged right, he removed his hand from the front of the mirror and made a few adjustments until the reflected light shone directly at the star splinter's flight window. You really are quite the boy scout, Kai said as the pair of them watched for a reply. Cal smiled. Sometimes simple is best. Is that a giant cat? Victor asked, sounding more than a little perplexed as he and Jumper stared through the Star Splinter's flight window. The smart glass had identified Cal and the rest of the gang just seconds after they'd become visible, zooming in on them as they peeked over the ragged edge of a large vine. I think it might be, Jumper replied, rubbing his head. And on the far right, Victor continued, leaning forward to point at the large blue head with black eyes. Is that... He dropped his hand, struggling to find the words. What the hell is that? An alien, Jumper ventured as he continued to rub at his head. At first glance, he thought his friends had unwittingly blundered close to an insidian drone, but after a few moments, it was obvious they were fully aware of each other and no killing had ensued. Jumper couldn't remember a time when he'd felt such a convergence of emotions, relief and confusion at the front of the pack. So they've joined forces with some sort of massive tiger thing and a blue bug man, Victor said, apparently needing to put it into words just to confirm they were seeing the same thing. A bug man with a silver ball floating next to it. Seems so, Jumper replied, forcing himself to stop rubbing his head. I get the distinct feeling we've missed out on a few things. What's he doing? Victor asked after a few moments silently coming to terms with the odd revelation. Cal, I mean... Looks like he's flashing something at us. Jumper smiled, relieved that something he understood had been dropped into the mix. Morse. Huh? Communication, Jumper said as he started jotting down the sequence of flashes. Ancient code. Oh, right, Victor said with a sniff. Forgot you guys are fond of that old stuff. So, they're all good? Toker asked once Cal had finished tapping the code into his data pad. The blinking light beneath the front of the star splinter's hull had seemed worryingly bright, but Cal had been quick to remind himself that, thanks to the ghosting net, it could only be detected through their visors. Satisfied Jumper's reply was finished, Cal turned on his side to look at the rest of the gang. Flashing mirrors don't lend themselves to long, detailed conversations, but yes, it seems they're good. Well, thank the gods for that, Toka said. So, what's the plan? They coming to get us? Cal shook his head. They agree we shouldn't risk it. Insidians won't let technology spoil a fight, but they've no qualms using it to disable or destroy other technology. We can't risk those damn cubes getting involved. We only fire up the star splinter once we're all on board and ready to flee. With any luck, they won't be prepared to give chase. Cal knew much of this was conjecture, and that it was a thin hope to hang on to, but it was the best they had, so he tried to sound confident. Eddie seemed convinced. So we're going to make a run for it across the vines. Cal shook his head. First, we try Toka's stealthy approach. The vines between us and the star splinter have a decent amount of plant life, and Victor has expanded the ghosting net as far as possible. There's a chance we'll make it without being spotted. Cal looked at each of them. All agree with the plan? It sounds sensible to me, Tawny answered, eliciting a nod of agreement from Bright. Cassius scoffed. What it sounds like is an excellent way to watch you all get killed, he said, reverting to his mocking default. So I heartily approve. Ignoring the pirates, Cal looked back to Kaya. Pete's lazing around here, she said with a smile and a shrug. And if at some point we do get spotted, Toka asked. Opening the pack of remaining XL, Cal pulled two out for Kaya and himself before passing the pack to Toka. Then we revert to Eddie's plan and run our asses off, probably a bit of shooting too. Their alien friend, who Eddie seemed adamant was to be named Blue, had turned his attention from the Insidian ships and was watching them all with a curious tilt of the head. It put Cal in mind of a teacher lingering at the back of the class. Blue gave a little nod, 
Whether he was concurring with the plan or just becoming fond of the head gesture, Cal had no clue. Christ, Eddie, Toka hissed. What the hell are you doing? Cal looked just in time to see Eddie press two Excel syringes against Shaggy's neck before casually tossing the empty cartridges away. Everyone but Eddie tensed, fully expecting the huge cat to go berserk. But it didn't happen. In fact, the cat remained so remarkably still that Cal wondered if the serum was somehow ineffective in the beast. Then he noticed the bunching and rippling of the muscles around its massive shoulders, followed by the sound of splintering wood as its front claws dug into the vine with brutal force. Hell, Ed, Toka rasped, having scrambled further from the girl and her shaggy friend. Just when I think you can't get any more nuts. If we end up having to fight, then I ain't having Shaggy miss out on the Excel. And anyway, it's done now, so deal with it. Cal let out a slow breath and supposed that was good advice. Run. The roar twisted Cal's gut and made lit fuses of his every nerve. They'd been seen. A grim-looking, spiky-faced drone was endeavouring to make the fact known, its far-reaching calls shocking birds into flight as it echoed off the endless stretch of massive looping vines. There was a victorious quality to the roar, as if their capture was already a done thing, and perhaps it was. The careful creeping between the plethora of giant fungi, plants and flowers had been more successful than Cal had expected, and they'd made it almost halfway to the star splinter but there was still some distance to cover, and it was far from a straightforward sprint. Run! The instruction hardly needed yelling, but Cal couldn't help himself. His shout had barely finished sounding when an arc of bright white light burst from the silver sphere that had been hovering low just ahead of them. As if solid, the light sliced through the spiky drone's neck, sending its head spinning through the air and ending its roar forevermore. But others had started up the call, howls, screeches, and roars spreading across the landscape in an ever-increasing wave. Try to stay together, Cal yelled as they began to run. That hardly needed saying either, but it was going to be easier said than done, keeping formation when running across rugged, twisted vines bestrewn with spongy patches of moss was a tricky endeavor, not to mention the myriad of startled bugs taking flight around them. Fortunately, the drones directly ahead were being dealt with by Blue and the Sphere, cutting a devastating path as they spearheaded the group. Every arc of light that burst from the sphere separated a head from its body without fail, and those that had no obvious head were simply sliced in two. Blue was less brutal in his methods, flowing around his opponents with a sort of liquid grace, landing very few strikes other than the occasional shove or encouraging kick to send the drones tumbling from the vine so gravity could do the rest. Effective as the alien duo were, however, other Insidians were closing in, some even leaping across the gaps between vines in furious attempts to get at them. A few landed awkwardly, injuring themselves, and some even bounced off and away, but many landed confidently, strong alien limbs dealing with the impact in a way no human could have managed. As they ran, Cal and the gang fired their weapons, aiming at the most immediate threats while simultaneously attempting to cover each other. Even the best shots, however, couldn't assure success. To all sense and purpose, they were battling the walking dead, and if Kaya was correct in her theories, the drones were controlled from a distance, enabling them to be fearless and fierce to the extreme. His ammo count depleting fast, a tiny whisper at the back of Cal's mind told him they were doomed, that the chances of surviving this fight were non-existent. But a whisper, it remained. There was no time for it to become more than that, just as there was no time for tactics or calculated maneuvering. All time allowed for was running and fighting, immediate and animalistic, killing the drones if possible, evading them if not. One stride at a time, one opponent at a time. Positioned midway down the Star Splinter's open loading ramp, Jumper peered through his Bliss Rifle's sights at the unfolding scene. The gang had done well to get as far as they had without being seen, but now the chase had well and truly begun. Lowering his rifle, Jumper scanned the scene with his bare eyes. From his elevated position, the alien figures swarming across the vines made for a terrifying sight, all drawn toward one little group as if they were the last living prey on a world filled with starved predators. Fortunately, the puzzle-like landscape wasn't making it easy for the enemy. If it had been a flat expanse, the gang would have been doomed for sure. No movement from the cube ships, at least, Jumper thought as he stared at them in the distance. What can we risk? What must we risk? Is it time for the widows, Jay? 
Victor asked through the comm as if he'd heard Jumper's thoughts. Manning the Star Splinter's flight deck, the boy sounded understandably nervous, but there was an edge of eagerness, too. That was also understandable. His young friend had put a lot of effort into his mechanical battle spiders and was keen to put them to the test. And what better test than this? Jumper looked toward all twelve of the widows, now lined up at the perimeter of the expanded ghosting net. They'd not yet released them for fear of compromising the Star Splinter's position, but now the balance of caution over action had well and truly been tipped, and if they stood any chance of getting away from this planet alive, risks were going to have to be taken. Okay, kid, let them off the leash. Cal cursed as the last of his rounds burst from his rifle. Without a second thought, he threw the spent weapon at the drone that was still thundering toward him, distracting it just long enough to pull his sidearm and finish the job. That had been a close call. The bastard had weird, sword-like arms of bright white bone and had almost gone close enough to take his head as a prize. As he ran, Cal caught glimpses of his friends. Kaya firing her spider cuff, Toka leaping over a fallen foe, Eddie smashing her cybernetic fist into the face of another. The corporals were also doing well, Bright swinging his rifle and Tawny firing the last of her sidearm's ammo with impressively composed shots. Doing a good job of proving weapons weren't a necessity, Cassius dodged another charging drone, a compact devil of hard muscle and bone, and sent a powerful front kick into its back. The kick contained far more brutal aggression than Blue's methods, but achieved a similar result as the drone tumbled off the vine. With a brief lull in the attacks, Cal took a moment to assess the way ahead and found himself cursing again. Four large vines, including the one he and the gang were running along, were converging, and enough drones had gathered to crush the most robust of optimists. There were even a few of those huge crab-like beasts, their long, multi-jointed legs handling the terrain with frightening speed. The Silver Sphere unleashed a series of light blasts, slicing through much of the horde with astonishing efficiency. But still more came, fury and insatiable hunger for the fight driving them swiftly forward. Keep moving, Cal yelled as the gang slowed their pace. It seemed a suicidal order, but considering the number of drones yet to reach them, the longer they delayed, the worse their situation would become. Shaggy surged ahead, the XL having turned the already ferocious beast into one of the most efficient killers Cal had seen in some time, and that was some stiff competition. The cat stripes were now a wild mix of brightly coloured blood as it tore drones apart, the huge claws and fangs more than up to the task. Encouraged by Shaggy's courage, Cal fired the last rounds of his sidearm at two Karkarian drones who were closing in fast, their solid jet-black forms and pale eyes as startling as ever. The shots made the pair stumble, buying him time to aim carefully with his spider cuff. The nearest attacker dropped almost instantly, but the other continued forward with savage speed. Kaya took it down with her sidearm, and a heartbeat later was already looking for her next target. It wasn't difficult. The enemy were arriving in droves, and nightmarish sight, claws and fangs flashing lethal bright. Amid all the roaring and howling, Cal was pretty sure he heard Toka shouting, followed by Eddie's unique war cry. But he didn't spot them before a fist or possibly foot came at him. Arching back, he caught an impression of a big scaled brute as claws scraped his jaw. With a snarl, he thrust his hand out, grabbing the drone's neck. Excel fueling him as he squeezed and activated his spider cuff, the point-blank rain splattering the right side of his visor with thick gore. Despite their efforts, they were soon forced almost to a stop again. Too many enemies to cut a path through, enough for the vine to be shuddering from all the footfall. Roughly wiping the blood from his visor, Cal felt a little burst of hope as Blue crouched down and pressed his hands against the vine, turning a long portion of it to liquid. Within seconds, maybe fifty drones, including one of the crabs, had sunk into it, becoming stuck fast as it solidified. But still more surged forward, clambering and stomping over their trapped fellows, indifferent to their plight and unafraid of suffering the same fate. Hoping they would indeed suffer the same fate, Cal looked back at Blue. But the alien staggered as he tried to rise, clearly drained from his efforts. His stature and vibrancy had diminished again too, even more than earlier. Where the hell is the sphere? Cal thought as he scanned the surrounding air. It was nowhere in sight. Clean out of ideas, Cal viewed the advancing drones with gritted teeth. A second giant crab was surging to the front of the pack, and not far behind it some other form of beast, not as large but boasting even more limbs. 
What the freaking hell? Eddie shouted. Anyone else seeing that? At first, Cal assumed Eddie was referring to the multi-limbed beast, but then realized she was pointing at something much further back. Drones were exploding. Literally exploding. The air where they once stood was becoming a rainstorm of brightly colored icor. For a moment, Cal wondered if the sphere was responsible, or perhaps Jumper and Victor had risked the Star Splinter's cannons. But then he caught sight of something familiar. Another of the huge crabs appeared to be melting. Electrical sparks fizzed across its shuddering limbs. My little pistol, Toka yelled. That crazy little pirate weapon I tested back on Hex. I'd recognize that electric craziness anywhere. Shit, Eddie spat. So we've got freaking pirates to deal with now, too. I don't think so, Eddie, Cal said, a modicum of hope rising again. I think it's Victor and Jumper's handiwork. They're trying to clear us a path. Well, they'd better fucking clear it faster than that, Cassius shouted, his eyes fixed on the nearest crab and the host of other advancing drones. Blue still looked unsteady on his feet as he backed up toward them, and still the sphere was nowhere in sight. Cal tried to drum up some fury as his eyes fell back on the crab. Not that it would help. All the fury in the universe wouldn't take that monster down. Even pulse weapons had been insufficient on C9, so we couldn't imagine they'd get far with spider cuffs. Again, Cal was heartened as Shaggy moved up front, facing the oncoming threat in what appeared to be a protective stance. Then the big feline dug its claws hard into the vine and turned to let out a short, sharp growl. Gravity dip, Eddie yelled as she dropped down and grabbed a couple of handfuls of moss. Cal didn't waste time questioning what had just occurred between the cat and his young friend. He just trusted it and dropped to the vine next to her, grasping a craggy bit of bark. The others followed suit, with even Cassius finding some faith in the girl's warning and throwing himself down. Sure enough, just seconds after Shaggy's warning, the vine lurched downward. It was the most gut-lurching they'd experienced yet, forceful enough that if it wasn't for the benefit of the XL, Cal doubted they'd have retained their grip. As alarming as it was for them, however, it was more so for the unwitting drones, and continuing to hold on tight, Cal couldn't help but smile as just about every one of them went airborne, the bastard crab included. Even though the Star Splinter was secured upon the vine, and he in turn was secured to the ship's open loading ramp, Jumper couldn't help but grunt in surprise as the planet's weird instability hit once again. This was by far the most violent dip yet, and from his vantage point, the shifting vines looked like a great wave rippling across the landscape, a sight that gave credence to Kaya's theory that the cause might be a shifting ocean far below, or perhaps tectonic shifts. Whatever the reason, Jumper was grateful for the havoc it was causing the Insidian ranks, the vast majority of whom were now airborne, alien limbs swinging for purchase that was no longer there. Through his rifle sights, he was relieved to see Cal and the gang safely clinging to the vine, and Victor's widows weren't faring too badly either, their undersides fitted with something similar to the spider cuff tech. The mechanical beasts appeared more spider-like than ever as they shot downward, attached to the dropping vines via thin threads. A muttered curse from Victor through the comm yanked Jumper's attention closer to home. Everything okay, kid? he asked, instinctively glancing back up the Star Splinter's loading ramp, despite the boy being stationed up on the flight deck. One of the cubes is mobilized, Victor replied, possibly mobilizing this way. Jumper lowered his rifle to look. Sure enough, one of the cube ships had ascended away from the distant crash site and was moving with smooth efficiency in their direction. Jumper muttered his own curse. Had the widows drawn their attention? Had they made a grave error in releasing them? With a grimace, he pushed the thoughts away. They'd had no choice, and there was nothing to be gained in second-guessing themselves now. Maybe we should fire up the Star Splinter's engines. Hold up, kid, Jumper said, having caught sight of something else hovering in the bright sky. He used his rifle's auto-track to zero in on it. It was the Silver Sphere, that strange little thing that had been aiding the gang in their fight. Seconds later, a blast of green light ripped across the sky, looking and sounding like a thousand bolts of lightning stretched straight, and had come from the approaching Insidian cube and was startling enough to make Jumper flinch. He quickly shook off his surprise and waited again for his auto track to search out the sphere, hoping to God it hadn't been shredded by the blast. He had about two seconds of relief upon seeing their little ally intact, before another burst of light ignited, this one so bright it made the green streak seem drab in comparison. A shockwave quickly followed, rippling across the landscape like a tsunami of compressed air. 
Blinking his vision back to life, Jumper did his best to assess the outcome of whatever had just occurred. But what he saw was far better than he could have imagined, and definitely more surprising. Cal almost laughed. Even more satisfying than seeing that bastard crab go airborne was the sight of the very same beast colliding with the vine as the dip inevitably reversed. The impact was hard enough to send out a plume of splintered wood and shredded vegetation as the crab was sent spinning away to continue its fall in a wild frenzy of hopelessly twitching limbs. Holding on tight with his friends doing likewise around him, Cal's smile only widened as many more drones also bounced off the fast-rising vine, some even missing it entirely, their rage-filled shrieks quickly stolen away by the long fall. Finally, this planet's doing us a favor, Cal shouted to Kyra as the vine began to slow. Thanks to Eddie's warning, she replied, this time entirely unconcerned that the girl had related it to gravity. What a ride, Toka shouted with an edge of glee. He's the gnarliest yet. Cal looked towards Shaggy, who was still gripping the vine just a few paces in front of them, its predatory eyes already singling out the nearest of the remaining drones who'd managed to cling on. Whatever natural instinct the cat had developed as an early warning signal, Cal was certainly glad of it. Even with spider cuffs, the severity of that dip would have made it hard to save themselves. Toka started to say something more when a flash of green light accompanied by a colossal boom made them all flinch. Still holding on, they looked upward in search of the cause. Then they were flinching again as the sky flashed white, an intense shiver punching through the air. What the hell? Cal saw Blue gazing to their left as if he could see straight through the shifting vines that were presently blocking their view. The remaining drones had also turned in that direction, and a distant rumble set them roaring in what Cal could only assume was rage. What the bloody hell's happening? Toki yelled as the landscape shuddered all around them. Just a guess, Cal said, but I think an insidious ship just crashed. Crashed? Yep. Cal would have elaborated, but any further discussion was going to have to wait. The dip had subsided enough for the fight to resume, and he had the distinct impression the remaining enemy had some extra aggression to unleash. Golden Leaning forward, Becca rested her head against the curved glass of the elevator. A far cry from the freight elevators they'd ridden below, this was a glossy cocoon of impeccable lines and sleek surfaces matched by a perfectly smooth ride. Too tired to do much else, she stared at the view, almost mesmerized as it passed by in a vertical stream of grandiose architecture. They'd made it to the havens, and rather fittingly the first hints of a slow-rising sun were streaming between the soaring spires, almost surreal in the way they glinted off the flawless metals that shone silver and gold. It was undeniably beautiful, a fairy tale city melded with the modern age. Once Franco had wearily dealt with the haven's automated border gates, Feng had quickly gained his bearings and guided them through the lower streets. Just as he confessed, the sector was deserted, not a soul to be seen as they weaved through the pristine neighborhoods, nor so much as a whisper heard as they passed countless doors, windows, and arches of the grand, ornate structures. Becca had never imagined that such a beautiful and wealthy place could be so ominous but perhaps that had more to do with them still being the prey in an ongoing hunt. As yet, they'd see no sign of Jareth or his goons, but the sense of threat still loomed large at their backs. Eventually, Feng had led them to the elevator, which he'd assured would carry them directly to his dock. Other than that welcome revelation, none of the group had spoken, each of them slumped on the elevator floor, too exhausted for words. Or perhaps there was just nothing left to say. Anton was still clinging to life, but barely. Dark marks had spread across his torso, a strange pattern undoubtedly caused by the poison. They'd carried him through the ghostly streets as carefully as they could without jeopardizing their speed. He'd woken a few times only to mutter nonsensical words and cry out in pain before passing out again. Clara had checked his pulse regularly, and Shep tended to his makeshift bandage, but they all knew he was as good as gone. To abandon him on the streets while he still clung to life, however, was something that none of them could even suggest, let alone do. In truth, Franco didn't look a whole lot better than Anton. The effort of hacking this final elevator had almost finished him off, to the point Becker thought they might have to carry him too. 
To his credit, though, the corporal had somehow dug deeper still to finish unlocking their one and only zapper during the long ascent. Judging by the look of him now, though, asking him to unlock anything else would probably just result in him puking all over it. As the sun continued to rise, vibrant at this altitude just as the moon had been, Becca felt a calmness settling in, those golden rays helping to neutralize her worries and fears. They were close now, really close, the nightmare existence drawing to a long-awaited close. As she'd done many times over many months, she found herself wondering what she and Franco might face off-world. Would there be a place for them? A purpose? Or would it be more of the same fractured society they'd already been enduring, just on a far grander scale? Whatever it turned out to be, she was glad for the opportunity to find out. Even if civilization was a chaotic mess, surely that grander scale would offer more opportunity to discover something good amongst the bad. Spots of light amongst the dark, something to latch onto, something to give their lives meaning again, no matter how short those lives might be. Perhaps they'd even find long-lost friends. Still soaking up the view, Becca came close to smiling. The sun was warming the glass, pleasant against her skin, and helping to awaken a long-forgotten sense of hope. It felt good, like the return of an essential part of her that had all but vanished. Good enough that she vowed in that moment to cherish the feeling forevermore, to keep it safe and feed it with any and every optimistic morsel she could find. He's dead. Clara's words came as no surprise. Making an effort to preserve her newfound hope deep in the recesses of her mind, Becca retracted her forehead from the glass and turned toward Anton's lifeless face. Those dark marks had spread up his neck, stark against his white skin. But he appeared peaceful, a far cry from how he'd been in life. Where had that manic, energetic soul gone? Where was the life force that had governed the shell of a body? That age-old mystery, the question of questions. And even if it could be answered, could it be understood? Was a human mind capable, or was it something beyond even the realms of imagination? Maybe one of us should say some words, Donnie suggested. Sat by his side, Donna nodded in agreement, although it clearly wasn't going to be her. No one else was quick to volunteer either, but eventually Jim cleared his throat and spoke up. Guess I could try and string a few together, he said, straightening up a little, but not having it in him to actually climb to his feet. The old man stared at Anton's face for a moment before he began. So, um, sorry you kicked it, kid. Sorry you got hooked good and hard with death's crook. Ain't nice and ain't altogether fair. Was most likely your own fault, of course, but we all make mistakes from time to time. He rubbed thoughtfully at his bristly chin with a shaky hand. Guess this one was a bit of a biggie, though, eh? Jim cleared his throat again and glanced nervously around at each of the group before looking back at Anton. Didn't know you all that well, kid. Not hardly at all. And what I did know weren't all that good, if I'm admitting the truth of it. A bit of an arse you were... More than a bit, if I'm being wholly honest. I'm sure you had a good sight, just didn't quite get round to showing it to us. Ran out of time for that reveal. Fang shot Becker a look that suggested a growing opinion that no words might have been preferable. In contrast, Donnie was nodding as if the old man's speech was straight from the mouth of the most scholarly of pastors. Donna was smiling gently, which might have indicated appreciation, or just as easily, pity. Shep was staring into space, his face too battered to discern a readable expression. And Clara, being the only one who'd made it to her feet, was looking down towards said feet, her face hidden beneath long, scraggly strands of hair. And then there was Franco. Strangely, it had taken this half-arsed mockery of a funeral to finally wipe that grim, haunted expression from his face. And more than that, there was even a slight smile on his lips as he looked toward Becca the sort of smile that was the last line of defense against an inappropriate laugh. Despite the situation, Becca felt one of her own struggling to break free. But even though you were a bit of an arse, Jim continued, it's possible we wouldn't have gotten all the way up here without your help. He took a pause, pondering his next words. Of course, it's also possible we might have gotten here a lot quicker too, might already be far away off this rock. But just in case that weren't the case... I guess we all owe you our thanks. So, 
He placed his left hand over the right side of his chest, possibly a little forgetful of where his heart was. I hope you're with God now. The real God, I mean. None of that weird fecking shit you kids believe in. The old man looked past Becker and took in the glimmering view through the elevator window. So, yeah, hope you made it safely to heaven. You were already a long way up, so hopefully going just that bit further was an easy thing. And, well, maybe each of us will see you up there when our own time comes. Say a quick hello. Talk about... Well, say a quick hello. He looked around at each of the group again, taking encouragement from Donnie's continued nodding. But till then, though, well, best of luck, I guess. Franco's smile had grown wider. Donna, too, was continuing to smile, serene and peaceful, as if nothing had ever been better in the universe. Donnie was mumbling a few words of his own while looking upward, and Clara was still opting for a downward gaze, as if her feet were the most alluring objects in all existence. Well done, Jim, Feng said, rather charitably judging by the baffled expression on his face. Not always easy to find the words, especially ones as beautiful as those, Franco added. I agree, real beautiful, Donnie said, having dodged Franco's sarcasm. Becca gave in to her smile, worried she might fail where Franco had succeeded in retaining a laugh. Feng looked as though he might say something more, but instead he tilted his head in an odd manner. His familiar frown reappeared too, deep enough to chase Becca's laugh back down her throat and wipe away her smile. She was about to ask him what the problem was when he lurched to his feet and thumped his fist against the elevator's emergency control, bringing it to a swift stop. What the fick? Jim spat, almost falling onto his ass in his panic to get up. Donnie started to say something too, but Feng quieted them all with a hiss and an urgent raised hand. I can hear them, he said after a moment. Jareth, I'm in. Her shock stick in hand, Becca got to her feet. So where the hell did you stop us? Franco snapped, using the elevator wall to push himself awkwardly upright. We've no choice but to outrun them. It didn't come from below, Fang said, still tilting his head to direct his augmented ear upward. He's already waiting at my dock. You're certain, Becca said, loud enough to cut through the collective cursing. I'm certain. I can hear the bastard barking orders up there as we speak. How the fuck did he get ahead of us? Jim asked, glaring at Feng as if it was somehow all his fault. He must have opted for the tower interiors rather than continuing a direct chase, Feng theorized. Use transport pods that were faster than the freight elevators. Also, we've been hampered with... He looked toward Franco, who was still leaning heavily against the wall. I mean, we've not been quite as efficient as we were at the beginning of our run. But how did he know? Donnie persisted. Know exactly where we were heading. An educated guess we're heading toward the only remaining dock with any ships, Becca said as she looked about the elevator for signs of escape hatches. She saw none. How many are up there? Shep asked, looking like he was calculating their odds. Too many for us to handle, that's for damn sure, Franco said angrily. And a fucking slaughter boat too, don't forget that little detail. Fang nodded, his expression grim. I can't be sure, but sounds like a fair few. So we gotta go back down, right? Donnie said, take your chances lower in the city, try to avoid these cousins the kids spoke of. Donna nodded her silent agreement. Oh, what if we try to trick them? Jim suggested. We send the elevator down to lure them while we hide somewhere up here. Franco let out a sharp laugh, devoid of humor. Let's assume for a moment we're not dealing with gullible twelve-year-olds. Fact is, we... The elevator started to ascend again, jolting Franco into silence. Feng spun about and hit the emergency control, again bringing it to a stop. They must be trying to override it, and if they... Yet again, the elevator began to ascend, and once more Feng hit the emergency button. This time it didn't stop. Son of a... Franco practically fell toward the control panel, clumsily elbowing Feng out of the way as he did so. Okay, everyone brace yourself for a fight, Becca said, passing Donna the unlocked zapper and making sure the others had their shock sticks in hand. She looked hopefully toward Franco, but his hand was shaking badly against the control panel, which didn't fill her with confidence. Careful not to disrupt the effort, Fang reached around him and tried the emergency stop again, but still to no effect. This is bad, Jim spat. This is really feckin' bad. Becca agreed. Her mind was searching desperately for some form of tactical strategy to share, but the situation was too hopeless.
Maybe if they were all trained soldiers, armed with something more than inactive shock sticks and a single zapper. But even then, that damned slaughterbot would likely be the only one left standing. So the best advice she could offer was to fight hard enough to ensure a quick death, better than facing that torture Anton had spoken of. But even that advice had no time to be voiced. The elevator had already been close to the dock, and in no time at all came to a smooth stop, the automatic doors opening with merciless efficiency. The dock was flooded with the morning sunlight. It was glaringly bright, but not quite blinding enough to hide Jareth, who was standing front and center fifteen feet from the elevator's wide opening. More than twenty goons stood on either side of him, grim-faced and garbed in their usual black, and behind them all, shimmering in the sun's rays like some fiery devil, the slaughterbot loomed large. About time you fuckers got here. Jareth's cold eyes swept over them before settling on Anton's blood-soaked corpse. He continued to stare at the body for a moment, a few sharp twitches to his features before snapping out of it and looking up. You assholes have any idea how long I've been waiting? He punctuated his question with the most wicked of grins. You two will be getting my special attention. Jareth's eyes flicked between Becker and Franco. For the rest of you, I'm feeling a rare pang of generosity and will give you all this one chance to return to my fighting cages with just a minor beating. The skin snake wriggled over Jareth's face as he glared at each of them, looking like he was sorely hoping for refusal. Just one chance to come quietly and save your pathetic la- Jareth choked on his words to the point he actually had to cough. The psychotic young man didn't have a face that held much color, but whatever there was swiftly drained away as he peered wide-eyed into the elevator. Even his snake had frozen upon his forehead. Then there was fear. Proper gut-twisting and heart-pounding fear. Close it, he shrieked, wide eyes snapping to his man at elevator controls. Fucking close it now! A readiness to fight momentarily dampened by confusion, Becca was knocked from behind, hard enough that she almost smacked headfirst into the elevator wall. It only took her a second to right herself and snap her eyes back up to Jareth and his men. But rather than facing an attack, what she saw could only be described as blind panic. Gods and Devils his bliss rifle as comfortable in his grip as ever, Jumper zeroed in on another drone, this one making a charge at Corporal Tawney and fired three more darts. Two would probably have done the job, but this wasn't the time to be taking chances. Another cube's going down, Jay, Victor shouted through the comm. The previous panic in the boy's voice was now replaced with awe and perhaps disbelief. Even from this distance, Jumper felt the rumbling impact as the massive cubed vessel crashed into the vines. Unable to resist a look, he lowered his rifle just in time to glimpse the last of the cube's smooth, pearlescent edge disappearing into the mangled vines, a great cloud of debris erupting into the sky. Jumper wondered how deep the cubes would end up. They hadn't fallen from a great height, but their sheer size and presumable weight would likely ensure a substantial depth. That little sphere's a beast, Victor shouted, his awe rising with each word. It certainly is, kid, Jumper agreed. During the battle on Hex, he'd witnessed the Insidians firing at the pirate ships with some sort of disabling weapon that made them simply fall out of the sky. Now it seemed they were getting a taste of their own medicine. That was three of the cube ships now disabled, and another appeared to be retreating. Two more were in motion, trying to take on the little sphere, but having little success as it zipped through the color-filled sky with dazzling speed. It almost looked as though the sphere was toying with them, but Jumper felt the more likely explanation was that it needed time to recharge between pulses. Either that or its positioning had to be just right for the pulse to be effective. Whatever it was, he just hoped the little war machine kept up the good work. Jumper was about to put his attention back on the gang when he caught sight of something so small and distant he was amazed he'd spotted it at all. A closer look through his rifle sights revealed two figures that had exited the retreating cube ship, or more precisely, had flown out of it, dark wings propelling them through the air at speed. And now they were flying this way. As he and the gang sprinted along the vine, Cal tried his best not to think about the fact they were getting really close to the star splinter. Thinking that way had a habit of alerting the fates, and the fates were often arseholes who liked nothing better than to screw things up. 
Something else he was trying not to think about or even look at was the battle going on in the distance to his left. Several times now there'd been flashes of light accompanied by booms and cracks loud enough to shake the vines and rattle bones. An educated guest pointed toward the silver sphere being locked in combat with the Insidian ships. It was a fight he couldn't quite imagine, but also one he couldn't possibly affect the outcome of, so he tried to keep his attention closer to home. Fortunately, the violent dip had reduced the attacking drones considerably. Also promising were the glimpses of unconventional destruction not far ahead, most notably half a giant crab sticking up at an odd angle, its other half melted and fused to the vine. It seemed Victor had fully embraced the pirate's sadistic tech and found a way to run with it. Blessed with a bare section of vine, Cal glanced at the rest of the gang. He was astounded none of them had lost a limb or worse. They'd all suffered multiple wounds, but considering what they'd been up against, it was a near miracle they weren't all dead. Fortunately, their survival suits had the automatic ability to patch injuries, stem bleeding, and even solidify to stabilize bone fractures. Far from a long-term fix, but with luck it would see them through. Also very close to a miracle was their continued speed. The Excel and the growing hope they might actually survive this chaotic madness somehow pushed them past their limits. Something's wrong. The warning came from Cassius, who'd slowed a little at the front of the group. His eyes were fixed on several drones on a mangled twist of vine further ahead. It was immediately clear what had the pirates spooked. For the first time, the drones weren't charging toward them with gleeful rage. In fact, they were barely moving at all, their eyes now turned to the skies above. The whole group came to a stop, including Blue. What the hell are we waiting for? Toka said, breathing hard. We're almost to the star splinter. Hold up, Cal said, noting Blue had also turned to look in the same direction as the drones. Cassius is right. Something's off. They've stopped their attack. Some are even backing up, Kaya noted. Must finally be scared, Eddie said. Cal scanned the skies, trying to catch sight of whatever the hell the drones were looking at, his visor compensating for the glare. In the end, he heard the threat before seeing it, a rush of air so fast it caused a loud, piercing whistle. A dark shape, almost too fast for the eye, cut across the brightness. Cal leapt backward, raising his cuff while trying to make sense of the movement. He saw Blue crouch low and manipulate part of the vine, launching it upward like a giant spear. A single breath later, an almighty crack was followed by the top half of the spear crashing down. A figure turned in the air above them, held aloft by large wings, dark and smooth. The action had been a blur, but Cal had the distinct feeling those wings had been responsible for the slicing. Undeterred, Blue kept one hand pressed to the vine and sent up four more spears, thinner and longer than the first, but offering less room for escape. All four spears clattered back down to the vine, again shorn through. A second figure had swooped in, its tremendous speed allowing no warning, the wings again a mockery of Blue's attack. Slowing their movements, both the figures hung in the bright sky, their massive whooshing wings holding them upright as they stared down at the group. Both were human in shape and size, one male, one female. Their lithe, hairless bodies, however, looked as though they'd been dipped in a mixture of molten bronze and oil, slick and glowing slightly from somewhere within. Cal instructed his visor to zoom in on the pair, highlighting hands and feet that appeared more like talons, large enough to grasp the thickest of human limbs. Most disconcerting of all, though, were their devil-like faces, sharp teeth behind wicked grins and blazing eyes that emanated a cruel excitement, somehow more menacing than any amount of rage. Cal heard Corporal Bright mutter a curse that was repeated by Tawny. He was tempted to join in. Anything that made that pair break their stoic silence was bad indeed. Eyes fixed on the winged figures, Blue made two sharp clicks, accompanied by a sort of animalistic hiss. The sound seemed to indicate recognition, and certainly not the friendly kind. But the pair only grinned wider, looking like devil-spawned children, highly sadistic and armed with razor-sharp wings. Cal knew these weren't simply more drones bent by some evil will, and it wasn't just the fact they could fly. They had that telltale glow emanating from within, just like the Golden Man and Lothcore. True insidians, maybe? Whatever the case, they were going to be a damn sight harder to fight or run from.
Making good on their cruel expressions, the pair wasted little time observing, but instead dove back down, their attack accompanied by ear-splitting shrieks. His wrist already raised, Cal fired his spider cuff at the closest of the pair, but the sharp point ricocheted off the muscle torso like a wooden dart off stone. As the deflected projectile zipped back into his cuff, Cal dove well clear of those lethal wings, relieved to see the rest of the gang doing likewise. The vine shuddered as taloned fists and feet pounded into it, great splinters whizzing through the air. Blue had clearly been the target, but as far as Cal could see, the alien was no longer there. The male attacker once again took to the air, but the female started thrashing and shrieking in rage. One of her talons and the tip of one wing had sunk into the vine. Nicely done, Blue, Cal thought, tempted to fire his spider cuff at the female's back as she thrashed about. The memory of the weapon having zero effect, however, gave him pause. Next to him, Eddie had no such reluctance, and started repeat firing her cuff just as fast as it would reload, perhaps hoping she might get lucky and hit a weak point. But each hit ricocheted off without leaving so much as a graze. Shaggy, too, showed little reluctance, leaping at the struggling female with a mighty roar. But even more shocking than the deflected spider cuffs, the huge cat was batted away with the flat of her free wing, enough power to send the beast tumbling across the vine until his claws found purchase. Eddie cried out, looking set to charge, but even in her anger she recognized the futility of it. The Insidian had started to slam her wing down with more considered precision in order to cut herself free, and she was fast succeeding. Pulling Eddie back a few paces, Cal spotted Blue. The alien had reappeared a stone's throw from where he'd vanished, rising out of the vine as if it were no more solid than water. No sooner had he reappeared, however, when the male made another swooping attack, and having succeeded in setting herself free, the female wasn't far behind. Blue whipped up more portions of the vine, almost like thick tentacles that solidified the instant they contacted the attacking pair. But the devils were just as furious in their defense as their attack, cutting, smashing, and wrenching their talons and wings free just as fast as Blue trapped them. Fast weakening under the onslaught, Blue stumbled and slowed as they forced him back. If it had been just one opponent, Cal supposed his formidable new friend might have stood a chance, but as a pair the Insidians were indomitable. His mind churning over ways to help, Cal saw the male Insidian's left wing burst into bright green flames. Feeling a glimmer of hope, he glimpsed something on a neighboring vine scuttling on a multitude of mechanical legs. Victor's handiwork, he realized. The metal beast fired again, and this time Cal recognized the result. A swathe of electric sparks spread across the Insidian's body, joining forces with the green flames to try and melt flesh into a sizzling heap. With a shriek, the devil launched himself into the sky. His fists clenched, Cal heard the rest of the gang cursing as the male made a series of sharp arcs, both the sparks and green flames dying on his impervious flesh. Then he swooped back down, and the very same wing that had burst into flames sliced the spider in two, treating its metal body like the cheapest of plastics. And just like that, the hope died. In the time it took the spider's two halves to tumble down the curve of the vine and drop off its edge, the winged brute had already darted back to blue and renewed his attack as if nothing had even occurred. Cal caught Cassius's eye and recognized a look that for once couldn't be ignored. They had no chance in this fight, and they needed to get away from it before the opportunity was gone. But how? The way forward was blocked, and they weren't close enough to the other vines to swing across. Their only option would be to go down using zip lines, but that would take time that Cal very much doubted they had. The moment these creatures defeated Blue, they would be next in line, and that time was fast approaching. They're gonna kill him! Eddie shouted, looking like she was about to explode with frustration as she watched Blue's losing battle. Cal understood that. Blue had saved their lives at least once, and even if it was an option, abandoning the alien to these winged bastards really didn't sit well with him. Okay, he said, unwilling to give in to defeat or run from it. We can't hurt them, but maybe together we can distract them. Enough to give Blue a chance, he hoped as he fired his spider cuff at the back of the male Insidian's head. Striding forward, the rest of the gang followed suit, collectively raining shots at the Insidians as their attack raged on. Jumper reckoned he'd shot at least thirty bliss darts at those winged freaks, testing every part of their impossibly tough bodies. Not one dart had stuck, they'd just bounced off like he was shooting a child's toy. 
He'd even tried the explosive rounds that had made such a spectacular mess of the golden insidian on Hex, but failing to penetrate the winged creature's bodies, the rounds hadn't even detonated. And now one of Victor's widows had also failed in its attempts. What the bloody hell are they, Jay? Victor asked, his tension clear even through the calm. No damn clue, Jumper admitted. On a vacation from hell, maybe. He was doing his best to aim at their faces as they pressed their attack on that blue alien, hoping a lucky shot in the eye might bring more success. But the constant movement and aggressive nature of the pair made it an impossible shot. I'm trying to direct another widow at them, Victor said, undeterred by the last one's defeat. Good lad. As always, it impressed Jumper how well his young friend was holding it together. He knew from peering through his sights that half the widows they'd unleashed had already perished in the fight, and the rest were still trying to keep any remaining drones at bay. He risked lowering his rifle for a moment to assess the Insidian ships, but it was hard to be sure what the hell was happening. Whatever detritus or spores had billowed into the air when the cubes crashed now filled parts of the sky like great swirling orange clouds. There was promise, however, in the flashes that were periodically lighting those clouds up, signs that the sphere's battle was still ongoing. But were the Insidians distracted enough to overlook the Star Splinter's engines or cannons, another gamble that was threatening to tie Jumper's brain in knots? With a grimace, he set his sights back on the winged freaks. Do us a favor, kid. Yep, Victor replied quickly. Be ready on the cannons in case we get desperate. Are we already desperate? More desperate, Jumper decided with some reluctance. I get the feeling timing will be everything in this escape. As the gang continued to fire their spider cuffs, Cal caught a look on Kaya's face that perfectly reflected how he was feeling, frustration bordering on despair. Despite their efforts, the winged insidians hadn't so much as looked back at them, as if the attacks were completely inconsequential, which in this fight perhaps they were. This was a fight between gods and devils. Unfortunately, the devils were clearly winning. Blue was still manipulating the vines, but it now seemed a desperate defense without the slightest opportunity for attack, every shaft raised being smashed or sliced in seconds. His mind reeling over an alternative strategy, Cal noticed the male insidian stumble back ever so slightly. Corporal Bright had managed to target the bottom edge of a wing using the stick setting on his spider cuff and was pulling with all his might. Encouraged by the success, no matter how slight, Cal took aim to aid in the corporal's efforts. Before he got off a shot, however, the Insidian snapped around, those blazing eyes boring into them with perhaps the most intimidating stare Cal had ever witnessed, and he'd witnessed a lot. It only lasted a second, but that was enough. Cal shouted at Bright to release, but it was too late. Their foe rose upward and span around with terrible force, yanking Bright into the air like a limp puppet. Another spin, and one of the wings cut the corporal clean in half. The death happened almost too quickly to make sense of, and was too terrible to comprehend. Corporal Tawny screamed, and Cal had to tackle her as she tried to sprint forward. Whether she was planning to run to her partner's corpse or to exact some form of revenge, either would have been suicide. Tawny wasn't the only one to scream, but the sound issuing from Blue was far louder and stranger, a piercing alien sound with the power to echo far across the landscape. The sound was so intense it even made the winged brutes recoil. But no sooner had the cry faded than their attack resumed harder than ever, as if sensing their victory was close at hand. Falling back, Blue disappeared beneath a domed latticework of manipulated vine, a protective bubble that required constant regeneration as wings and talons slashed and pounded at it. Such was the unrelenting fury that Cal doubted Blue could sustain the barricade for long. But there was hope. Still restraining Tawny, who was groaning and straining in his grip, Cal looked to the skies. They'd grown darker, some sort of dark orange smoke filling the air far to his left, no doubt a result of whatever distant battle was playing out. The hope lingered as a suspicion. Blue's scream had been no ordinary one, not a cry of anguish or pain or even frustration. It had been a call for aid. Jumper heard Victor whoop as they spotted the silver sphere storming toward the two winged insidians, blasting arcs of lethal light as it went. Jumper suspected his young friend's celebration was born more from relief than anything else, and seconds later he almost joined in as an arc succeeded in separating an entire wing from one of the freaks. The male, by the look of things. 
As the creature crashed down and floundered on the vine, his female partner attempted to retaliate, her wings flapping furiously as she launched herself at the sphere. But the little war machine was too fast, zipping sideways and unleashing another dazzling arc that the female barely evaded. Through all the chaos, Jumper saw the gang backing away, giving the sphere space to do its work. Corporal Tawney was having to be dragged, her eyes fixed on Bright's severed body. It seemed the hope they'd all make it out alive had just been too great. Another two arcs of light streaked across the scene, one of them clipping the tip of the female's left wing, enough to throw her into a spinning descent. Zipping past her, the sphere fired again at the male, a small, bright disc that somehow detonated right in front of him, blasting him clear off the vine. With only one wing, the male spiraled downward, failing to save himself as the long drop swallowed him up. Still mostly intact, the female recovered some control, but it was too little, too late. The sphere was incredibly fast and mercilessly efficient, and its next blast took half her other wing and most of her left leg. Even from his vantage point, Jumper heard the howling shriek as she collided with the edge of the vine, scrambling at it before falling from view, the fading shriek echoing the purest of rage. That was incredible, Victor said, his excitement almost making it a shout. They didn't stand a chance. What the hell is that sphere, Jay? No clue, kid. I'm just glad it's fighting our corner. Just as Victor said, it had indeed been incredible. The fight had lasted barely a minute, swift enough for Jumper to question why it couldn't have happened sooner, soon enough to have saved Bright. Then his answer came in the form of a deep rumbling, fast building in intensity. His heart hammering, Jumper turned to see the cube ship emerging like a great pearlescent leviathan, thick orange spore clouds billowing around its hard edges. The Silver Sphere had done an excellent job at keeping the ships at bay, and the fact it had even disabled several of them was nothing short of astounding. In doing so, however, it had started the mother of all fights, and true to their nature, it seemed the Insidians were keen to finish it. Cal's heart sank and then began to thud all the harder and faster. The relief of seeing the Silver Sphere defeat the Winged Devils had been short-lived, Devastatingly so, considering everything they'd already been through. A deep rumble had begun, powerful enough to shake the vines and foliage around them, and Cal knew the cause before he'd even looked up. An insidious ship was closing in. The sphere had already shot upward to intercept the challenge, but the massive cube was moving fast, the rumbling quickly becoming a roaring so intense it would have been deafening were it not for their headgear. The roaring ship was more than enough incentive to start them all running. Kara was already at the remnants of Blue's protective dome, now little more than a pile of splintered wood, and Cal was shocked to see her lean down into it and lift out a limp grey figure that was no bigger than a child. Before he saw any more, a blinding streak of green burst from the insidian ship behind them, cutting into the landscape like a colossal beam of searing hot plasma. In an instant, it had shredded through countless vines in its unstoppable path. The vine they were running along shuddered, hard enough to throw them all onto their backs, fierce, crackling fire already blasting them with heat. Scrambling up, they resumed their run, hearts and feet pounding. The worst of the destruction had happened a little distance behind them, and the route to the star splinter remained more or less intact. But the vine was still shaking, and smoke was fast filling the air, not to mention an army of panicked wildlife. Worst of all, though, was that damn roaring, louder now than ever. Cal couldn't resist looking up, and he doubted he was alone. Ignoring a massive enemy ship that was hovering close enough to vibrate the very core of your bones was close to impossible. Another flash of light lit up the smoky sky, then a ripple of air punching into their backs like a breaking wave. Then silence, or close to it. Disorientated by the quiet, even more than he had been by the roar, Cal slowed his pace and looked back. Holy shit. The insidian cube was falling out of the sky, eerily silent and slow. Cal once again found himself running despite having no recollection of moving his legs. He tried to spot his friends up ahead, but as far as he could make out, they were spread far apart along the vine. Then came the inevitable impact. Fray.
Becca had about two seconds to contemplate Jareth's goon sprawled at the foot of the open elevated doors before another sailed toward them, a silhouette of flailing limbs against the dazzling morning sunlight as he crashed into the overhead lintel and met the floor with a hard crunch. Barely a second more and two other goons came toward them, this pair running, or perhaps fleeing, with aggression, or perhaps fear twisting their features. Instinct taking over, Becca tackled one of them with gusto, thrusting her shock stick into his jaw and a knee into his gut that bent him double. Finishing him with a thump to the back of his head, she saw Franco grappling with the other man to her right and a growling Shep piling in to help him out. Taking Franco's previous advice that this might be their last fight to heart, Jim roared a throaty battle cry as he bundled past them out into the glaring sunlight, his shock stick raised high as he ran into the fray. Whatever the hell the fray was, Becca still hadn't gotten a handle on that. Unwilling to let the old man go it alone, Becca lunged after him, matching his reckless pace as she ran onto the dock's glossy metal surface. Only a handful of moments ago, she thought the sun's warm golden glow a symbol of hope and new beginnings. Now it was a blinding pain in the arse. She tried to shield her eyes from the glare, but had already lost sight of Jim, and it wasn't only the light assaulting her senses. Running in every direction, Jareth's men were adding to the confusion, their shouts, screams, and crackling shock sticks filling her ears. There was gunfire, too, undoubtedly Jareth firing those damn pistols. In this dazzling arena, the reckless bastard stood more chance of shooting his own men than anything else. Something had panicked him, though, that was for damn sure. Something had panicked all of them. As Becca tried to catch sight of what that something was, a running goon crashed into her, possibly by accident, causing them both to fall. With her instincts dialed up to the max, she had her legs around the man's neck and was bracing his weapon-wielding arm barely a second after they'd hit the deck. As she worked on rendering the man unconscious, Becca glimpsed Feng's ships, a couple of sleek behemoths standing narrow and tall beyond all the chaos. If the circumstances were different, the sight would have been nothing short of majestic. As it stood, however, all the mayhem, fears of slaughter bots, poisonous bullets, and the safety of her friends, both old and new, combined to make the sight a mere flash of very distant relief. Succeeding in putting the thug to sleep, Becca sprang up and blinked against the light. She was at least encouraged that Jareth's remaining men would be suffering the same disadvantage, a fact made clear as one of them paused right in front of her, squinting and unaware of her presence until she cracked her shock stick into his skull. The stick wasn't activated, but she didn't need electricity to knock the man senseless. With barely a second to think, Becca spun toward what sounded like a shout from Franco but couldn't spot him. What she did see, however, was the slaughter bot. No longer looming still with that silent promise of death, it was now all motion, doing its efficient best to make good on that promise as those long silver limbs thrashed with terrifying speed. Becca only caught a glimpse, but she got the distinct impression it was being thoroughly challenged. What in hell could... A cry rang out, causing Becca to spin further to her left. Jim was on the ground just ten feet from her. One of Jareth's men, who was probably twice his height, was bearing down on him and pushing his crackling shock stick into the older man's chest. Becca flew at them, swinging her own shock stick at the goon's jaw. There was a reassuring crunch, but it was followed almost immediately by a searing jolt of pain. Some other unseen bastard had thrust a shock stick into her lower back, the electric surge turning her painfully rigid. Fighting the agony, Becca forced her racked body to turn, swinging her stick with blind fury. More by luck than anything else, it struck her attacker hard enough that he keeled over like a felled tree. Her whole body buzzing, Becca turned back to help Jim, but he was already up and running, chasing down another black garbed thug, his age not depleting his berserker rage in the least. Spurred by the old man's battle lust and complete lack of fear, Becca sought her next opponent. Homing in on the sound of gunfire, Becca caught sight of Jareth, his unique clothes and shiny pistols making him highly identifiable even amid the glare and chaos. He was carefully targeting something, and knowing that could never be a good thing, she burst toward him, throwing her stick with no time for thought or aim. The weapon glanced off the young man's shoulder, but it was enough to distract him, enough time for her to close the gap and pound a fist into his jaw. It was far from her best punch, but it might have been the most satisfying. Jareth went down with a squawk, both pistols clattering across the deck. 
Then the squawk turned to a deranged sort of howl as he scrambled after the weapons quite as if they were a fast-disappearing lifeline, which perhaps they were. Feeling half-crazed herself, Becca snarled and flung herself at him, determined to shove one of those damn pistols down his throat. Before she got her chance, a massive silhouette sprang in front of her, materialising out of the brightness with terrifying speed. There was a flash and swish of slashing metal, then pain, a great sudden lightning strike of it that rippled through every bone, muscle and nerve of Becca's shocked, limp body as she sailed through the air. Something had hit her, hit her ridiculously hard. But any further revelations were again smashed away as she hit the deck, and a whole lot of momentum made her skid and roll across it. The back of her head struck something, a railing. Then she was sliding over the edge of the deck, flailing legs meeting open air. Instincts exploding in her primal brain, Becca clawed for a handhold. Her unresponsive left arm screamed with pain, but her right obeyed, and she grasped something blessedly solid. For a few moments, she just clung on, body shaking and eyes pressed tight. The momentum had ended, but the echoes of pain remained, converging and intensifying. God damn it! God damn it! The phrase repeated over and over in her mind. She knew she was in a bad way and that the danger was far from over, but she had to give herself a moment, a moment to master the pain, time to gather some mental strength and, with any luck, a touch more fight. Her legs and much of her body were dangling. She didn't know for sure what was beneath her, but considering their location, not to mention the safety rail she'd slid under, it probably wasn't all that promising. Becca was tempted to simply cling on, eyes closed in an attempt to separate herself from the harsh and chaotic existence. But she couldn't shut her ears, could not hear the stomping metallic footfalls interspersed with whirring cybernetic joints. In truth, she'd known what had hit her even as she'd sailed through the air, but these sounds confirmed the reality of it. A fresh burst of adrenaline smothering her pain, Becca forced herself to open her eyes. As expected, the slaughterbot was closing in fast, seconds from finishing one more kill in a long line of them, a line that probably stretched well into the past and would likely carry on well into the future. The robot was showing signs of damage, most notably a bad limp, but nothing that would prevent its murderous duty. Becca thought about trying to pull herself up, but to what end? She had about as much chance of surviving the cybernetic killer as she did the miles of thin air beneath her. She tried to look past the advancing robot. Where was Franco? Multiple figures were still darting around, some even tumbling through the air, a strange sight that her slightly delirious brain was struggling to make sense of. She thought she caught a glimpse of Shep, that immaculate blonde hair drawing her focus. She hoped he was doing better than her. She hoped they all were. Not a difficult thing, perhaps. There was a terrible screeching of metal as the slaughterbot used two of its forearms to tear away the safety railing, a horrifyingly effortless task. Then it was on her, bright sunlight shimmering on its dented silver chassis and glinting off the lethal points of its nightmarish hand as it reached down. Becca considered letting go, but couldn't bring herself to do it. It wasn't the fall that stopped her so much as the possibility of her body ending up all the way down in the city's deep bowl, laying smashed amongst all those poor Chaka victims scurrying about in the poisonous blackness. Neither could she make herself close her eyes, or scream a curse, or even whisper one. She just held on tight and stared at all that murderous metal. The slaughterbot's massive frame jolted, and the terrible hand inexplicably jerked away from her exposed neck. Another jolt, this one more intense. Then the big metallic beast was crashing down right in front of her, the noise painful in her ears. Something had struck it, smashing at its already damaged right leg with enough power to buckle it. A figure was there, like a human, but too fast, way too fast. The slaughterbot tried to right itself, but its damaged leg was hampering its efforts, and it only fell further onto its side, trapping two of its arms under its own bulk. And there was the figure again, grasping one of the robot's free arms and twisting it back with unfathomable strength. Becca strained her neck to get a proper look, not quite believing her eyes. It was Clara, her face serenely calm. Gone were the nervous glances and anxious twitches, such expressions suddenly seeming impossible on such a face. Also gone was the green pallor to her skin, or was that a trick of the glaring light? 
Becca gave up trying to make sense of it, just watched in shocked awe as the meek, broken woman she'd briefly known continued to wrench the massive robot's arm with inconceivable power and confidence. The slaughterbot attempted to impale Clara with the fingers of its remaining free arm, but she twisted her body and swung her long legs with blinding speed, locking the attacking limb with fluid efficiency. She arched her body, the exertion required to overwhelm the robot's straining cybernetics still not showing on her face. The slaughterbot tried to roll and free its other arms, but it was too late. Something cracked, loud and final, as both of the limbs caught in Clara's hold juddered. Then they fell limp, like nothing more than scrap metal, as Clara lunged for the robot's cylinder-shaped head. Adjusting with the shift of weight, the slaughterbot succeeded in freeing another arm and thrust it out. As fast as the metallic killer was, however, Clara proved faster, deflecting the strike with her left fist and moving just out of reach as she wrapped her right arm around the bot's featureless head. For a tense moment, there was a strange stalemate, no movement or grunts of effort, only a subtle vibration that Becca felt against her chest and weakening hand, the sole indication of the forces at play. But soon came the familiar screech of buckling metal as Clara succeeded in twisting the head way past its intended design. There was no final spasm or synthesized cry of defeat. The robot's hulking body simply sagged, turning as limp as its broken limbs. The fight was done. Becca neither had the time nor the remaining mental capacity to grasp the implications of what she'd witnessed before Clara leapt off her lifeless foe to land inches from her bewildered face. There wasn't even time for a confused thanks before the woman wordlessly reached down and hauled her onto the deck with gentle ease. Becca lay there for a few moments, face down on the deck, trying to shut out the pain of her broken arm and breathing hard against multiple cracked ribs. Eventually, she willed herself to move, her left arm throbbing as she did so. Another few painful breaths, and she struggled to her knees. Clara had already gone, no doubt having vaulted over the slaughter bot to help put an end to the rest of the fighting. Filled with renewed hope, Becca desperately wanted to join her, a desperation so intense and immediate that she fought through the pain and dizziness to get to her feet. Then, with her broken arm hanging loose at her side and her good fist clenched tight, she staggered around the crumpled robot and torn railings and headed back into the fray. Last Leg The Star Splinter sat at an odd angle, the vinyl which it was docked having received some major damage somewhere further along its length. Not surprising, Jumper supposed, considering how close that bloody great Insidian ship had been when it came down. Fortunately, the tilt wasn't bad enough to cause a problem, and the ship was still secured upon the vine. Far more concerning was that his rifle scope had died the moment that silver sphere had fired its pulse. Its comm was dead, too. He tried hailing Victor one more time just to be sure and tapped at his data pad. Nothing. Not so much as a blip from either bits of tech. Too close to the pulse. Jumper surmised grimly, and if that was the case, it was possible, or even likely, that the whole star splinter was dead, engines and ghosting net included. Jumper tried not to think about the implications of that, just as he was trying not to think about the fate of the rest of the gang. Last he'd seen, they'd run some distance from the cube's crash point, but the resulting wave of destruction along the vines had been intense, to say the least. He badly wanted to check on them, but the surrounding air was fast filling with smoke from the smouldering vines as well as that same cinnamon-coloured dust he'd seen erupting up around the more distant crashes. Even if his scope had been working, he could barely see thirty feet from where he lay before the view was lost to a deep orange haze. The two widows Victor had held back to protect the star splinter were about all he could see of note. Both were collapsed, long mechanical legs at awkward angles and their electrics fried. The metal beasts would do them no good now. Manually unfastening the smart straps, securing him to the star splinter's loading ramp, Jumper was about to head back inside to find Victor when movement caught his eye. Three figures were emerging from the orange gloom. For a moment he dared hope it was the gang, but the bulky size of the figures quickly batted that hope away. It was a trio of insidian drones, their eyes fixed on the star splinter, as visible and vulnerable as it now was. 
Settling into a well-practiced kneeling position, Jumper aimed his bliss rifle at the three approaching brutes, finding himself grateful the weapon could still operate without electrics. The gratitude might even have been overwhelming, were it not for one unfortunate detail. He only had two darts left. When the Insidian ship thundered down, it had been Cal's intention to dive clear, but in the end he was closer to being launched. The vine they'd been running along had ruptured, causing it to buckle like a giant spring. He hadn't seen what happened to the others, but he turned twice in the air before slamming back onto the vine. And it hurt like hell, but was far better than the alternative of continuing his fall far, far lower. The vine and those around it had continued shifting for a time, fighting for a new status quo as the massive cube sank deeper. Then, after what seemed an age, all had become still. The readouts on Cal's visor had gone dark, and as he climbed to his feet, he had to fumble at the manual release to disengage his headgear. His data pad was dead too, and worst of all, his spider cuff. There were patches of dark smoke drifting overhead, and the surrounding air had become orange, almost like he'd been dropped into the middle of a weirdly tranquil sandstorm. It was enough to turn the bright suns into two pale smudges, barely discernible between the drifting patches of smoke. He could see maybe ten feet before his surroundings faded into a rusty haze. Making his way along the buckled vine, Cal called out for the others, but the only sound was the creaking of wood and the buzz of insects. It wasn't long, however, before he came across two figures. Cassius was flat on his back, unconscious, with a gash on his forehead, and a few paces beyond him, Tawny was sitting in a patch of moss. She'd already removed her headgear, but looked understandably disorientated as Cal approached. You okay, Corporal? She looked up at him, but took a moment before managing a nod. What happened? She asked, slowly looking around. Cal could understand her confusion. The hazy orange surroundings made for a peculiar setting, especially after being thrown around like a bug in a blender. That, added to the shock of seeing her teammate cut in two, would be a strain on the strongest of minds. An insidious ship crashed, Cal explained. Don't ask me how, but the sphere somehow kicked it out of the sky. And judging by that distant rumbling, it's continuing the good work, he mused. Are you hurt? Another pause, and then the corporal shook her head. Nothing I can't ignore for now. Cal held out a hand, and she allowed him to help her up. Does your help extend to battered prisoners, Harper? Cal turned to see that Cassius had come too. He was still flat on his back, but was now holding his bound wrists up in front of him. For the sake of speed, Cal wordlessly stepped over to haul the pirate up. Very gentlemanly of you, Cassius said, lifting and twisting his arms to wipe the blood from his face. Yeah, well, don't get used to it. Cal looked up through the smoky haze, trying to ascertain that position by the faint glow of the suns. The others were ahead of us. With luck, they'll already be nearing the star splinter, he said, hoping to God he was right so I suggest we don't hold them up in getting the hell off this planet. You won't get any argument from me, Cassius said. Glad to hear it. Cal unsheathed his survival knife from his thigh pack and glimpsed Tawny doing the same. Raising an eyebrow at Cassius, he jabbed the knife's point in the approximate direction of the star splinter. So, lead the way then. Groggily fumbling at its release catch, Kaya pulled her broken headgear off to find a pair of astonishingly black eyes just inches from her face. The eyes were large, but not nearly as large as they had been. As Blue backed up to give her room, she saw the rest of him was far smaller too, and his blue flesh had become muted to the point of being grey. Right, of course, she thought, blinking a few times as she tentatively raised her throbbing head. It was all coming back to her now. Finding Blue no bigger than a child and running with him in her arms, fleeing across the vine as that insidious cube had crashed down behind them. Then what? She couldn't quite remember the outcome. It had been bad, though. Bad enough to know she and Blue were lucky to be alive. The others. Panic brought her to an abrupt sitting position, causing Blue to dart a steadying hand toward her, or perhaps a restraint to stop her jumping up. They were perched within a huge split in a vine that had buckled at a steep angle, steep enough that they might both topple off if she wasn't careful. The once fruity air now tasted bitter, and a fine orange dust was floating all around them. Microspores, she realized, jolted from the abundance of fungi. 
Grasping a jagged wedge of splintered vine, Kaya slowly rose to her feet. Satisfied with her caution, Blue nodded, then said something in his strange, clicking voice. Kaya nodded back. Good idea, she replied, having identified a word among those clicks. Let's climb. The number of insidian drones littering the ground was encouraging, and by the weirdly gruesome wounds, Cal decided it must have been the work of Victor's mechanical spiders. We're getting close, he said to Tawny and Cassius, as they skirted the remains of a large bug creature that was still twitching, despite more than half of it being burned to a crisp. Sure enough, as they moved a little further through the orange haze, he spotted one of Victor's spiders collapsed on the ground. Its body was a melding of weapons, one of which had seemingly malfunctioned, resulting in the spider half melting itself. Cal noticed Cassius studying the mechanical beast with a frown, perhaps recognizing some or all of the weapons. The pirate looked like he was about to say something, likely a snide remark, when a sound made all three of them snap their heads up and peer into the haze directly ahead. An insidian drone, very much alive, was running straight at them, and he was a big bastard. Not tall, but heavily muscled. One of the few to have survived the dips, mechanical spiders, and crashing ships. Seeing no other option, Cal darted forward to meet the threat, his knife tight in his grip. Fortunately, the drone was stupid enough to launch itself at him, allowing enough space for Cal to twist aside, slashing the knife as he did so. He felt the blade cut deep, but he knew it would take a lot more than that to take this brute down. The drone rolled surprisingly nimbly to its feet, but Cassius landed a hard kick into its back, making it stumble forward and allowing Tawny the opportunity to stab at it. The corporal's knife also bit deep, but so too did the drone's claws as they raked across both her legs. She fell back with a pained yell, slashing her knife at the air to keep the claws at bay. Cal darted back in, also thrusting his blade, distracting the foe long enough for Cassius to land another kick. This time, the strike knocked it onto its hands and knees. Catching sight of the parasite on the drone's neck, Cal leapt onto its back and drove his knife into the slug-like creature with all his strength. The drone collapsed almost immediately, but taking no risks, he plunged the blade down twice more, then twisted it for good measure. It's dead, Cal said once he was sure. Breathing hard, he climbed stiffly to his feet. Nicely done, Cassius said, but the pirate was no longer close by. Cal looked up to see him backing away in the direction of the star splinter. Tawny was caught in his grip, her own knife held to her throat and injured legs dragging. Cassius indulged in one of his most wicked grins. In case you hadn't guessed, Harper, I think the corporal and I will head to the ship without you. Best of luck and all that. Cal clenched his fists and dropped his head. Shit. Orphan kings on a far-off world. If Kaya didn't know better, she could have sworn Blue had already grown a touch in the short time it had taken them to climb the mangled vine. Of course, what she knew had become a much reduced list of late. The alien had even recovered some of its blue color and vibrancy that had earned him the name. Just let me catch my breath, Kaya said as she lay on her back, chest heaving. The effects of the egg cell were starting to fade, and finally reaching an intact vine was a relief. Blue didn't look tired in the least as he nodded and turned to assess their surroundings. Friend. Blue's word was morphed around the usual series of clicks, but Kyra understood it well enough to sit up without hesitation. The alien was pointing a long finger toward what looked like a pile of sludge, bright green even amid the orange haze. Then she realized what Blue was pointing at, a pair of shifting legs sticking out from the pile. A burst of hope in her chest, Kaya was on her feet in seconds and running over to investigate. Toka, Kaya said, relief cracking her voice as she wiped away the sludge around the release to his headgear. Toka, is that you? The name rings a bell, Toka said, looking dazed as she freed his head. Thank Christ, Kaya almost laughed. Are you hurt? Nothing serious. A few cracked ribs, maybe. Bloody miracle, I reckon. Kaya scooped a handful of the sludge from his shoulder. Landing in this squished plant pulp possibly did you a favor? Probably. Yeah. With her help, Toka sat up, wincing as he pressed a hand against his ribs. He looked around at their weirdly orange surroundings, then toward Blue. 
The alien had turned away from them and appeared to be listening to that soft rumble still periodically sounding in the distance. Where's Eddie? Toker asked, frowning as he looked back to Kaya. And Cal and Tawny. Don't worry, we'll find them, she said, trying for a reassuring smile. Either that or they'll find us. Jumper made good use of his last two shots. In the end, the choice had been an easy one. Of the three drones closing in, two were swift on their feet, or at least they had been before the dart sent them crashing to the vine. The third was injured, its right leg in such a ruined mess that any living creature would have been squirming on the floor in agony. He doubted, however, that whatever insidian entity was controlling the drone was suffering or even detecting any such pain a theory backed up by the fact the leg was practically disintegrating as it continued to bolt in his direction. Jumper popped to his feet and backed up to the top edge of the loading ramp, readying himself to protect the star splinter from this unnatural bastard even if it meant a wrestling match. The drone thundered up the ramp after him, a rasping sort of roar coming from a face that appeared more like one giant hooked beak the colour of long dead bone, multiple beady black eyes inset on either side. Jumper had always taken pride in his timing and was glad not to let himself down as he ducked low and swung his rifle club-like at his opponent's mangled leg. Encouraged by the promising crunch, he swerved clear of the two hideous hooks the creature had instead of hands. Much to his dismay and surprise, however, the bastard thing still didn't go down despite its leg no longer looking fit to hold up a creature a fraction of its size. Jumper growled a curse, but instead of retreating, he lunged forward without hesitation, withdrawing his knife as he did so. The plan was for the knife to pass straight through the front of the drone's neck to find the big parasitic slug he glimpsed on the other side, but again his hopes were dashed. The creature let out another rasping roar, unimpeded by the partially buried knife in its throat, and struck Jumper with the back of one of those hooks. Jumper's vision briefly abandoned him as he flew back across the loading bay and crashed into one of the many pirate crates they'd appropriated from Hex. He was pretty sure he'd heard something pop in his knee, and the pain that seared through the joint as he tried to get up confirmed he'd heard right. Collapsing back down and trying to ignore the pain, Jumper assessed his foe. Somehow remaining upright, the creature was managing far better with one leg than he was, but its movements were definitely hampered. The listing angle of the ship was hindering it too, making its progress mercifully slow as it closed in. Slow enough for Jumper to drag himself over to the nearby pile of pirate weaponry and grab the nearest one to shoot the bastard. Nothing happened. Shit, the goddamn pulse, he remembered with a horrid sinking feeling. He grabbed another weapon on the off chance the pulse hadn't fried them all. This one spat out a sizzling glob of something, but whatever it was barely made it halfway to the drone, and considering the shuffling bastard was already close, it considered the result pretty piss poor. Another weapon. Nothing but a weird popping noise. Damn bloody tech. Jumper ground his teeth, wishing again that he hadn't shot so many darts at those winged freaks. The drone's leg finally buckled and it started dragging itself, bony hooks scratching against the metal floor. Time for one more, Jumper thought grimly as he grasped another weapon. Nothing, not even a pop or a piss-poor sizzle. With a determined grimace, he turned the useless weapon in his hands and prepared to smash his foe at least once over that grey, beak-like head. But the chance disappeared, as had the head. Exploded, quite literally. Jumper felt hot blood splattered against his face and looked up to see Victor standing nearby. His young friend was also splattered in blood, bright yellow with a thick, drool-like consistency. Sorry I'm late, the boy said with a scrunched-up apologetic sort of expression. Took a bit of a knock, he explained, pointing to his forehead. If there was indeed a wound or a bruise there, it was now concealed under the drone's thick yellow blood. Better lit than never. Jumper said, his relief palpable as he studied the device in the boy's left hand, a long white thing with two prongs at its end. He had a vague memory of seeing it before, perhaps back on Hex. Victor held the device up, then looked back at what remained of the drone. Turns out Toka was right. The thing does explode heads. Cal cursed, the anger he felt at himself twisting in his chest. This was twice he'd allowed Cassius to take a friend hostage, but unlike Eddie, Tawny didn't have a cybernetic arm at her disposal, nor was she blessed with Eddie's wild, volatile nature. In fact, the corporal's expression suggested she was teetering on the brink and close to giving up entirely. 
At least Cassius had no blaster this time, but Cal suspected he wouldn't hesitate to use that knife on Tawny's throat. How to handle it, he didn't fancy his chances of goading the man into making a mistake this time. Maybe I'll see you again, Harper, Cassius said as he dragged Tawny further away. Reminisce over our little adventure, but I very much doubt it. The pair were fading into the orange haze, and Cal hated to think what would happen if he let the man make it to the star splinter. I took your name, Cal said, loud enough that his words couldn't be mistaken. That stopped the pirate in his tracks. Callum, Cal said, risking a few steps toward them. The name was yours. Cassius's brow creased, a crack opening up in his cool demeanor, and through it a hint of something unfamiliar. Not pain, exactly, but perhaps on the road toward it. Pieces of my past have been coming back to me, Cal continued, not risking any more steps forward lest it break the hook he cast. I don't know the hows and whys. The details are still vague, just faded impressions, but they're getting clearer. Cassius said nothing, but neither did he move, not even an inch. We were friends, Cal said. The best of friends, that much I recall. More like brothers, fighting together, cheating together, laughing, orphan kings on a far-off world. Cal threw his knife down. Let her go. Let her go, and we'll all get off this fucking planet together. Then you and I can talk. He raised his open palms. Properly talk. After the orphanage, Cassius said, a touch of conflict breaching his aggression. What do you remember? Cal shook his head, trying his best to bring the memories to his mind, to make sense of the muddled images and feelings. Fragments, he said honestly. A forest planet. A hive. Sickly sweet. He risked a step forward. Whatever happened there, I'm sorry. I want to remember it, and I will with your help. Cassius didn't move, didn't speak, the knife still tight against Tawny's neck. I'm sorry, Cal repeated. He could feel genuine sorrow whispering deep within that took him by surprise. The mind's a fragile thing, especially when you're a child. Still Cassius said nothing, and Cal was finding it tough to read his expression. There was a chance he was getting through to the man, but there was just as good a chance Tawny's throat would be open simply out of spite. He mustn't forget that, mustn't lose sight of who he was dealing with. Kaya had been right, the pirate was no longer a child, he was a killer, cold and calculating. A fragile mind, Cassius said after a moment. Faded impressions, and yet you remember taking my name. His knife twitched, drawing a few drops of blood and making Tawny grimace. How is it you remember that, of all the details? Genuinely, I'm very keen to know. Cal had no answer for that. He couldn't even pinpoint a time when the particular fragment of memory had resurfaced, possibly during one of his obscure dreams and those he'd never been sure he could trust. Judging by Cassius's reaction, however, it seemed the memory was real, or at least touched on the truth. Some pieces have just resurfaced. I couldn't say why. Cal shook his head. Cassius looked about to say more, but stopped short. There was an abrupt change in the pirate's expression, and Tawny's look of fear also bumped up a notch. Those expressions alone were sufficient warning for Cal, but the sound of heavy footfall clinched it. Christ, not now. Another damn drone, coming up fast behind him. Cal dove for his discarded knife and came up with it tight in his grip. This drone, however, was seriously quick on its feet, and Cal had to fall back to avoid a spike through his chest. Not only that, but he was forced to abandon the knife in order to grasp the creature's hard, sinewy limbs as it bore down on him. Cal grunted with effort, arms already shaking with strain as his opponent slowly pressed toward him with fearsome strength, acidic breaths hissing through its jagged mouth. There were several bone-like spikes protruding from its hellish body, but the one concerning Cal the most had already breached his suit to press against the flesh of his chest. Swallowing his fear, he pushed his assailant with everything he had, but the egg cell had dwindled in his system, and the effort was barely enough to stop the spike's progress, let alone retract it. Careful not to relinquish that effort, he attempted to twist the drone sideways, but in that too the creature outmatched him. The spike punctured his skin, pressing into the muscle. Cal stared defiantly at his foe, and lifeless, pit-like eyes stared right back at him. His arms burned, the sound of that hissing breath filling his ears as the spike grated against his ribs. 
Another inch, and it would reach his pounding heart. Another inch, and he'd die. Something flashed past Cal's vision, too fleeting to make sense of, and the spike shifted slightly, making him grunt in pain. A few pounding heartbeats later, and it began to retract. The movement was slow, but it was definitely pulling away, the intense pain in his chest easing. A few strained breaths more, and Cal saw the spike's point, bright with his own blood. He shifted his head and blinked sweat from his eyes. Someone was there. Cassius. His bound wrists were looped over the drone in order to pull at its straining neck. Still bloody from the gash on his forehead, the pirate's face was filled with fierce determination, jaw locked, brow creased, and his body trembling as he continued to bend the hissing brute back. Cal's confusion was intense. Why would Cassius risk his escape and even his life to help him? Not all that long ago, he'd been the one intent on the killing. Had this chaotic expedition and that brief, muddled conversation really made such an impact? Cal had even discarded Tawny's knife in order to pull the brute away, careful to avoid that spike piercing his heart. For a few seconds, the two men caught each other's eye, a strange, intangible moment infused with the power of forgotten lifetimes and distant promises. But a moment was all the drone allowed before its hissing breath morphed into a rasping growl and it twisted away, its sinewy bulk taking Cassius with it. Cal surged up, adrenaline triggering a burst of strength and speed that should have long run dry. He lunged for his knife, which lay close. The drone roared again, and Cal spun to see it raising its spiked fists, preparing to slam them into Cassius's exposed spine. Throwing himself at it, Cal narrowly missed another spike as he wrenched the drone sideways and used his entire body weight to send it crashing down. Giving the beast no time to right itself, he thrust a kick into its back and then fell upon it with determined rage, the knife still tight in his grip. With a roar of his own, he rammed the blade down, rammed it directly at the true enemy, again and again. By the time he was done, the insidian parasite was a pulpy mess and the drone was completely still, the stolen body finally joining the long-dead mind. His breaths heaving and his heart still hammering, Cal looked up, eyes searching for Tawny. Not only was she alive, but she'd already pulled herself most of the way over to him, her injured legs dragging. Corporal, he called out. I'm okay, was all she managed, wheezing out a breath as she rolled onto her back. A bloody miracle, Cal decided as he crouched down beside Cassius. He saw a bad puncture wound in the man's side as he carefully turned him onto his back. His eyes were closed, fresh blood trickling from his mouth to mingle with that which was already dried on his face. There were two more puncture wounds in his chest, not unlike the one Cal himself had been seconds away from suffering. Would have suffered if it weren't for Cassius's intervention. For any normal human, the wounds would have meant instant death. But Cassius wasn't normal. He was far from it. Shaking from the adrenaline, Cal put his hand against the man's neck. He could barely register a pulse, but it was there, and already the survival suit was releasing its chemical matrix to provide a temporary seal over the injuries. Why did he save you? Tawny asked, remaining on her back, but turning enough to look at Cal. Cal just shook his head, any answer evading him, let alone a good one. He felt suddenly drained, both mentally and physically, exhausted to the point he questioned whether he'd even be able to stand. He knew he would, though. He had to. Had to find just a bit more fight to ensure they got away from this damn planet and those fucking insidians. To ensure his friends were safe. Trying to work some life into his limbs, he continued to stare at Cassius. Were long forgotten friends on that list too? A killer who'd inexplicably saved his life. An unwelcome sound swept the questions and confusion aside. He had more footfall. Swift and heavy. Too heavy to be human. The sound of it threatened to stomp the last of Cal's fight back down into the dirt. Despite his determination, he stumbled as he rose to his feet, his grip on the knife suddenly feeling weak. As he turned, however, what he saw immediately wiped the snarl from his face. Not only that, but if he wasn't so exhausted and full of conflict, he might have even found it in himself to smile. Feckin' Heck Jareth's men littered the ground. Some were dead, but most were either unconscious or immobilized, groaning and shifting in pain. 
The remaining two that weren't had their hands raised and were backing away. Jareth himself was on his knees by the elevator, his head slumped. Both of his pistols were abandoned, the poisonous bullets having run dry. There was an impressive bruise on his jaw from Becker's punch that his snake tattoo was slithering around in rhythmic circles. Can't believe we won! Becker looked towards Shep. Its already mangled face looked as though it had taken a few hits from a shock stick and was now more bloody and swollen than ever. By some miracle, though, his blonde, flat-top hair was as immaculate as ever, to the point Becker had to wonder whether some sort of invisible force shield was protecting it. After such a supremely chaotic fight, it was a miracle that none of their little gang had been killed. Now gathered together, Becker saw a multitude of cuts and bruises on all of them, but nothing life-threatening. A guardian angel had saved them from that fate. Looking at Clara now, Becca saw she'd done much of the saving by drawing Jareth's fire. Her clothes and face showed multiple signs of bullet wounds, if wounds was even a fitting word. No doubt the poison would be harmless to her, and already the damage was healing, a strange gum helping to reseal the synth flesh. How the hell an elite synthetic soldier had ended up here in this situation had to be a weird and unlikely tale, but a synthetic soldier was definitely what she was. Perhaps a far cry from others Becca had encountered, but there was nothing else she could be. Looking at her made Becca's head hurt, that and being swatted by a merciless slaughter bot. She had so many questions that, for the sake of her sanity, she decided to ignore them all, at least for the time being. What we gonna do with him? She looked again at Shep, who was staring toward Jareth. It took her buzzing brain a moment to translate the man's words, but it was a good question. What the hell were they going to do with Jareth? The murderous young man had dragged Anton's body from the elevator and was kneeling beside him, staring down with an unreadable expression. Becca looked around at the rest of the group. Both Donnie and Donna had their eyes fixed on Jareth, not trusting that he wasn't about to do something evil, which was an entirely reasonable stance. Jim was staring at Clara, mouth hanging open and looking as though he'd never even heard of a synthetic, let alone seen one. In his defense, the synth tech was relatively new, and this one appeared far from the norm, not least her strange, scraggly hair that hung limp on one side of her head. Then there was the deception. Whatever the reasons for it, she'd done it well, and fooled them all completely. Feng was also staring at Clara, looking like he couldn't quite settle on one expression. Extreme gratitude, deep suspicion, or plain old bewilderment. He also looked like he had a barrage of questions, but just like Becca, exhaustion was keeping them at bay. Lastly, Becca turned to Franco. Ignoring both Clara and Jareth, he was staring back at the two chrome ships, their sleek forms standing tall at the end of the dock. As if sensing the attention, he turned to her with a questioning expression that she read all too well. Why the hell weren't they already on those fucking ships and getting the hell off this rock? It was a valid question, and she couldn't deny that a few pain patches from Fang's med bays might be nice right about now. Didn't mean to kill him. Jareth's unexpected statement drew the attention of every one of them, including Franco. All got a bit crazy, though, the young man admitted in a mumbling, almost sulky sort of voice. Seeing him slump next to Anton's body and hearing his sad words brought about a strange and frankly unwelcome pang of sorrow in Becca. I'm sorry it came to this, she said despite her better judgment, and I'm sorry I was forced to kill your sister. Jareth looked up then, focusing on no one in particular, quite as though they were all interchangeable in his mind. Jade, he said, as if he'd already forgotten that little detail. Right, yeah, her death did sting a bit. I have to admit that, but I'll get over it. No doubt there, she was a bossy bitch, I fucking know it all. Each of his statements was getting louder and decidedly less sad, that familiar aggression seeping into the gap. Becca felt her sorrow quickly dying a death. Jareth stared back down at Anton's body, sucking on his teeth as if thinking it through. But the club's mine now, every last fucking inch of it, mine to do as I fucking please. He let out a short laugh, slim shoulders jerking. So, silver linings and all that. Becca clenched her jaw, any inkling of potential forgiveness dying a death too. Probably would have killed her myself eventually, Jareth recklessly continued, either unaware or uncaring that his life was now in their hands. 
Yeah, can run it how I want, spice it up a bit. She was always too fucking soft, kill people way too quick. He reached forward to nudge Anton's corpse, idly poking at the dark poison marks on his neck. I might miss this one, though. Kept me on my toes, kept me entertained. Pushed me too fucking far, though, didn't he? No way I could let him live after that. Jareth looked up at them all again, a hawkish scowl forming on his face. I'm gonna find it hard to forgive you bastards, too, releasing all my fighters like that. But I'll get most of them back, and can always get more. The scowl became a sharp grin that he shared around, as if expecting them to take appreciation in it. There's always more losers, plenty more fuckers who deserve a beating. Becca couldn't quite wrap her head around how the young psychopath could be so deluded, to assume they were simply going to let him go. But then what were their options? There were no authorities, not up here at any rate, not any more, and there was no way in hell they were taking him back down. So what? She couldn't kill him in cold blood. She'd had enough killing for one day, enough for a lifetime. She looked toward Franco, but he appeared even more tired than her, hunched over and looking like he might never straighten up again. Not only that, but you screwed up my slaughter bot, Jareth spat. You any idea how many fucking credits that thing cost me? He shook his head fiercely, as if the action might have the power to reverse time. Then his narrowed eyes fell on Clara. Knew I should have wiped your brain first chance I got, or whatever the fuck you since have in your heads. I see that trader again, he'll be meeting a silver bullet. Sly bastard, dangling you at me. Was just too fucking tempting, though. Just too fu- Jareth's words sounded like something had sucked them back down into his lungs. His body had suddenly convulsed, hard enough that he almost flipped himself over, legs bucking and back arching. Then he began to writhe, noises bubbling from his contorted mouth that Becca guessed were curses. Good aim, wife. Becca looked toward Donny, then down at Donna, who was sitting at his feet, resting her injured leg. The zapper Becca had given her was firmly in the woman's grip, still buzzing from its discharge. Thank you, husband. Becca raised her brow in surprise. That was the first time Donna had uttered a word, and there was anger threaded there that would never have been discerned from such a passive and gentle face. Get me up, Donna said, boldly doubling her word count. Donnie didn't hesitate and grasped her under the armpits to haul her upright. Then, knowing her intentions like any good husband should, he supported much of her weight as the pair of them hobbled toward Jareth. The young man's convulsions had eased, but his pained groan suggested he wasn't a fan of the zapper. Smart, doesn't it? Donna said, and with Donnie's continued support, she reached down and grasped Jareth's collar. With impressive strength that seemed to match that of her husband, she hauled the struggling young man to his knees, ignoring his silver nails as they dug into her wrist, even as they drew blood. She also ignored his threats and spit-flinging curses as she and her husband patiently made their way toward the edge of the platform, Donna dragging the writhing young man every awkward step of the way. Becca watched with conflicted feelings. In her present physical and mental state, she didn't have it in her to deal with Jareth herself especially seeing him unarmed and looking so pathetic. But she didn't have it in her to save him either. And did she even have the right? Donna and Donnie had been in Jareth and Jade's company far longer than she had, who knew what horrors they'd suffered. My cousins are coming! Jareth screamed as he struggled to break free, silver-tipped boots scraping and clacking against the metal deck. Even his snake tattoo was in a raging panic, darting and squirming across his skin in a perfect reflection of the young man's state. Coming for you! Coming for all of you! Becca glanced toward the two elevators, which, according to Feng, were the only access to this dock. Both were still there, doors wide open. If these cousins were indeed coming, it seemed they were going to be a tad late. They'll kill you! I'll kill you! You hear me, bitch? I'll fucking kill you! I'll slash you up, you damn bitch! Jareth's last raging expletive morphed into a long, terrified cry as Donna flung him over the platform's edge. The action had a casual sort of quality to it, like she'd simply strolled from her home to toss away some trash. The cry lasted for some time, getting quieter and quieter as Jareth plummeted further and further. Then there was silence the whole gang standing stock still. Nicely done, my love, Donnie said eventually. Donna replied with one of her sweet smiles, reverting to her silence as if the spattering of words she'd managed were quite enough for one year. Feckin' heck, 
Jim said. Fucking hell, Shep agreed. Fang nodded, scratched his chin, then cleared his throat. Well, that's that then, I suppose. Pulse Kyra and Toka's relief at making it back to the Star Splinter had been short-lived, and once they discovered Cal, Eddie, and Tawny were yet to return. Where the hell are they? Toka asked, his words more like a wheeze as he sat on the Star Splinter's loading ramp and clutched his ribs. You think they got lost in the haze? Kaya thought that the most optimistic of outcomes, but couldn't bring herself to voice the alternatives. She also couldn't bring herself to leave the vine and step onto the Star Splinter's loading ramp, as if that simple step might seal Cal, Eddie, and Tawny's fate. She looked to Jumper, who was leaning against the open hatch, keeping the weights off his injured leg as he peered hopefully into the dusky orange air. Are those weapons working? She asked him, indicating the small pile of pirate weaponry gathered at his feet. Jumper nodded. As far as we can tell. Okay, hand me a couple and I'll go find them. Right, and I'll go with you, Toka said as he struggled to his feet. Me too, Victor said. The boy had emerged just in time to overhear the conversation. He was carrying a fresh pack of bliss darts that he handed to Jumper. Kaya shook her head. Let's not waste time arguing, she said, predicting the direction this was heading. Toka, your ribs are in bad shape. Jumper, your leg is screwed. And Victor, you need to try and get the ship back up and running or none of us will be going anywhere. I'll go alone and bring them back as quickly as I can. Kaya glanced toward Blue, who was standing on the vine a dozen paces from the ramp. Thankfully, the alien had continued to recover more of his stature, to the point he was now as tall as she was. As adamant and fired up as Kaya felt, she couldn't deny the silent hope that Blue would join her. Those big black eyes, however, were fixed on the flashes and ominous shapes in the far distance, occasionally glimpsed now the smoke was thinning and the spore clouds were sinking lower. He showed no indication he'd even heard her, let alone was preparing to join the search. Kaya's right. Jumper said, cutting off Toka's continued objections as he scooped up a couple of the pirate weapons and hobbled down the ramp. We'll only slow her down. He handed the weapons to Kaya and unslung his bliss rifle from his shoulder. The haze is clearing. I'll be able to cover you soon. He clicked a fresh mag of darts into the trusty weapon and gave it a pat. Thanks, Kaya said, attaching one of the pirate weapons to her hip pack and hefting the other. Hopefully I... Wait! The word had come from Blue, loud and clear enough to snatch their attention. He'd finally turned from the distant Insidian ships and was now staring dead ahead, almost as if he could see straight through the haze. Wait, he repeated, the word ringing out amid soft clicks. Falling silent, they all stared ahead, trying to discern any movement. I see them, Victor shouted, his young eyes identifying the forming shapes just a couple of seconds before the others. Shaggy was easy to identify, his hulking frame and four-legged gait making the big cat hard to mistake. The figure running next to the cat seemed an odd shape at first, until Kaya realized it was Cal carrying someone. Jumper snapped his rifle up to cover them. Eddie and Tawny are on the cat's back, he said as he peered through his sights. Kaya was about to run to their aid when Blue let out an ear-splitting cry, loud enough she almost fell over with fright. The sound set alarm bells ringing, but she quickly realized it was the same far-reaching call the alien had made previously. I think there was another hail to his silver friend, Toka said, hands hovering close to his ears in case Blue did it again. Time to go home, Kai thought hopefully. Assuming we can fly, that is. She turned to Victor. I'm on it, the boy said without her needing to voice the question. He looked far from confident, but there was determination in his voice as he turned and made for the flight deck. With that, Kaya set off down the ramp to help Cal. The elation Cal felt at seeing the rest of his friends alive and well was just the boost he needed to give his failing legs strength. He was beyond exhausted, and Cassius's dead weight across his shoulders was almost too much to bear. The man had remained unconscious, and Cal suspected he might have fallen into some sort of coma. Running next to him, Shaggy showed no such weakness, despite having both Eddie and Tawny riding his back. Cal had tried to instruct the cat to run on ahead, but only Eddie had any chance of influencing the beast, and with the injuries she'd sustained, she was barely conscious. Cal heard Blue make that same alien call he'd made earlier. 
The sound wasn't pleasant, but its meaning gave him another mental boost. With luck, the silver sphere would help them get the hell away from all this madness. Run for a few more, Cal asked as Kai ran over to help him. Absolutely, Kai said as she tried to help bear Cassius's weight. But don't raise your hopes just yet. Cal grimaced, Kaya's words confirming what he already feared. The star splinter was dead in the water. All of them making it to the ship meant nothing if they remained stuck on the planet with the Insidians looming. Seeming to know what to do, Shaggy ran straight up the loading ramp without hesitation. To Jumper's credit, he didn't so much as flinch as the big cab passed him, just kept his bliss rifle at the ready in case of unwanted pursuers. No power at all. Cal asked once they'd made it up the ramp and Kai had helped him lay Cassius down within the loading bay. None, Jumper confirmed as he kept a sharp eye on the hazy outside world. Victor's up on the flight deck working on it. Kaya moved to help Tawny off Shaggy's back as the big cat instinctively crouched down on his haunches. Careful with Eddie, Cal said. She's in bad shape. I got her. Toka said, his broken ribs and fear of giant felines all but forgotten as he gently lifted Eddie off the cat's broad back and laid her down. The girl's eyes were open, but she looked a touch delirious. You okay, Ed? Toka asked as he cracked open a pain patch and pressed it to her neck. Think I broke a few things, she said, her voice strained. Fell pretty far. Shaggy found me. It was clear they needed to get her into one of the black healing tanks. Cassius, too. But with no power, they wouldn't even be able to get the tanks open, let alone run the required breathing apparatus. The familiar sound of Jumper's bliss rifle drew both Cal and Kai's attention. Quickly, they joined him at the open hatch. Another two drones were sprawled upon the craggy vine, and Jumper was already aiming at a third. Finally moving up the ramp, Blue swept past them to enter the loading bay, sounding a series of sharp clicks as he went. There, Cal said, pointing into the distance. It was the sphere, the orange spores having sunk enough for it to be seen relatively clearly. At the speed it was travelling, it would reach them in seconds. But it wasn't alone. One of the Insidian ships was in pursuit, and beyond that, another was rising out of the mangled vines, apparently recovered from the sphere's disabling attack. Christ, that really didn't bode well. As it neared, the sphere didn't slow in its approach, and they had to dodge out of its path as it zipped straight through the open hatch. Cal turned to see the sphere already hovering at Blue's side. How the hell it had come to such a sudden stop, he had no clue. Before anyone could say or do anything more, the sphere emitted another pulse. Cal felt his nerves buzz, igniting a sort of rush through him as the surrounding air quivered. The star splinter ignited too, jolted back to life as if the sphere had shocked its machine heart. Lights blinked on and consoles activated, full of encouraging beeps. But best of all was the familiar hum of the ship's thrusters and slip drive powering up. Without wasting a breath, Cal thumped the controls of the loading bay door and glimpsed more running drones as it raised. Not a moment too soon. A large hollow projection had also sprung to life at the far end of the loading bay, replicating what appeared to be the view of the Star Splinter's flight window. Everyone okay? Victor's hurried voice was loud and clear through the loading bay's speakers. His eyes fixed on the hollow projection, Jumper lurched over to the nearest comm. Get us the hell out of here, kid. I'm trying. The thrusters need time to... The sphere pulsed again, drowning out Victor's reply as the hum of the thrusters increased dramatically. Victor blurted a joyous curse. Never mind, we're good to go. Better make it fast, Toka shouted as he thrust a finger at the looming insidian ship that was quickly filling the hollow projection. That bastard thing's gonna fire at us. Barely had Toka shouted the warning when a flash of green erupted from the center of the cube. But the star splinter was already moving, taking off fast enough to overwhelm the inertia stabilizers and make them all stumble. The sphere emitted another pulse, and again they all stumbled as the stabilizers tried to compensate for the dramatic increase in speed. Then the slip drive engine kicked in, vibrating up through the deck. Another awe-filled curse bursting through the comm confirmed what Cal already suspected. The sphere had helped push them through the planet's atmosphere, faster than the best of human engineers could ever dream. We clear, kid, Jumper asked after a few moments. Yeah, Victor said, sounding almost breathless. Yeah, we're good. You sure? Toker asked. Yeah, we're definitely clear. 
You're absolutely sure? Tucker said. Because you've said you're sure before and... Would you bloody relax? The boy snapped through the comm. If I wasn't a hundred percent sure, I would say I'm pretty sure. But when I say I'm sure without the pretty, that means I'm totally sure, okay? So just chill. I'm completely sure that we're one hundred percent safe. Tucker looked around at the others, his expression decidedly unsure. And not only that... Victor continued, but we're moving really fast, faster than should be possible. Even without the ghosting net, they'd be hard-pressed to find us now. I don't know what that sphere did, but I'm looking forward to finding out. Cal looked at the sphere. It was notably less bright and was bobbing slightly in the center of the loading deck, giving the impression it needed to sink to the floor and rest. Blue had moved close and was again conversing with it. After a moment, the alien turned to them to voice a single word. Safe. Only then did Toka finally relax. We made it, he said, letting out a short, hysterical sort of laugh. Somehow we bloody well made it. Burning Questions Considering they barely knew each other, Becker had been surprised by the level of emotion when the group had said their goodbyes. Their eagerness to leave Chalice City and all its corrupt and perilous ways, however, had made the farewell a short-lived thing. True to his word, Feng had gifted Becker and Franco a ship and quickly coded it to their DNA. Clara had shown no hesitation in her preference to remain with Becker and Franco. As for the others, Feng had offered them the opportunity to accompany him to the central pleasure city of Drassai in the tropical region of Galdeon Pearl. Once there, he promised to set them up with luxurious quarters and a choice of well-paid jobs. Becker had also made them an offer, to ride to the nearest military base, starship or outpost, if such things still existed, with a view to join the ongoing, possibly futile struggle, whatever that might be, and fight the good fight in whatever capacity suited them best. They'd all chosen to go with Feng. And so Becker, Franco and the mysterious Clara had boarded their new ship alone. Struggling to even walk, Franco had wasted no time heading for the med bay, making it clear he'd be stopping by the drinks bar en route, which Feng had assured was well stocked. The corporal looked like he'd never hack a security system again for as long as he lived, or at least until he next got into serious trouble, which was really a long wait. If she was smart, Becca would have followed him straight to the med bay. Her smashed arm was in agony and her ribs were a close second but she was keen to prep the ship for departure first, keen to finally get the hell off this planet, or at least out of the city's dome. Also, the questions piling up in her head regarding Clara were starting to burn worse than her injuries, and she wanted at least some of them answered before departure. So, I'm guessing you were locked in one of Jareth and Jade's high security cells, Becca said as she and Clara entered the ship's central elevator and the door slid smoothly shut. That D-cell that appeared empty. I was, Clara admitted, her voice calm. And then you began your act. That was quite some deception. Clara appeared to consider her words as the elevator ascended toward the flight deck, the life in her eyes completely at odds with the inhuman acts she demonstrated on the dock. I've learned from recent experiences that it's best not to trust until it's been earned. Earned? Yes, Clara said without hesitation. Humans like to talk of scales of grey, but I've encountered plenty with souls as black as night, and it's not always obvious who they are. Character veils can take time to see through. Pretty damn poetic for a machine, Becca thought, weighing up the synthetic's words as she tried to decide exactly what she was. She'd encountered synthetics before in the military, but those were a world away from what stood before her now, certainly as far as any sort of personality was concerned. Perhaps she was an upgraded version. I also have much learning to do, Clara continued, so for now I find it simpler to play a role. Well, you played it well, Becca said, an edge to her tone that she struggled to hide. She could partially understand the logic of the explanation, but still didn't feel comfortable having been duped. As the elevator came to a smooth stop, they were presented with the sleekest and shiniest flight deck Becca had ever stepped foot in. She shuffled straight for the main console and wasted no time activating the flight controls. Screens sprang to life with a soft hum and glow. My story's complicated, Clara elaborated, seeming to read Becca's expression. Revealing it would have caused confusion and lengthy explanations that we'd had no time for. We had been time-pressured, 
Becca admitted to herself as she looked back to study the woman, if woman was even an appropriate term. In truth, Clara looked no different from before, other than the fast healing wounds and the fact she was standing noticeably straighter, and of course there was the sudden change in skin complexion. The green-tinted skin was a particularly effective trick. Clara remained silent for a moment, perhaps detecting that the Chaka sickness deception had touched a nerve. Considering the situation and location, it struck me as an obvious way to appear unthreatening, also to give my role authenticity. And the limp, and hair loss, Becca asked, noting that those hadn't simply been reversed like the green skin. Both real? Real? Yes, I lost a fight. Becca failed to hide her surprise at that, wondering what sort of brutal beast could have gotten the best of this synthetic. She tapped a few controls to activate the nav readouts. And what, um... Becca lost her train of thought. The questions were piling up fast in her brain, all jockeying for position, and a shake of her head only made her dizzy and muddled them further. Once the dizziness eased, she took a slow breath and determinedly plucked another from the jumbled pile. The freight elevators, could you not have at least helped with those? Clara's brow creased, such a human response that Becca had to wonder whether she was still playing a role. The doors were too solid in their construction for me to force open. There was a time I might have been able to manipulate the security using my hair, but... Your hair? Seriously? Yes. Unfortunately, damage from the fight I spoke of robbed me of that advantage too. It's fair to say I'm not performing at my best. If I was, I could have dealt with that N-12 robot more efficiently. Well, I wouldn't be too down on yourself, Becca said, wondering what more efficient might look like over and above what she'd witnessed. She took another slow breath, feeling these answers and revelations were only confusing her more. At least the flight console appeared relatively user-friendly as she familiarized herself with some of the readouts. Clara joined her in studying the console. I know that trust goes both ways she continued, perhaps sympathetic to Becca's confusion, and that I too have to earn yours, but for what it's worth I can assure you I would have revealed myself sooner had it proved necessary or beneficial. Despite a lingering bitterness, Becca believed that, or at least mostly. She thought back to the moment she and Franco had found Fang amongst Jareth's unconscious goons, clearly Clara's work, but the synthetic woman had been curled up by the doorway, appearing terrified. Should she not have revealed herself then? Or was she right? Perhaps lengthy explanations would only have delayed them further and confused matters. Still, Becca couldn't help wondering if there was more to it. Clara spoke of the need to learn. Was immersing herself in a role a part of that? A method to expand her education? Learning required experience, and for her to gain new experience, roles were perhaps a necessity. A way to gain intimate knowledge of a genuine human experience. Becca sighed inwardly. If it were true, it made trust a slippery thing. But she also reminded herself that the woman had just saved all their lives, and in quite a spectacular fashion. Becca was eager to ask more, so much more, but her injuries were throbbing worse than ever, increasingly angry at the lack of attention, and another wave of dizziness hit, intense enough that Clara had to reach out to steady her. Your questions can wait the synthetic woman said, the concern in her eyes seeming so real. There's much I can tell you, and I promise I will, but for now I think you need to join your friend in the med bay. You're probably right, Becker admitted with a wince, as soon as I get us out of the city's dome. You're in no state for that, Clara said a little more sternly. You need meds and rest. I'll prep the ship for departure. Becker wanted to argue the point, but another dizzying wave shoved the words back down her throat. Obviously, her trust of the synthetic woman was going to have to begin early. Okay, I'd appreciate that. Do you need help getting to the med bay? No, I'll be fine. Clara stared at her for a moment, as if weighing up that answer. Well, go slowly. Becca almost laughed. Not much choice there. Just one last question, though. What do I call you? Clara doesn't seem a likely name for a lethal synthetic soldier. Clara smiled at that. My name's Melinda. Seriously? Melinda? Yes. Huh. Fortunately, the synthetic woman didn't take any obvious offense at Becca's reaction, and, if anything, looked amused. Becca took another deep breath, and feeling a bit steadier, headed relatively smoothly toward the elevator. Oh, Melinda, 
she said, stiffly turning. I have a brief stop I need to make before we leave the planet, so if you could let me know once we're out of the dome. Demonstrating one last human reaction, Melinda appeared quizzical, but with a gentle shrug, she nodded her understanding. Kiss Thank God for Feng's riches, Becca thought as she entered the med bay, shuffling across the gleaming floors and past sleek glass cabinets, all filled with neat rows of meds. Her body was truly letting her know what a mess she'd made of it, pain hampering her every step, not to mention the ongoing dizziness. It had forced her to take several pauses on the way from the flight deck to ensure she hadn't passed out. At times, she wasn't convinced she'd make it. Franco was at the far end of the room, sat on the edge of a megcot with his back to her. He was partially silhouetted against a large oval window, through which the strengthening sun had met a blanket of wispy clouds, setting the sky alight with vivid pinks and reds. That's quite a view, Becca said, steadying herself on the cot in order to navigate around it. If only every sunrise could be this spectacular. And this long-lasting, Franco said, a sort of melancholy to his voice as he continued to take it in. You're doing okay? He asked once she'd made it around to sit somewhat clumsily beside him. Not really, but I could definitely be worse. Franco smiled and passed her a palm-sized device. Found this smart sling for your arm. Thank Christ, Becca said. Gratefully accepting it, she tore away enough of her grimy T-shirt to fix the device to her left shoulder. The smart fabric snaked down her arm to support it, and the relief was close to immediate as it sent both chemicals and energy frequencies seeping into her flesh. Never had slings this good in the military. The pain patches are top-notch too, Franco said, passing her a couple for her ribs. Seems Feng spared no expense on his ships. This one's our ship, Becca reminded him. Franco gave no answer to that which struck Becker as strange given his love for expensive things that he didn't have to pay for. Also strange with the unopened bottle of liquor that lay discarded on the cot. You're not opening that? Franco didn't so much as glance at the bottle. Made efforts to find that damn thing, but once I got here it suddenly seemed unappealing. I guess I'm getting all I need from this long sunrise. And now your company. Becca should have been overjoyed to hear that, or at least laughed at it. Instead, it made her strangely uneasy. She noted how he was still hunching over, despite being sat down with the benefit of multiple pain patches. You look like you could sleep for a week. Franco just stared at the view in silence, the warm light bathing his skin. There was a peaceful air about him, a tranquil expression that Becca found unfamiliar. I'll be sleeping a while longer than that he said after a time. Something in his tone turned Becca's unease to fear as she turned to study him more closely. How badly are you injured? He didn't answer, just gave a sad, apologetic sort of smile. Becca reached for his collar, which was hiked up under his chin, and pulled it down. Christ, Franco! The same marks that had covered Anton's skin were crawling up his neck like hungry, dark tendrils. Shock overriding her dizziness, Becca lurched up off the cot. Her fumbling movements were frantic as she undid and pulled at his shirt with her good hand, hunting for the source of the poison. By the time she found it, her heart was thumping. There was little more than a scrape across his ribs, an injury that would have been shrugged off had a normal bullet caused it. But it hadn't been a normal bullet. Far from it. Becca's mind span at the consequences of how Father Marks had spread. When? When did you get hit? Same time as the kid, Franco said, his voice reflecting that apologetic smile. Caught me while I was trying to hack the elevator. The way that little nutcase was shooting, I'm surprised we all didn't get a bullet. Christ, Becca repeated. Anger was swelling in her chest, pushed along by desperation and confusion as she looked around the room at all the equipment. All this expensive fucking shit and no bloody damn medbot. Guess the rich never stray far from the safety of their plush colonies. Franco was calm, which only fueled Becca's anger. How hadn't she noticed it? She'd assumed all the damn hacking had caused his exhaustion. She should have seen it. Why the hell didn't you say anything? She said, trying her best not to yell. You'd have insisted on getting to a hospital. Too fucking right I would have. 
we'd have all ended up dead, or as good as. You don't know that. Becca's throat was starting to constrict, to the point it was a struggle to get her words out. Franco shrugged, wincing a little as he did so. Was it pretty safe, Bet? Just being realistic. There was that damn line again, but the context was now turned on its head, adding to Becca's confusion. A host of other emotions were starting to drown her anger as the full realization took hold. God damn it, Franco. You should have told me, she said, feeling the sting of tears. Should have fucking told me. Franco shook his head, still calm. I know you, Bex. If I'd said something, you'd have insisted, gone against all reason and done something reckless. Probably even tried to drag me to a hospital solo. Her legs weak, Becca sagged against the cot and dropped her head. Damn it. God damn it. She looked up to stare at him, vision blurred and hands trembling. His gaze was steady as he met hers. Couldn't have you risking yourself for me. Not again. That's what we do. That's all we do. She wanted to scream the words at him, but in the end failed to even whisper them. He managed a weak shrug. Don't get me wrong. I'm still a self-centered asshole. I might just sacrifice an army to save my own hide. But not you, Bex. I promised myself. Never again. What the hell's so special about me? Everything. Franco sounded surprised the question had to be asked. You're incredible, in every way. I've never thought that about anyone else. Never felt it. Not even close. Becca shook her head, confused and caught between wanting to scream and sob. What are you saying? Franco stared at her, silent for a moment, as if searching for well-hidden words. I'm saying that you're the only person I've ever truly loved in this entire godforsaken existence. The single glowing light in my dim and mediocre life. He let out a breath as if surprised he'd actually said it. You, Bex, ever since we met, it's always been you. Becca shook her head again, not sure what to say, not sure what to even think. There had been times she'd suspected there was something, but not this, not love. You never said anything, she managed. Never did anything. Her vision blurred as she stared at him. Never even tried for so much as a kiss. I wanted to. So many times I wanted to. He smiled at her, a gentle, understanding sort of smile. But we both know I'm not your type. I'm a long way from your type. Becca wanted to reply, but she had no answer for him. Franco looked back through the window, staring at the sunlight as if he needed it to help him continue. Besides... I'm a cheat, a drunk, I sleep around just to numb myself to the fact. Even if the fates had deemed me your type, I... He shook his head. We've all got demons, Becca said, her voice barely audible. She wanted to tell him he was wrong, that beneath that thin, troubled lair he was the best of men. She believed it, too. This sacrifice alone was proof enough. But all that came were more emotions, twisting her up, a deep ache making words an impossible thing. Sorry, Franco said, truly sounding so. Probably shouldn't have confessed all that. Just had to set it free, before my chance is gone forever. Becca wanted to fight the grief building up in her, wanted to punch, kick, and grapple it into submission. But the last ounce of fight had left her, and in the end, she had no choice but to surrender utterly to it. Hey, don't get all weepy on me, Franco said, trying to chase away her tears and sounding ashamed he'd been the cause. You might be number one, but I'm still a close number two. A small laugh escaped through Becca's tight throat as she did her best to give him a smile. But it was hard, hurt even. She took a deep, shuddering breath, trying again to pull herself together. You're a fucking arsehole, Corporal, she managed, voice all quivery. Yes, Sarge, I know. Another laugh escaped, forcing its way through all that thick emotion. Then the two of them sat in silence for a time, gazing through the window, losing themselves in the depths of the skies, all those bright shafts of light breaking through the melting clouds. Never thought I'd want to die on this rock, Franco said eventually. But up here... 
above all the grime and corruption, away from all that meaningless chaos. Doesn't seem too bad. Pretty far from it. You're not going to die. Becca tried her best to sound full of steady confidence, but knew she came closer to a confused child desperately struggling to understand it all. I need you, she said, her voice brittle. I can't do this alone, and I don't even know what this is, no fucking clue. A part of Becca wanted to blurt out that she was dying too, that he wasn't the only one with poison corrupting his veins, that maybe they should just end it together, leap from the mortal coil arm in arm. But she couldn't do it. It simply wasn't in her for it to ever be more than a thought, a fleeting temptation. Whatever's waiting for you out there, Bex, I know you'll handle it. You're smart and tough, and you're a survivor, just like I always said. Becca nodded, wishing she shared his confidence. She took another breath, slow and deep. A soft, humming vibration had started, enough to be felt through the cot. Melinda had finished prepping the ship and fired up the engines. The sound kick-started something in Becca, and she resolutely wiped the wetness from her eyes with her good arm. Screw this. We're both survivors, and we'll bloody well handle it together. Lifting a leg, she turned more fully toward him. Look at all the shit we've been through, all the fights we've landed ourselves in, the far-flung weird-ass planets we've been on, all that we've endured. We'll get to another colony. The ship's ready, and it's a fast one, damn fast. I'll patch you up, cover you head to toe in pain patches if I have to. She stood up, jaw set, and looked again around the room. And there's bound to be some potent nutri clamps and immune boosters in here. We'll get to some other colony, some other place, get you well. It's doable. Franco nodded, but it seemed a strain. That an order, Sarge. Yes, it fucking is. Okay. Sounds like a good one. Squeezing his eyes shut, he grimaced as he shifted himself around in order to lie on the cot. Becca moved to help him, supporting his head as best she could with her good arm. I want you conserving every last ounce of strength, she said, trying to infuse her voice with confidence and optimism. Do it well, and you might just get that kiss you're after. Franco raised his brow at that. Sounds wonderful, but I suspect that's just the pain meds talking. Only way to find out is to behave yourself. I was never great at that, but then I was never good at ignoring booze either. He stiffly elbowed the unopened bottle further from him, and, with a difficult smile, turned his head to glance toward a set of unopened glass cabinets. Perhaps check over there, see what other gems Feng supplied us with. Find more of those pain patches, and you might just remain my favorite person in the galaxy. Becca didn't hesitate, moving as fast as her broken body would allow as she forced her buzzing mind to focus on the task at hand. The neat racks were clearly labeled and blessedly easy to search. There was a good range and enough to last them weeks. For now, she just grabbed a handful of pain patches and a couple of immune boosters. We're in luck, she announced, turning and beginning to shuffle back toward him. We'll be spending the journey high as kites. Franco didn't answer. He just lay on the cot, the brightening sunlight highlighting the dust motes settling gently around him. Silent and still. Becca stopped, unsteady on her feet, as she dropped the meds to the smooth floor. Franco was turned away from the window, turned away from the dawning of the new day, his unblinking eyes fixed on her, the choice he'd made as his life had drifted away. It made her want to cry, made her want to drop to her knees and curl up in anguish. But she pushed the tears away and stayed on her feet, finding the strength to cross the floor and move close to him. His skin was still warm as she laid a hand on the side of his face. Then she felt his neck to confirm what she already knew. There was a peaceful, contented look about him, one that had been sorely missing when he'd been living, and it was helping to bring about a sense of peace of her own. Very likely, she brushed his eyelids closed. I love you too, she said quietly, and leaned over to give him that promised kiss. Safe journey, my friend. I'll see you soon. Connected I reckon he might have had his fill, Toka said, as Blue finally settled down in the med bay and took a seat at one of the work tables. Cal suspected his young friend might be right and realized this was the first time he'd seen Blue actually sit down. It was about time, too. 
Once they'd secured Eddie, Tawny, and Cassius in the healing tanks, they'd spent a good hour following the alien as he explored the ship, moving from room to room and deck to deck, all the while laying his hands on various surfaces and objects, no doubt reading the energies within them in his unique way. Occasionally, he would communicate with the sphere as it followed close behind, an exchange usually concluding with the sphere beaming a light at whatever object was being studied. During the exploration, Blue had recovered more of his stature and now stood as tall as Cal. He'd also recovered enough vibrant color to do justice to his name, that subtle glow once again emanating from his strange flesh. The sphere had regained a little of its brightness too, but not much. Perhaps the little machine would require more time to recuperate from its astonishing efforts against the Insidians. Sensing and hoping they wouldn't be moving again any time soon, Cal pulled out a chair for Jumper, who happily settled into it with his injured leg out straight. Then, with Kyra and Toka doing likewise, he flopped into one himself. There was a fair bit of sighing as weight was taken off sore feet and aching legs. The only one who didn't sit was Victor. Despite having suffered a blow to the head, the boy was looking light on his feet, his eyes rarely deviating from the hovering sphere as if he were looking at some long-worshipped god in solid form. Hearing a sleepy growl from Shaggy, Cal turned to see the cat was still lying at the base of Eddie's healing tank and had lifted his head to check on her. She was just about visible through the thick, curved glass, her body floating limp in the strangely clear black liquid. She'd been unconscious by the time they got her in there, but her vitals had soon stabilized as the miraculous liquid began doing its work. Cassius had also remained unconscious, and Kaya confirmed he was indeed in a coma. Whether the healing tank would pull him out of it was unclear, but his injuries were at least showing signs of repair. Cal was still struggling to understand what had happened between them, not to mention what would happen if the man finally woke. He really had no clue. Tawny had taken some persuasion to go in the last tank, attempting some argument regarding her duties. In the end, Cal had awoken the commanding officer he'd once been and ordered her into it, pointing out that duties would be a damn sight harder to perform with amputated legs. But it wasn't just her injuries he was concerned about. He recognized a grief in her eyes that would be even harder to bear while suffering exhaustion and physical pain. Satisfied Eddie was okay, Shaggy indulged in a wide yawn, his huge white fangs shining under the med bay's bright lights. Then he settled his big furry chin on his forepaws, those bright violet eyes drooping closed. The cat was a good deal cleaner than it had been previously, no doubt having licked the dried blood from its fur while the rest of them followed Blue around the ship. The beast was also incredibly relaxed, considering the abrupt transition from a lifetime of pure nature to one of pure tech. An impressive creature indeed. Perhaps Blue's mind-mushing had something to do with it. Unsurprisingly, Blue had shown particular interest in the healing tanks, laying his hands against them for longer than anything else on the ship. Right now, however, his attention was on the sphere as it hovered close to the table. What's it doing? Victor asked, eagerly watching as the sphere changed shape and directed a wide beam of pinkish light onto the tabletop. Is it opening up? No one having a sure answer, they all just watched in silence as something emerged from the sphere, drifted down through the light and settled on the table. It was the Insidian Parasite, the one dissected from the drone after their first encounter. Again appearing like some blend of liquid and light, the beam detached from the sphere and sank downward until it had surrounded the parasite in a pinkish orb. The strange sight made Cal wonder if the light was keeping the parasite in some sort of stasis, preventing it from dying, maybe, or stopping it from killing itself, even. That seemed like an insidian sort of thing to do, self-destruct on their own terms. Head slightly bowed, Blue pointed a finger, which lengthened until it entered the orb and made contact with the parasite. Under the bright lights, Cal noticed a subtle line cross over Blue's eyes, a film that turned them perhaps a little less black. Some sort of internal eyelid, he wondered, to block out distractions, perhaps. Is he reading it? Toka whispered, like absorbing information, maybe. Could well be, Cal agreed. He looked to Kaya for confirmation, but she was too captivated by whatever was taking place to theorize. How much information could be in that squishy little thing? Victor asked. A fair bit, I reckon, Toka said. It's not much smaller than a human brain. 
Probably bigger than some, Victor muttered, possibly sarcastically. Now they'd escaped the chaos, questions over Blue's origins were again trying to invade Cal's thoughts, but he pushed them away, banishing them in order to focus on the present moment. He was too tired for questions that had no answers, and had to accept the fact that only time would bring any. After what seemed an age, Blue retracted his finger from the orb and lifted his head to regard them all, his eyes once again as black as night. Then he said a single word. Information. As always, the word was immersed in a series of clicks, but this time Blue also nodded his head, as if trying to confirm they guessed his actions correctly. He pointed at the parasite before lifting his arm and directing it up and around. Connected. I knew it. Kaya said, leaning back into her chair with a look of thoughtful triumph, as if Blue's one word had released her from a mental shackle. They're a network. Like a hive mind, Cal asked. I'm not sure, Kaya said. That might be taking it too far, but this parasite is certainly not an independent entity, possibly far from it. Victor leaned against the table. So there's potential for way more information than a single brain, then? Blue nodded at them again. Hacking, he said, before putting his attention back on the parasite. Hacking? Toka blurted, looking impressed. Where the hell did he get that word? I don't remember any of us saying it. He's been inside our heads, Cal pointed out. There's no limit to the words he may have learned. Jumper looked less enthralled. That's all well and good, but he'll have to start stringing some together in a meaningful way. Conveying the Insidian's plans with the occasional single word could take years. Again, Blue looked at them, eyes shifting shape. Annihilation. Jumper sucked on his teeth and raised his brow. I stand corrected, he said, looking across at the others, his expression grim. That actually sums it up pretty well. Friends. Sat upon the highest mountain peak for miles around, Max looked like some iron statue from a time long forgotten. A mythical, metallic king unmoved for centuries, his hulking form as still and unchanging as the dark rocks that surrounded him. Becker felt a wave of relief upon spotting the soft orange glow still emanating from the battle robot's round eyes, relief that the credit she'd earned from her fight with Scar had been enough to pay for his new power cell. Relief that the minimal upgrade had proved sufficient to get him to their agreed rendezvous, and relief that she too had made it there, an outcome passing fortuitous to border on miraculous. Having landed on the mountaintop with incredible precision just twenty paces from where Max sat, Melinda had insisted on accompanying Becker to the ship's ground-level hatch. The synthetic woman was proving incredibly attentive, and the sorrow she had demonstrated on hearing of Franco's passing had only strengthened Becker's belief that she was far more complex than could be imagined, depths impossible to understand. Becker still didn't know if she could or should trust her strange new companion, but right now she needed to trust her, needed someone to lean on both physically and mentally, and if that someone had been built rather than born, then so be it, for now those were her cards. Despite having taken a couple of stims, Becca was still shaky on her feet, and by the time they'd reached the ground-level hatch, she was very glad for Melinda's hand beneath her arm. Even with her limp, the synthetic woman was far steadier than any human could ever be. Multiple patches had thankfully dealt with her pain, all but the deep ache in her chest that no medication could touch. Only time could ever hope to heal the pain of grief. Only once the hatch had fully opened did Max rise from his rocky throne, as if waiting for confirmation that it was indeed Becker rather than some random visitors come to his mountain top. The hatch had two layers of gently glowing enviro shields to protect them from the harsh outside environment, but just like everything else on the ship, they were top of the range and barely hampered the view at all. Not that the view was particularly clear to begin with, Despite their elevation, they were still well short of Chalice's soaring heights, and the fine grit and toxic air once again turned the landscape grim and made the sun a sickly sphere. Lying dead at Max's big cybernetic feet were three large lava wasps, those that had to die before the rest realized the robot wasn't the best of targets. 
Despite being more than a match for the local wildlife, however, Max looked stiff as he made his way over, and even the whipping wind and hum of the ship's engines couldn't mask the noisy grinding of his cybernetic joints. Even with his new power cell, it was clear Max's long journey across the harsh lava vein terrain must have been a laborious and close-cut thing, but the distance had been a necessity. Becker had wanted him far enough from the mine that they wouldn't bother trying to retrieve him, but also perched high enough that she herself could easily find him. Her original plan had been to convince the owners of whatever ship she'd ended up on that Max was a valuable security asset, or failing that to persuade whatever military she discovered to return to the planet and retrieve him. Both had been a long shot, she knew. But this, at least, had gone her way, very much so considering she was retrieving him on her own ship. No one to persuade bar an extremely accommodating synthetic combat soldier named Melinda. You doing okay, Max? Becker asked as her big friend made it through the Enviro Shields and came to a grinding halt just half a pace from her. Yes. He rolled his domed head downward until those round, glowing eyes met hers. I'm fine. You made it to the rendezvous? Yes. Been waiting long? No. Max's head tilted ever so slightly. You are hurt. A few nasty bumps and scrapes, Becker said, still leaning on Melinda. But I'll be okay. Corporal Franco? I'm afraid he didn't make it. Max was silent for a moment, and Becker could have sworn those round eyes dimmed. Sorry I wasn't there to help. Me too, Max. Me too. Becker smiled sadly up at him. Next time I will be there to help. Max's strange, synthesized voice somehow made it more a promise than a suggestion. I know you will, Max. Becker patted one of his thick fingers with genuine affection. And speaking of help, this is Melinda. With another slight roll of his wide, domed head, Max turned his attention toward the synthetic woman. Yes, Melinda. I know Melinda. Good to see you, Max, Melinda said. You two know each other. Becker's surprise almost made it to her face, but too many revelations had been thrown at her in recent days, and exhaustion was now blunting their edge. Yes, Max said. We've met a few times, Melinda confirmed. Is Victor here? Max asked. Who? Oh, Becker said, briefly considering whether she'd overdone the pain patches. No, Melinda said. I'm afraid Victor isn't with me. Okay. Max turned his attention back to Becker, apparently not registering the bewilderment on her face. Can I find myself a charging port? Becker let out an audible sigh. Sure, Max, she said, wishing to God she too had the luxury of simply plugging herself in. Have your fill. Once Max had lumbered further into the ship, Becker looked up at Melinda. I'm feeling a bit out of the loop here, she admitted, sagging a little against her ridiculously steady grip. I'm sorry, Melinda said. There's still a lot I need to tell you. Understatement of the fucking decade. Max and I served on the same starship, Melinda elaborated. My starship? Yes, your starship. I've seen you before too, but that was before I was... altered. You've seen me? On the starship? Yes, a couple of times. Only from a distance, but I remember everyone I see, no matter how brief or distant. Having always thought it was just an expression, Becca found herself reaching up to scratch her head in confusion. What are the chances, she said, at a loss for anything smarter. Slim, Melinda admitted. But in fairness, the only reason I'm here with you now is because I overheard you talking of someone I know. Oh? Cal Harper. This time the surprise caused Becca to wobble, and she would have keeled over if Melinda didn't have a hold of her. You know Cal? I do. Lieutenant Callum Harper. He's more of a captain now, of sorts. But yes, I heard you mention him shortly after you freed us all from the cell. I'd already left the club by that point and was at the limits of my hearing range, but that name was enough to stop me in my tracks. Becker's mind spun, the edge on this revelation sharp enough to cut through her exhaustion. You know him well, she asked, a sort of hurried desperation in her tone, not quite sure she could believe it. I do. He is my friend. Becca shook her head, a bewildered little laugh escaping. Is he okay? Alive and well? This I don't know, 
Melinda admitted, something in her voice Becca couldn't quite read. The last time I saw him, he was in a dangerous situation, very dangerous. Becca nodded her understanding, trying not to let that news smother her rising hope. He has a habit of getting into those, just as bad as me, but also has a knack of getting out of them. Melinda nodded. That I would agree with. Becca felt a subtle shifting of her emotions, a welcome tipping of the scales. She'd hardly dared hope that she'd still have friends alive out there, not after all the rumors regarding the fate of the military. The news couldn't have come sooner and went a long way in helping with that trust in her new companion. Leaning against Melinda for balance, Becca reached forward with her good arm and tapped the control to close the hatch on Balcon Six's gritty landscape. She'd seen enough of that damn planet had experienced enough of it, and wouldn't allow it to consume any more of her future, not even a second. Thank you for saving my life, Melinda, Becca said, a little ashamed it had taken her until now to say the words. You're welcome, Melinda said, helping her to turn around and shuffle away from the sealed hatch. And thanks for your continued help. Anything I can do, just ask. Becca nodded gratefully. That little seed of optimism she'd locked away during the dawning of the day was again making itself known, eager for the freedom to grow and help shape her future. Franco's words were also echoing in her head, his assurances that she'd handle what lay ahead, that she was a survivor. I think what I'd like is to get the hell off this rock and let it shrink into the past. That sounds like a good first step, Melinda agreed. And then, I'd like you to tell me everything. Everything. Becca nodded, that optimistic seed bringing about a smile. Yes, please. Absolutely everything. Epilogue Cal entered the med bay and saw the familiar sight of Blue sitting at the work table, that soft bubble of pink light glowing before him as he continued to hack the parasite trapped within. The alien had been in the same position for almost two days and nights now, apparently not requiring any sleep or sustenance. The same couldn't be said for the rest of them. There'd been a good deal of sleeping, then a fair amount of eating, then a fair bit more sleeping. As always, Cal left Blue to it, hopeful that all the hacking ultimately equated to information that would eventually be translated to them. Heading for the healing tanks, he greeted Tawny, who was sitting in front of them, keeping a watchful eye. The corporal had spent a single day and night immersed in the miraculous black liquid, but despite not being fully healed, she'd insisted on resuming her guard duties. Cal guessed it was an attempt to claw back some normality, even if that meant guarding a man who was in a coma and locked within a capsule of near-unbreakable glass. But the decision was hers to make, and Jumper had happily taken her spot in the third tank to boost the healing of his knee. Despite her injuries being severe, Eddie's recovery was also coming along well, and a couple more days would likely see her demanding freedom too. Shaggy had remained curled up at the base of Eddie's healing tank, only moving for the occasional stretch, that and to wolf down the slabs of meat Jumper had thawed for him. How are you feeling, Corporal? Cal asked as he pulled up a seat next to Tawny. The Corporal stretched out her legs with only the slightest wince. I can walk again, so can't complain. And the rest of you? I'm okay, sir. Thank you for asking, she said, having understood the intention of his question. I'm glad to hear it. Not an easy thing, losing a friend. No, not easy at all. Tawny leaned forward to stare at the floor, lost in thought for a moment. He was a good man. Cal nodded, and the best of soldiers. Still staring at the floor, Tawny's shoulders jerked once, a brief, silent laugh. That would have thrilled him to hear you say that. Cal raised his brow, wondering what being thrilled might have looked like on the stony-faced Corporal Bright. I'm certain he wouldn't want me to mourn, Tawny continued, not when he died doing such important work, doing what he dreamed of. Looking up, she caught the hint of surprise Cal was failing to hide. It was what he dreamed of. He was elated to be assigned to your crew. We both were. He even confessed to me his difficulty in concealing his excitement when we first came aboard your ship. Struggling to believe that, Cal recalled their expressionless faces the day they'd met. Guess you never know what's going on beneath the surface, he mused. I had no clue, he admitted. 
Tawny countered his surprise with a look of incredulity. You and your crew are legendary, she said, staring at him like that was an irrefutable fact. The elite of the elite, the spearhead of our new military. Cal almost laughed at that. I hardly think that's the case. It's absolutely the case, Tawny said without hesitation. Certainly in the minds of the soldiers. If there were hollow posters of you guys, the young recruits would have them plastered all over their dorms. Some of the older ones too, probably. Cal shook his head, a little bewildered. If it was anyone other than Corporal Tawny, he might have felt he was being mocked. The crew that freed the captives on C-9, she continued with uncharacteristic fervor. Dealt blows to the pirates and the Insidians. And now you've done it again. The chance to be part of something like this is all Bright or I ever wanted. To fight for the greater good. To make a difference. Cal hardly knew what to say. He'd never found it easy to accept praise, and this certainly wasn't at the light end of the scale. Well, it was an honor to have you both by our side, he said, suspecting the corporal wouldn't allow anything less than acceptance. A good fight was definitely fought, and as far as making a difference goes, Cal glanced toward Blue. I suspect we might have struck gold. I hope so, for all our sakes. Tawny's attention drifted back toward Cassius, but her eyes looked heavy. Get some rest, Corporal. Shaggy and I will hold the fort for a time. At the mention of his name, Shaggy's furry ear twitched, but his eyes remained closed. Frowning, Tawny was about to reply when Cal preempted her response. Don't even try to protest. You need the sleep and the recovery time, and just because I'm part of a legendary crew doesn't mean I'm too good for guard duty. Tawny smiled at that and with a nod, she climbed stiffly to her feet, managing it with only a brief grimace. Well, if sleep and rest are my orders, I guess I'd better get to it. Cal smiled back, glad to see her finally relaxed enough to indulge in some humor. Once Tawny had limped from the room, Cal checked the readouts on each of the tanks, then settled back into his seat. His mind wandering, he soon found himself staring at Cassius the man who tried to kill him and his friends on multiple occasions, the pirates whose actions had likely caused far-reaching chaos, destruction, and suffering, but also the man who'd inexplicably saved his life. Over the last two days, Cal's memories of his childhood had become increasingly clearer, more of the obscure snippets and smudged images taking shape, broken words and echoes of emotion coming together to complete the distant events. The orphanage, his friendship with Cassius, Sister Elizabeth reprimanding them but failing to hide the amusement in her eyes, even the raiding pirates dragging them off to some strange world, an enormous insect hive, sickly sweet. And the pirate queen, the recognition was now clear. They called her the witch back then, and as far as Cal could tell, she hadn't aged at all. But perhaps the evidence of extensive regen therapies explained some of that not to mention her love of biological experimentation, that same experimentation she'd used to mold Cassius over many terrible years. Cal continued to stare into the healing tank, that face just visible in the black liquid, entirely expressionless in his sleep, no mocking grin or disapproving scowl, no bitterness or rage. Just a man. Cal looked down at his hands, the cuts, scrapes, and scars marring his skin. If their roles had been reversed, if he'd been the one to suffer all the pain and torment, would he, too, have become a murderous pirate, ruthless and bent by twisted loyalties and morality? Questions with no possible answers. Only one stubborn memory had refused to reveal itself to this point. How it had all ended. Cal supposed that made sense. The end was surely where the worst had happened, where the trauma had dug deepest. Memories. The unexpected word made Cal start, tearing him from his thoughts like a scavenger's wrecking hook. Turning, he let out a breath and relaxed his taut limbs. It was just blue, standing directly behind him, vibrant and looming tall. Hidden memories. Yes. Hidden memories, Cal confirmed, his heart still slowing from the fright. The alien was continuing to learn words at an impressive rate, but if he'd learned how to apologize yet, he didn't look close to implementing it. Instead, he pointed one of his long fingers toward Cassius, then directed it at Cal's head. Help you. Help me? Yes, 
Blue nodded. Cal shifted awkwardly in his seat, hesitating and unconvinced he wanted the help. Not because he didn't want to know, but because help from Blue probably meant reliving the trauma, quite literally. But what if Blue's offer was a one-time thing? What if the memory never resurfaced? Better to face it, Cal supposed. And so with a sigh, he worked up the courage to nod. Blue nodded back, possibly in approval, and allowing Cal little time to change his mind, he reached for his forehead. Cal grasped the edge of his seat, bracing himself. Then he was thrust into a time long past. Relief swept through Monk as the Star Splinter's engines finally sprang to life. As Cal had promised, the white-haired witch hadn't bothered reinstalling the stolen ship's security systems. But the flight controls hadn't been as either he or Cal had expected. The simulator they'd spent countless hours immersed in at the orphanage was designed for a Star Splinter Harper III. The witch's ship was a Harper IV, and the upgrade had been more extensive than they'd anticipated. Not enough to mess up their escape, but enough to delay it. Why the hell hadn't Cal returned yet? What the hell was he up to? Monk looked back at the rest of the kids crowded into the flight deck. There was a lot of fearful but trusting expressions directed at him. It made him swallow, made him swallow hard. Mark it, Cal, where are you? Having not yet mastered the new controls enough to fully activate the ship's smart glass, Monk climbed onto the console to get a better look through the flight window. The black smoke billowing in the bright blue sky was getting thicker. When Cal had said he'd stolen enough explosives from the witch's mining supplies to cause a foolproof distraction, Monk had never imagined he'd blow up half the base. Even part of the giant hive and surrounding forest was now on fire. All that caused by a handful of small tunneling bombs. Hardly seemed possible. After weeks of nighttime excursions through the base air vents, though, Cal had figured out exactly where to place them, had figured out all the volatile spots. The resulting destruction was so extensive that Monk had to wonder whether revenge was on Cal's mind even more than escape. Whatever the case, it had done the trick. As far as they'd seen, the explosions had sent the witch and her army of leather butts into a frenzy of panic and confusion. But the distraction wouldn't last forever. Careful where he planted his knees, Monk climbed further along the console to get a better look at the docking field below, scanning the scattering of docked ships and buildings for his friend. Stupid mucking idea going back out there to use his last bomb. Monk had told him not to go. If he'd stayed, they'd be taking off by now. Muck it, bloody mucking. Zack found something. Monk turned to see the kids squashing against each other to let Zack through. The boy had found something all right, a blaster that looked ridiculously large in his small hand. Why isn't Cal back yet? Zack asked. He wasn't the oldest of the group, but Monk had pegged him as the bravest, and even more importantly, the smartest. I don't know, Monk said as he took the blaster off him, but I'm going to go find him. If you see any leather butts coming for the ship, hit this button here. It's an emergency auto takeoff. And leave you? Monk swallowed hard again. Yes, but only if you see them coming for the ship. Just hit the button once and it will take you out of the atmosphere. Then you and the others will just have to figure out the rest between you. Zack paled at that, but he nodded anyway. Good. The blaster feeling awkward in his hand and his heart going crazy in his chest, Monk squeezed through the crowded kids and went to find his friend. Hold it right there, you little fucker! Monk froze. He'd found Cal, but muck it all to hell, he was caught in the grip of a leather butt. A big, angry-looking leather butt with a face as ugly as a swamp pig. Even with his captor pressing a blaster against his head, Cal was squirming like a snag deal, but the man was big enough that the struggles made little impression. Drop the blaster, or I drop your friend. Until that warning had come, Monk hadn't even realized he'd raised the weapon. I mean it, you little shit, the pirate growled. I'll decorate this fucking dock with his brains if you don't drop it. The blaster shaking in his hand, Monk lowered the weapon, but didn't let go of it. There's a bomb! Cal screamed, still struggling. I planted another bomb. Let go or we'll all be decorating this dock. His eyes wide, Monk glanced to his left, where a large silver Choam reactor glinted in the sunlight, undoubtedly the place Cal would have planted the bomb. That realization was bad enough, but it was made ten times worse by the sight of a bunch more leather butts running toward them across the docking field. And even worse than that, the witch was among them, her long white hair impossible to mistake. Bloody damn it, Cal. Why could he never be subtle? Why couldn't he come up with a plan that avoided utter mayhem? 
It's gonna blow up, you stupid pigger! Cal screamed. Stop wriggling, you little bastard! The pirate spat, now struggling to keep him under control. And you? He glared at Monk, face twisted with anger. I told you to drop that fu- Shoot him! Cal screamed, loud enough to drown out the man's demands. Shoot him, Monk, or we're all gonna die! Monk raised the blaster again, but his eyes had filled with tears, turning the pirate Cal and the fast-approaching Queen into a blurry mess. And even if he could see properly, his hand was shaking so badly he'd never make this shot, not in a million years. Damn it, Monk, I said shh! The explosion lifted Monk off his feet. Monk stared up at the bright sky. It was filled with tiny white flakes, slowly tumbling down and occasionally drifting on the breeze. His head was thumping, ears wet and ringing. Monk climbed to his feet, dizzy as all hell. He reckoned he was probably in pain, but everything was numb, his brain no exception. From the little he could see, the whole south side of the dock was a burned mess. Ships and buildings scorched, the ground sizzling. No signs of the witch or her pirates, but it was hard to see. The Choam reactor was spitting stuff high into the sky and was burning bright enough to make Monk's eyes hurt. It was like a shard from a raging star dropped from the sky to angrily pierce the ground. But Monk stared at it nonetheless. For how long, he didn't know. Time had become an alien thing, a thing stripped bare of all its meaning and importance. Monk's hands were no longer shaking and his tears had stopped too. Cal was gone, just like that, so quick, gone forever. Monk continued to stare. He felt nothing. Shifting his feet, Monk slowly turned toward the star splinter. It was still there, still intact. A couple of the kids were standing out on the dock, beckoning him over with crazed arms. They may even have been shouting, but Monk couldn't hear anything except that high-pitched whine. Monk didn't want to be here. He wanted to be anywhere but here. So with legs that felt a whole world away from his mind, he started to stumble toward the other kids. Then he managed to run, to run toward that big silver ship. What's your name, sport? Monk stared up at the soldier, the question swirling in his numb brain, but struggling to find any purchase. Huh? Your name? I'm going to need your name for the report. What name? Your name, the soldier said, impatience sharpening his tone. I know you've been through a lot, kid, but this is important. How can we find out who you are if we don't even know your name? How would we ever get you back home? Monk looked around at the other kids who were dotted around beneath the shadow of the star splinter. They were all being questioned, just like him. Some were even eating the Nutribars the medics had given them. Monk had dropped his to the floor. He didn't want to eat. I don't have a home, he said to the soldier. None of us do. The soldier frowned and tapped something into his data pad. My name's Monk, Monk said after a moment, hoping it would make the man go away. But the soldier just shook his head. Nicknames won't do. I need your real name. Cal, Monk said, the name falling from his mouth with no accompanying thought. My name's Cal. Cal? Monk nodded. Callum? Monk nodded again. Okay, good, now we're getting somewhere. The soldier tapped at his pad. Got a surname to go with that sport? He asked, sounding cheerier now and even forcing out a smile. Monk sniffed and sighed. He was sore despite the pain patch he'd been given. The back of his head and ears throbbed. His face felt sore too, sore when he touched it. Again, he looked around at the other kids, then up at the star splinter. The star splinter Harper Four, his dream ship. That was right, wasn't it? His brain was feeling a bit muddled. The ship looked odd sitting in the center of the enormous glitzy shopping district, all the colorful lights and flashing billboards reflected in its sleek silver hull. It was made even stranger having so many people crowded around the perimeter that the soldiers had made, all of them staring and talking, their shopping all but forgotten. To Monk, they sounded like a bunch of weird birds. I'm really going to need a surname here, sport. Monk shook his head. A shopping district. He didn't remember landing the ship here. He couldn't even remember approaching the colony or much of the flight before that. Any of it, for that matter. The ship might as well have been on autopilot. 
He didn't even know how long the flight had been. An hour? A week? Sport? Monk wanted to sleep, and he was starting to feel like he wanted to cry. But he didn't really know why, and not knowing why made him want to cry even more. A surname, sport? Harper, Monk said, wishing some of that numb feeling would return. Harper? Monk nodded. The soldier frowned again, looking dubious as he glanced up at the star splinter. With a shake of his head, he mumbled something and tapped at his pad. Monk's throbbing ears went up to the task of hearing what he mumbled, but he was just glad the man looked mostly satisfied. Okay, the soldier said. Don't worry, sport. We'll soon get to the bottom of this and get you home. Staring again at the big silver ship, Monk shook his head. Didn't you hear me? He whispered. I have no home. Cal almost toppled off his chair at the return to his presence so abrupt it felt like he'd been flung into a different body, time having been sharply folded in two. Leaning forward, he breathed deep and took a moment to get his bearings. Once he had a grip on himself, he straightened up and spent a moment rubbing his face. He'd often heard how trauma could affect memories, especially in the young, but had never imagined it could be to that extent. Broken. Blinking a few times, Cal looked up to see Blue was staring at Cassius. He nodded his agreement. Broken was one word for it. Broken beyond repair. The alien remained silent for a time, eyes unmoving and unreadable. Uncertain. Cal went back to rubbing his face, trying to make sense of what he'd just learned, what he'd just experienced. Thank you for showing me that, he said after a while. Still feeling a little disorientated, he got to his feet and turned to Blue. And thank you for helping us get off that planet. Blue nodded. Trying to clear his head, Cal looked around the med lab and stretched his limbs. The sphere was still by the work table, and the parasite was still within the pink orb. What about this annihilation you mentioned? Cal asked, reminding himself that Cassius wasn't the only thing broken, not by a long shot. How certain is that? Is our civilization doomed? Again, Blue remained silent for a while. Before, certain. And now? Uncertain. Cal didn't have to voice his next question. His thoughts alone were enough. Now you have me, Blue said, turning one of those long fingers to point at his own chest. Now I help. Help you fight? This is the end of Fallen Worlds, a Podium Audio production. If you enjoyed this audiobook, we would love for you to rate and review it. For more out-of-this-world space operas, check us out at podiumaudio.com and sign up for our newsletter. We promise we won't spam you. Also consider joining our community of listeners, fans, and trolls on social media. We're active on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. We'd love to connect. You have been listening to Fallen Worlds Book 3 of Fractured Space, produced by Emily Durr, written by J.G. Cressy, performed by Alex Wyndham, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Text copyright 2021 by J.G. Cressy, production copyright 2022 by Podium Audio, all rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.